Um, Guy is correct. I didn't read the Da Vinci Code and just feel like I needed to go jump over a cliff or get uh, overly angry about it. Um, what disturbs me, and if, if you've never uh, heard me on the radio or if you've never seen a DVD uh, like this, you'll pick up real quickly. What disturbs me the most is when people manipulate sources and when they only give you a partial picture uh, of an ancient text, some issue in ancient history, to really drive a position that they have. And my goal over the, co the course of the whole day, this is the first session of what's going to be uh, the equivalent of eight hours, my goal is to get you to look at the data, the primary material, and as Guy said, compare that with the claims of the book. Sometimes this isn't going to be terribly exciting because what I will do, and that's not, you know, now's not the time to click off the DVD, I'm going to explain what I just said. What I tend to do is I tend to try to show you the source, and when I'm quoting from a secondary source, like a dictionary or some accepted scholarly work that is just uh, accepted and used and praised by everyone in a given field, I'll give you the page. I'll give you the page number. I'll show you the text. Uh, I want you to have the information so that you don't have to just assume that I'm quoting it right or I'm you know, just a, such an honest guy, you can just always trust me. I think I am an honest guy and you can trust me. But I still like to put it in front of your eyes so that you can see that I'm not making it up. Uh, the last thing I want to say by way of introduction is I'm not so worried about Dan Brown. Dan Brown is, a, is an author. He writes fiction. Uh, he probably has gone a little too far in, in uh, sort of implying, uh, and in some cases saying, that he believes this or that about his sources. The people that I, uh, if I'm going to target anybody today, it's going to be the, the people he uses as sources, because I do think that they're being dishonest, and I do think they're being manipulative. Uh, and I will name them by name. They know where to find me if they don't like it, uh, and they're free to prove otherwise, because I think it's going to be pretty hard, because it's right, going to be right in front of your face. The first session that I think we need to go through is introducing Gnosticism for you. This is a term that you often hear uh, related to the Da Vinci Code and its contents. It's one of those terms that people throw around and you may or may not know what it is. But if you know the basics of Gnosticism, the Gnostic worldview, it will help you frame certain positions that are put forth in the Da Vinci Code. And so this is where we're going to start today. This is the worldview behind the Da Vinci Code. Now, the basics are this. In Gnosticism, there is, they'll use the term God, the true God. The true God, you need to know right away in Gnosticism, is not a personal being. When you, if most, I don't know if any of us in here in the room are, are Gnostics, but chances are you're not. When you think of God, you think of a person. You think of an actual being, a, a, an, an entity that has personality, emotions, that kind of thing, because you're used to reading the Old or New Testament or some other book you know, from Western religion, and this is how God is spoken of. In Gnosticism, though, you have this sort of force uh, called the light, the pneuma, which is a Greek word which means spirit. This, this thing is preexistent and uncaused, and so that would be kind of similar to what we're used to. But this force actually has parts, but it's not, a, it's not a person. It's just like a force. Think of Star Wars, I guess, for lack of a better illustration. Gnostics will refer to the true God in masculine terms, the Father or the Spirit or the Pneuma. Gnostics will also refer to the true God, the ultimate God thing, in feminine terms as mother also, the first thought, the Coptic word is anoia, the first thought of the father. So they, they sort of begin with this father-God concept, but he's not a person. And then as this, this thing sort of is able to think within itself or, or do something, this, this, this cosmic intelligence, maybe that would be a better way to describe it, the first thing the cosmic intelligence thinks of is called the Anoia, the first thought. And that is viewed, of, viewed in terms of feminine terms. Now look at this. This is a circle. I picked a circle for a deliberate reason. In Gnosticism, the ultimate God force is whole. It is complete. 
It is self-contained. It is self-existent and pre-existent. It has balance, masculine, feminine. It is androgynous. It's not just one or the other. It's not just masculine or feminine. It's both. There's an emphasis in Gnosticism on something called androgyny, which is this union, this sexless sort of thing, or this union of, of genders. I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but as we go on, you'll, you'll start to see how this works itself out, not only in the system, but in, in Brown's novel. The first thought, according to Gnostics, was, and they'll use the word, impregnated. Now, we're not talking about anything physical here, but they're using procreative language to illustrate for you what they believe. The first thought, the female, is impregnated by the father and brings forth other eons or aeons. These are, these are gods. So right away we have, you know, us as, you know, from our background, Judeo-Christian background, this sounds like polytheism, and in some ways it is. But the point I want to stress now is not essentially the nature of, of the system, but you have the true God. The true God sort of creates other gods. Okay, so you have this thing up above. The thing up above sort of creates within itself lesser things, lesser eons, lesser gods. The, the circle is androgynous, but the things that it creates are not. They, do, they are spoken of in gender. In Gnosticism, the universe is three-tiered. The diagram here has at the top, this is the true guy, this is the true God. Where the true God lives is one realm. The bottom realm is the created universe, the world you and I know. And then there's this middle existence. And that's where the other gods reside. So from the true God, the whole entity, there are other divine beings created called aeons. You'll notice by the features here, some are masculine, some are feminine. Now, we're not going to get too far into Gnosticism, but what happens is they pair up and they procreate. Again, I'm using, you know, sort of literal language, but they produce other aeons. And so you have a whole system of gods, plural, underneath this divine thing, this cosmic mind or cosmic force. The middle gods are sort of expressions of the greater whole. These are called aeons. The word next to it, pleroma, means fullness. When all the aeons are together and in harmony with the true light, that is called the fullness. It's the way things ought to be. The fullness. We'll come back to that term. They are the true God's essence. And together, the parts equal the whole. Now, the true God, again, or the light, produces these aeons. One of them is the Logos. Now, for those of us who are Christians in the room, Logos is a word that gets applied to Jesus in John chapter 1. But now, mentally stop yourself. The Logos in Gnosticism here is not Jesus. This is not a one-to-one -one equation. Jesus is something else to a Gnostic. Just so that you know that one of these gods is referred to as the Logos. And the Logos, if you look at the, the hierarchy, the row here, the way I have this arranged, the Logos is considered the very highest aeon. He is the highest thing that the light produced. Okay? He's the highest few notes there. You will read in Gnostic writings, if you go down to the third bullet, the Logos is called the form of the formless, the body of the bodiless, the face of the invisible, the word of the inutterable, the mind of the inconceivable. The Logos is the primary expression of the light, this cosmic spirit thing that Gnostics refer to as the true God, the ultimate God. The Logos possesses knowledge of all the other aeons. He is the entire image and likeness. Now, if you look here, we have a father language within the true God. We have mother language, so we have father, mother. We have the Logos, and that forms in Gnosticism. You notice the triangle. This is sort of their trinity. Now, that's an oversimplification 
but they will use triune language. They call it the initial triad, the initial three, father, mother, and son. And they'll actually call these bodiless beings the first man, the first woman, and the first son. Uh, the reason I'm pointing this out is when you read Gnostic literature, and for most of us, it's going to be in the newspapers. And the newspapers or the Da Vinci Code or some other work is going to start saying things like, well, I mean, this is really kind of the same thing as Christianity. There's the Son, there's the Father, you know, there's this thing, the Divine Feminine, you know, whatever that is. And they're, they're, going, to, they're going to try to latch on to similar terminology to make you think that we're all really talking about the same thing. Well, we're really not. Okay? The lowest eon, you'll notice the, the, the chain here progresses from high to low. It's a progressive dissipation of the pneuma, the ultimate light, the ultimate spirit, from the primary aeon to the last one. There's a, there's a finite number here. The last one <clears throat> right here is feminine, and that is called Sophia in Gnosticism. Now, this is a term that comes up in the Da Vinci Code all the time. The Sophia is an extraordinarily important figure, an extraordinarily important aeon to the Gnostic system, the way they understand reality. Sophia is the lowest aeon. You'll notice that I have her chin right on the red line. That is because Sophia was sufficiently far down the line enough that she was close to the material world. And she's going to have some kind of interaction with the material world. She will, in fact, transgress the boundary. She sins and rebels in Gnostic thinking. What she does, the Sophia, and this, this is a quotation from one of the Nag Hammadi texts, the Sophia wanted to bring forth a likeness out of herself without the consent of the spirit she wants to reproduce, like the ultimate God did. She doesn't want to involve her consort. Remember I told you the aeons were paired, masculine and feminine, and then they produce other godlike beings in the Gnostic system. She doesn't want anything to do with her male counterpart. A thing came out of her which was imperfect and different from her appearance because she created it without her consort. So the, the Gnostic story, the Gnostic mythology, is that Sophia says, you know what? I want to be like the ultimate light. I want to be like the most high. Okay. And I'm going to create of myself something. I'm going to imitate his behavior. And Gnostics view that as sort of a good thing. But, you know, she kind of preempted the way it's supposed to be done, but it's still somewhat okay. Why did she do it? Because she is, according to Gnostic text, unconquerably prunikos, which means lewd. I am the whore and the holy one. I am the wife and the virgin. Holy whore, wife, virgin. Think Da Vinci Code. This act of, you know, the, there's, there's this thread running through the novel about how this sexual act, this sexual ceremony, somehow is an act of worship. What they're trying to, to do, what, what, what Brown is trying to describe, and not all Gnostics saw it this way, but many did, was that this ritual act of intercourse somehow commemorates not only Sophia, Sophia's reunion. We're going to talk about when Sophia gets back to the play Roma, when she repents. But also the initial androgynous male-female togetherness of the ultimate reality. That's why this, this, the act of intercourse has, has a sacramental value to some Gnostics. What does she make of herself? She makes a being called the Demiurg, which just means the maker. The Demiurg is also known as Yaldabaoth, child come forth or child of chaos. You will see both translations. He is also called Saklas, the fool. He is also called Samael, the blind one. This being is none other than Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament in Gnosticism. The God of the Old Testament to a Gnostic is a created being. He is called a fool. Why? Because he runs around saying, I'm the only God. 
There's none like me. Duh. Okay, Gnostics consider the God of the Old Testament a fool because he doesn't want people to know, and he's going to create humans. He doesn't want humans to know that actually there's a whole bunch of aeons that are bigger than he is, more powerful. And there's even further removed from him this ultimate God thing. The God of the Old Testament to a Gnostic is a fool, is blind, because he doesn't seem to realize that there are other gods. He goes around denying it. He's either blind or he's an idiot. And he's just bad because he doesn't want you, humanity, to know the truth. Now, here's our line separating the middle realm from the realm we know. The Demiurg is going to create the world, just like you know in, in the traditional Old Testament. The Demiurg will also create archons, which is a word that means rulers. The, the archons are mentioned in the New Testament. These are the principalities and the powers of the air, the rulers of, uh, in high places who are wicked. But in Gnosticism, the archons, yes, they're bad because the fool, because the demiurg made them. But they're not bad in the sense of they're opposing God. They're actually in Gnosticism. The archons are are God's henchmen. They do his bidding to suppress humanity, to keep humanity from learning something. And we'll talk about what that something is. So the Demiurg makes helpers, what we would think of as fallen angels or watchers or fallen sons of God, archons. It's really the same old thing. Together, the archons, now look, the key there is together. The archons and the demiurg make Adam. Let us create humankind in our image. A Gnostic would say the plural there indicates that the demiurg and the archons get together and fashion the man. It is a co-creation. Those of you who are familiar with other stuff I do know that... uh, I don't buy that position because the grammar of Genesis 1.26 does not support it, but frankly, Gnostics don't care. So we'll skip that point. If you want to find more about that, you go up to my website. Sophia looks down at this. You see the yellow line there. Sophia looks down at what's happening, and she goes, this was probably a mistake, because this guy's kind of nasty. The Demiurg's kind of nasty. And now the Demiurg is just kind of doing what I did, and he's starting to make all this stuff. And I guess it was okay when he made this world thing. Like, who cares? And the archons, well, you know, we're we're more powerful than they are anyway, so I'm not too concerned. But Sophia takes pity on Adam because Adam is created to be a slave of the demiurg and of the archons. And something clicks inside Sophia, according to the Gnostic myth, it says, you know, I need to do something. This, this is just a little too far. I, I, my, I can't abide this. And so the Sophia, Gnosticism disagrees here. There are two versions of this. One has the Sophia voluntarily putting some of her divine essence into Adam. Uh, the other one, the other version has Soklos, the Demiurg, being tricked into doing it himself. But either way, a spark of the divine, you've all heard that phrase before, a spark of the divine gets deposited into Adam. So that now Adam is not just a worm-like you know, creature that just can't think or has no mind and no spirit just to serve the demiurg. Now Adam is flesh and spirit. He is material and he is divine. Okay, he's, he's, a, he's a mix. Adam then is used to bring forth Eve. In a later session that's really devoted to this Da Vinci Code myth about how the Gnostics just treated women so wonderfully and and the Christians are just the misogynistic Neanderthals of the ancient world, uh, we're going to see that that is not the case. In Gnosticism, I'll just telegraph one point here. In Gnosticism, Adam has the divine spark. Eve doesn't. Eve is less than Adam. She is less than divine. To a Gnostic. That's not a very positive, affirming thing, you know, for, for women. But that's Gnosticism, really, as you'll see it in Gnostic texts, not in Dan Brown's novel. 
Advanced concepts, I'm not going to park too much on this. Sophia is redeemed. She's the youngest and last eon. She was furthest from the light. She makes a mistake. She's again driven by this procreative urge. Her desire again was viewed positively in that she wanted to be like the father. There are really two parts to her. You know, she's conflicted in the Gnostic myth. You know, she she wants to be like the ultimate God, and, but yet she has this own self-willed rebellion thing going on. Eventually, the rest of the play Roma says, you know, we, we can't let this go. We need to get Sophia back here so that we are full, we're complete. So we have the old play Roma back, the fullness. And so what they do is they decide to attract her. Several high aeons, the Holy Spirit... These are all separate beings in Gnosticism. The Holy Spirit, the, Na, the Christos, and Jesus. Now, if that surprises you, if you're a Da Vinci Code reader, good. Because the Da Vinci Code has characters saying that in the, in, in the true Gnostic scriptures, Jesus was just an ordinary man. If you read the Gnostic text, you will not get that message. Jesus is an aeon. He is a divine being in Gnosticism. He's not just an ordinary Joe. These three devise a plan to attract Sophia back to the true light. The Christos appears to Sophia in the shape of a transcosmic cross. And now she sees that out in the universe and she, and she knows that this is a sign from the Pleroma that you can come back, just follow the light. Isn't that a nice phrase we've all heard in our, in our culture? Follow the light. Uh, it's Gnostic. You, 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 look, you keep your eye on the cross, you follow the light, and you will make it back to the Pleroma. Her celestial bridegroom, Jesus, awaits her. Again, think of the Dan Brown, Jesus, Mary Magdalene. They get together, they have you know, intercourse, either ritually or just you know, to enjoy it, probably just ritually if Dan Brown's going to be consistent with his Gnosticism, but he often isn't. This whole idea of Jesus needing a consort, Jesus needing a wife, to further the faith is this idea. Jesus and Mary Magdalene are mimicking the journey of Sophia back to the cosmic Jesus so that they can be one. It's an expression of godliness. It's an expression of fullness in the Gnostic system. That is your introduction to Gnosticism. I don't know what the time is here. 32, we have time. We have 10, 15 minutes for questions, but... Let me just summarize real quickly. The whole point with this is when you read about sacred marriage in the Da Vinci Code, the reason that that is an issue and the reason that Dan Brown and his sources want to convince you that this was part of Christianity, that Christianity has suppressed the female, that Christianity has suppressed the goddess, is not because this stuff is really taught in the Bible. Okay? Some will try to make it, force it into the New Testament in some odd passages, and we'll talk about those a little later. What they're really saying is, look, this is the way this particular sect of Christianity saw things. And this is the truth. This is the real Christianity. And it was suppressed because these nasty church fathers that you and I think of as the Orthodox you know, of, of Christianity... They were just prudish. They didn't like to talk about women. They didn't like to talk about sexual things. They tried to do whatever they could to, to suppress women and their roles in the church and their leadership and their character and, and everything like this. The reason, so Dan Brown you know, tells the story, is that they were reacting to, to what was really the truth, Gnosticism over here. And if, you've, if you're a discerning reader, Brown has tapped into a cultural sensitivity in, here in, in our time, how women are viewed and treated. And he's bringing you along on that thread into the Gnostic camp, but he's not telling you all this other stuff. He's not telling you about, again, sexual sacraments. He's not telling you that the God of your Old Testament is, is a liar and a fool and a blind person and, frankly, bad. Uh, he's not telling you all sorts of that stuff. Now, he may not know it. That's possible. But don't be duped into thinking that, you know, you know it's two sides of the same coin. There are fundamental differences between the Gnostic sect, and what historically was Orthodox Christianity. The primary one is, I'll give you the primary two and then I'll take questions. Orthodoxy has Jesus as an uncreated being. 
united in essence with God the Father, and they are both good. Gnosticism has Jesus as a created being who is above the God of the Old Testament, who is bad. Those are not two sides of the same coin. They are mutually exclusive. So don't be led astray into thinking that we're just talking about the same thing. We have any questions? If not, we can take a little break and we'll move to the next one. Go ahead. Question. Um, do Gnostics consider Yahweh or part of the other aeons? Yahweh is under the aeons. He is lesser in power than the aeons. He, is, he, he, he straddles and really, when he, when, he, when he starts to create material things like the world, he moves away from the middle realm down to the lower realm in, in the Gnostic universe. He is derivative from one of them, and even the lowest of them. So he is not on a par. Another question? In the back? Um, so there were Gnostics at the time of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, where did they come from? Where did the Gnostic thinking come from? And where did they fit into that, that time in history we as Christians you. Like, what were they doing? Right. The question is where, you know, the Gnostics were around, they developed, where did they come from? Gnosticism as, as a full-blown system, you don't have what we call Gnosticism until the second or third century AD as a system. You have elements of its thought, of its worldview prior. And they, the strands come from different places. One of the more obvious is that it was a struggle And frankly, if we're honest, it still is to some extent. It was a struggle to understand how you can have a God and three persons, but they're all the same, but yet they're not. And the Council of Nicaea was an attempt not to come up with a new position. The the Council of Nicaea is arguing for an, an ancient way of understanding that. And in, I think, the third or fourth session here, we're going to talk about Jesus as God well before Nicaea. And frankly, the idea that there was a, a Godhead in Judaism. That idea is not a Christian invention. It's Jewish. But backtracking, it's hard to understand. I'll, I'll take you through some Old Testament passages today. And you'll look at them and you'll go, well, there's two there. How can that be? How can there be two gods? I thought Jew, Jew, Judaism was this monotheist, you know. It is and it isn't. It depends how you define your terms, and it depends what the texts are saying. And they were struggling with this like some of you. When I show you some of these things, you're going to go, well, you know, how, how did that work? Why didn't they get that? Or if they got it, why did they go over here with it? And that kind of thing. Gnostics are trying to... to they're struggling, you know, and I, I feel somewhat sympathetic uh, to uh, Gnostics on that level and to Arius, who was the, the, the focal point of the Council of Nicaea, his heresy, because he's just trying to figure this out. Another strand is Jewish mysticism. The idea of, well, what is it really like at home in the Godhead? <laughs> I mean, what is it really like? Who like lives there with God? And, you know, we ask these questions now. Well, before there was a creation, what was there? What was God doing? If there was no time, can God have thoughts that are in order? Can there be chronology before time? I mean, they're thinking these thoughts, and when the ancients are thinking these thoughts, they're they're essentially putting them down either in the heads or in writing. They're trying to systematize their thinking to understand what goes on with God. And what's his relationship to these other beings that we see in the scripture? We see plural Elohim in the Old Testament. We see the word. We see the name. We see the angel of the Lord. We see the one who rides on the clouds who isn't Yahweh in Daniel 7. They're, they're reading their Bibles and they're trying to grapple with how to, how to correctly systematize this. Now what happens is you take those questions, which are all legitimate, and Gnostics come from Egypt and what they did was they they started to try to merge what they're seeing in the Old Testament 
and in Jewish writings. This is all before the New Testament's written, and it carries on when the New Testament starts getting written. And they start looking for counterparts in the local religion of Egypt. And once that happens, you, you see this convergence of threads. And out of that comes Gnosticism. Another strand is, what about evil? Why is there evil? You know, we, orthodoxy has, I'm not going to say there's just one explanation for this, but orthodoxy wants to see, and, you know, I agree, but I'm not going to go any further than that because there are ways to understand this, and, and there's difference of opinion. But the orthodox position is that, look, if there's anybody in control of evil other than God, then we've got problems. Then we're dualists. Then there's a competitor to God out there who's just as powerful as he is, and that isn't reflected in the text of the, of the Jewish Bible. The God of Israel, you know, who is our God, the God of the New Testament, because the, the, the church derives from you know, Judaism in that sense. And so that just wasn't an option. But then that means that God is somehow in control, ultimately, of evil. Now, does God cause evil? Does he passively allow evil to happen? God is, is bigger than evil, so he can take evil and, and manipulate it and work it and predestine it to good. Okay, that is taught in the New Testament, these ideas. But to the Gnostic, here's the way the Gnostic answered the question. The reason that there's evil is because that's the way the world was created. There's no fall. It was just created evil. And if you have an, an earth that's created evil, somebody evil had to do it. And since that person in the Jewish Bible is Yahweh, Yahweh must be bad. That must be why there's evil. Because the, the fullness, the true God, the light, would never create anything evil. Therefore, there's a separation between the true God and this God over here who creates the world. Gnostics were troubled by the, the problem of evil. And that's an honest question. That's an honest you know, issue. So I'm, I'm not going to portray Gnosticism as some sinister movement or force that, you know, four guys got in a room one day because they didn't have anything better to do and say, hey, let's create a counter system to Christianity. We all just hate these Christians. Let's come up with something that mocks it and turns it on its head or whatever. No, they were asking the same questions that everybody else was asking. And they were doing some bad exegesis <laughs> uh, in the process, but the questions were good ones. And they were reacting not necessarily to, uh, you know, to the orthodox point of view, but what Dan Brown tries to give you the impression of, and his sources especially, you know, Brown's just a, a fiction writer. They want you to think that at one time, Gnosticism was the dominant view. And that was never true. There is not a scrap of evidence for that. Gnosticism was always a peripheral thing that was reacting against the majority opinion. And the majority opinion was not just based on, well, oh, which way is the wind blowing? You know, we have so much power here in the second century church. You know, forget the fact that the Romans are killing us off in droves. You know, we have so much power here, we need to suppress these Gnostics. It, it's just, it's silly. But that's the view that, that Brown's sources want to convey you with. They want to give you this impression that, well, the reason Orthodoxy won was because Irenaeus and these other church fathers were so powerful. They just, you know, they just put the screws to everybody else. Hey, they're trying to survive like everybody else. Christianity is not legal. You can be killed if you have a copy of the New Testament. This is not a bunch of power-hungry slobs you know, dictating something to this little piddly group over in Egypt. It is just a mischaracterization of what the historical record is. But again, I, I want to leave you the impression, it's not that Gnostics were started out as this sinister group. They're asking good questions, but they're, they're basically refusing the instruction, and, and they're, they're not refuting the arguments of the majority. They're coming up with their own arguments, and that eventually leads to the Council of Nicaea, where they have their day in court, and they lose, okay, because they cannot refute the arguments of the majority. It's not that they go there as the majority and then somebody gangs up on them and sticks them the, the theological knife in the back. That is not what happened. And we'll talk about that today later too. Another question? Yes. Um, so the Council of Nicaea pretty much put, put an end to Gnosticism then? No, or? no. The Council of Nicaea made a declaration. There, there, were, there were a lot of people there who, who did not buy what Arius was saying but they didn't want him expelled because in their eyes, he was still a Christian. 
you know, he, he accepts that Christ is the way of salvation and so forth and so on. But the, the opinion came to be that, you know, pragmatically speaking, we, we need to do something so that the rest of the ancient world knows that Arius' position is not, you know, correct. So they did expel him, but even after he is expelled from his position, Arians are referred to as Christians in ancient writings. It's not that, it's not that you're evil and you're going to hell now or anything like that, but the, the whole point was that we're going to declare that this position is incorrect. Arius is not able to articulate the position that reflects the ancient text, but we're just kind of hoping that, you know, he, he comes back to the fold. Gnosticism and, and Arianism continued, you know, along uh, with their own followers. Eventually it just, it sort of dies out because there aren't many of them, you know, relatively speaking. Uh, but the, the ideas get picked up, you know, in the Middle Ages by certain groups, um, you know, early, late Middle Ages. It, it never completely goes away because some people like that position. They just, they prefer, they thought that that was a good answer to these questions, but it was never, you know, the, the majority. And they never produced anything that, that, that refuted the majority. They, they never did it, but they didn't really care because they just preferred the position. Now, is there an official start to the date of Gnosticism? No, not, not as a movement. You're, what happens is its, its threads go all the way back, you know, into pre-Christian days uh, with, you know, with your Jewish Bible in the, in the first millennium BC, we'll say. There are threads, there are ideas in Gnostic, what we call Gnostic ideas in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They didn't have Gnostics there, but Gnostics liked the way this guy over here wrote that. I like the way that scroll says that. So we're going we're gonna to use that to, to foster our idea over here. Uh, you have all these strands sort of converging in the second, second or third century when Gnosticism becomes known as a movement, and you have figures like Arius who become sort of you know, champions for, for this view. Anything else? Okay, let's take a couple of minutes. Okay, the second session today is a comparison really of the, the, the Testament issue, the gospel issue. I wanna, I'm going to make it a little bit broader than that. But the manuscripts of the New Testament, not just the gospels, versus the Gnostic gospels from Nag Hammadi. In the Da Vinci Code, one of the characters, uh, Lee Teabing, who is cast in the story as an expert on the Holy Grail, which we find out in the Da Vinci Code, the Holy Grail is not a chalice or cup. It is a bloodline uh, of Jesus. But one of the characters, uh, Professor Teabing, says this, more than 80 gospels were considered for the New Testament, and yet only a relative few were chosen for inclusion, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John among them. These texts, quote, are the earliest Christian records and the unaltered gospels. Now, before I turn the slide here, there is a reason why, when the Da Vinci Code came out, every scholar from any theological position, from the most rabid fundamentalist to the most rank atheistic liberal, said, this is bunk. And this is one of the biggest reasons why. These claims, as far as the nature of the Gospels, earliest and unaltered, are just frankly laughable to people who do this for a living. But again, it's like, well, it's just fiction. And everybody could have lived with that if it wasn't for the fact on the first page or the inside cover of the Da Vinci Code, he talks about the meticulous research that went into this and how this is just going to change everything and then successive interviews. That's what torqued people off, regardless of their theological position. Because frankly, scholars don't like when people invade their turf and say dumb things about it. Okay? Now, what are the Nag Hammadi documents? You'll notice in red there on the map, the bottom third is Nag Hammadi, the place. The Nag Hammadi texts are a collection of 13 ancient codices, which is essentially what we'll call it a book, something bound on one side or folded, containing over 50 Gnostic texts. They were discovered by accident in Upper Egypt in 1945. The man at the center is the credited discoverer, Muhammad Ali Saman, 
had gone off, kind of like the Dead Sea Scrolls story. He goes off and looking for fertilizer in the mountains close to his village, and he unearths a jar, and the rest, they say, is history. The books that were found at this location were quickly sold into the black market. The Egyptian government eventually got them uh, you know, fairly quickly. This is what they look like. Uh, you'll notice that you know, as manuscripts go, this is pretty decent condition. I mean, you can get a whole lot worse than this. Uh, despite the, uh, the figure to the left there, you can see how tattered some sections are. They were taken to the Cairo Museum, and another few years went by before scientists knew about them. In 1966, at a conference in Italy devoted to Gnosticism and these new texts, James Robinson assembled a group of editors and translators to publish the codices in English. This is the cover of the book. I have it with me here if you want to look at it today. Uh, Robinson was chosen to oversee the project, and eventually a facsimile edition was published. Facsimile editions, they're just literally pictures of each leaf in book form. They're, they're, they're plates. If you've ever seen a book that has plates in it, that's what you get. It's only $750, so rush right out and get yours. <laughs> uh, it's an expensive set. Subsequently to that, though, there was a translation in English. And the introductory material prefacing the translation, this is taken from Robinson's book, says this. The library of 4th century papyrus manuscripts consists of 12 codices plus 8 leaves, so on and so forth. 4th century. These were Coptic manuscripts. Coptic is just the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian language put into a sort of Greek. A lot of the letters in Coptic and Greek match. There are a few different letters that were added because of the sounds in the Egyptian language that the Greeks didn't use. But there's a lot of overlap there in the language. But these were from the fourth century. Now the first century, I, I should say this before we go much further so you get this fixed in your mind. The first century is the year zero to 99. Second century begins with the one, as in 100 on. Third century begins with two. You just you, you back it up a digit, okay? So fourth century, we're talking about written in the 300s sometime. This is Coptic, but everyone agrees, and rightly so, that the Coptic texts were actually themselves translations of older Greek material. One of the ways that's known is there are lots of Greek loan words in the texts. There are other ways to tell that too, but we're not going to worry about that for today. These texts, according to the Da Vinci Code, are the earliest Christian records. Okay. Boy, he didn't look very, <laughs> very far for that. Here are some sources. And again, if you get the DVDs, uh, you can look these books up if you're interested. And I recommend taking some interest in textual criticism. It, it, I know it sounds horrible, but it's actually really interesting. Text of the Greek New Testament. Textual criticism by David Allen Black is a nice intro for the layperson. I recommend it. Dave's a nice guy, too. He's a friend of mine. Canon of Scripture, F.F. F. Bruce, is a classic. And the latest work on the canon, The Formation of the Christian Biblical Canon, by MacDonald, is really quite good. Um, again, these are, these are well-recognized mainstream scholars with no particular axe to grind. Let's talk about the date, though. From those books, those books were my sources, places you can go to check up on me as I go through this. If you look at the timeline here, you have the cross, 33 AD. We'll take that as a sort of a consensus date. New Testament Gospels and Acts, the book of Acts, which is the fifth book in the New Testament order, were written sometime between 50 and 80 AD. That is not a conservative fundamentalist number. That is a consensus view. There are very few people who would date them before. Some people would put Mark in the 40s. And there are very few people who would go beyond 80 for any gospel, 50 to 80. Now you have the presumed Greek originals of the Gnostic text, and you can see with the blue there that we're talking at least, at least 100 years after the New Testament books. And then, of course, the Coptic Gnostic copies. Now, why 50 to 80 AD for the New Testament? What's the evidence? In other words, are you going to come here and just have me tell you that and walk away thinking, oh, that's nice? Why do people say that? Well, there's actually evidence for that. Three non-technical points for today are the Gospels, all of them, or at least Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
prophesy the destruction of the temple. In other words, there's a prediction. Jesus makes predictions about the temple being destroyed. That happened in 70 AD. Everybody on the planet knows that. Okay? However, none of the Gospels mention its fulfillment. So the presumption is that they were written prior to the fulfillment of the prophecy. Because nobody mentions it. And that was a big deal in Judaism. A huge deal. Luke never mentions the death of Paul and Peter in either his Gospel or its sequel, the book of Acts. We know from external sources that Paul died in the late 60s, 66, 67 AD. The, the book of Acts ends before his death, and Luke was written prior to Acts, so there you go. Do the math. Manuscript evidence. This is called the Rylands Papyrus. It is the oldest manuscript piece, manuscript in any size of the New Testament. And it dates to roughly the 130s, or the 140s, something like that. It is from John 18, 31 to 33. This is when Jesus is in front of Pilate. I'm not going to translate the whole thing, but just so you know where it comes from. Uh, Therefore, Pilate said, uh, said to them, Take him, you all take him, and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, We are not authorized to put to death anyone. And they said that in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, which spoke of the type of death that he would die, and so on and so forth. But the red are the letters that show up in this papyrus. And so this is what papyrologists and New Testament paleographical experts do. They'll take a scrap, and now, especially with the use of computers, you can find where the matches are in a document. Okay? This is the oldest one. Now, if this manuscript dates to the 130s, the original, logically, let's put our thinking caps on, logically would have been prior to the 130s. Okay? Again, why doesn't Brown or his sources go into this? They either don't know it, which isn't good if you're writing, especially if you're claiming to write nonfiction, or they don't want you to know, which is probably worse. Do we have any other hard evidence that the New Testament Gospels are older than the oldest Nag Hammadi material? What about the rest of the New Testament? Well, the answer is, yeah, we do. Very simply, early church fathers, early church writers quote the New Testament. Like, what else would they quote? <laughs> they're doing sermons, they're doing commentaries, they're writing theologies. They're quoting the New Testament. And we know when these guys live because of Roman records. Okay, we know when they lived. We know when Barnabas lived. We know, we know all these, these figures, their dates and everything else. So when they quote something, it fixes a date for that quotation. The thing they're quoting must have existed prior to the quotation. This is simple, coherent logic that apparently escapes Brown's sources. Or again, they just don't want you to know. The Epistle of Barnabas, there are the dates 70 to 79, quotes Matthew and Mark. The Didache quotes Matthew extensively, and that's between 70 and 130. Luke and John are both quoted in what's called the Muratorian Fragment. Again, 170 to 180. There are external methods of dating too. Paleographical analysis, carbon-14, whatnot. Polycarp, there are his, these are his life dates, 69 to 155, lived a long life. He was a convert of the Apostle John, you know, the John, quotes the book of Acts in his own epistle to the Philippians. The shepherd of Hermas quotes Acts several times. There you have the dates. The epistles of Paul. Romans is cited by Clement of Rome a lot. There are his dates. He's also cited, Romans is cited by Polycarp and the Didache. First Corinthians is cited in the Didache and the shepherd of Hermas. So is Second Corinthians and also by Polycarp. Galatians is cited by Polycarp and Diognetius. Ephesians and Colossians by Polycarp, Clement, and Ignatius. There you have Ignatius' dates. Philippians is cited again by Polycarp. You, get, you see a pattern emerging? What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through every book of the New Testament. Every book of the New Testament is quoted in a source earlier than the oldest Gnostic material at all. Every one of them, without exception. Epistles of Paul, more of them, First and Second Thessalonians. 
First Timothy and Titus, again cited by Clement, the Didache. Ignatius makes allusions to the personal letter of Philemon. There's a debate whether that's an actual quotation or an allusion, but an allusion you know, works for our purposes. The book of Hebrews is cited frequently by Clement. James also, first and second Peter, cited by Clement. First John, the shepherd of Hermas. Second John by Polycarp and other sources, and the book of Revelation cited by Hermas and Justin Martyr, whose date is 160. Every book in the New Testament is quoted by somebody before any Gnostic gospel was written. I'm not talking the translation was written. Now, the only possible exception among the Gnostic material is the gospel of Thomas. Thomas might be roughly contemporary with some of the later Gospels, but that is the only one, and there's debate over that. But I'm, I'm telling you because there's debate on it. Okay? And by the way, the Gospel of Thomas, if you, um, again, a lot of this scholarly material is really expensive and you have to be near a library to get a hold of it. But there are, you know what a harmony of the Gospels is? When they'll take the Gospels, the four of them, or the three anyway, the three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they will put them together into a flowing narrative. There are sources by uh, scholars, one of whom I know, Craig Evans. If, if you listen to Coast to Coast a couple weeks ago, Craig was on the show uh, talking about the Gospel of Judas. He has produced a harmony of the Gospels and Thomas so that you know where Thomas quotes from the Gospels. Okay, now let's put our thinking caps on again. Again, I'm really speaking you know, to people who are going to view the DVD who just are enamored with the Da Vinci Code. If you're quoting from something, that something exists prior to your quote. Okay, it just makes sense. So even in the oldest case, again, it's debated, Thomas might be later, but just so that you know, we're not running from the Gospel of Thomas. The statement implies or assumes several things. Let me go back to the statement. This is, you've seen it before, but repeating it. More than 80 Gospels are considered for the New Testament, yet only a few were chosen. When Tebing says that, you, the reader, are given certain suggestions. That certain things are implanted in your mind. Things like that all the Gospels written in the ancient world were being considered at relatively the same time. You know, there are over 80 Gospels considered, like, like they're having this big smackdown of Gospels, you know, like we've got to choose which ones are in now. Uh, that isn't true. Again, in the Da Vinci Code, Brown's academic characters make the assertion that the decision over what books to include was done at Nicaea. Nicaea did not meet to discuss anything about the canon. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to Nicaea, the session on that. But it's not true that the, all the Gospels were around and, and they, you know, being considered at the same time. He also sort of plants the thought in your head that there existed no early consensus. In other words, Roughly around the decades that followed the writing of the New Testament Gospels, for which Gospels told the, the, the true story of Jesus, there was a consensus about which Gospels correctly preserved the story. The early church almost immediately recognized what we know as the four. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute or two. But there was an early consensus. What Brown wants you to think is that nobody knew. It was just so up in the air. What do we do? We've got 80 Gospels. You know, how do we know? Uh, there was a consensus long before most of the other ones were written. And in fact, if, if Tom, Thomas might be the only exception. The four were in existence before any of the other ones were around. That sort of compels a, a consensus if there's like only four to start with. Third thing is that he creates the impression that all the Gospels were worthy of equal weight or consideration. Nobody believed that in the ancient world. Some liked others. Oh, that, that one's kind of cool. I kind of like the way that guy says that. And some of them, oh, this is just ridiculous. You know, why would anyone want to read this? Who's the idiot that wrote it? I mean, there were, there, it was an uneven thing. It was an uneven thing as far as the other Gospels. The fact is that the followers of Christ had chosen the four canonical Gospels very early, again, with the possible exception of Thomas. Now, here's how we know that. Okay, don't just take my word for it. Here's how we know that. John dies roughly 96 AD. We know the Gospels are 50 to 80. John dies right around 100. 
In 144, this is 50 years, basically a generation afterward, we have a guy named Marcion come along. Marcion produced some writings in which he divided up the books he thought were inspired or were worthy of, of canonical status, and he grouped them into two headings, the Gospel and the Apostle. Basically, the Gospel he liked, and then certain writings of, of the Apostles. Marcion was kind of flaky. A lot of church fathers took off after him. But the important point is that he was thinking of which books were accepted. He did not include the Gospel of Thomas. He did not include any of the Nag Hammadi Gospels. Marcion, to, to call Marcion Orthodox would, is really iffy. Uh, so he could have felt very free to include one of the Gnostic Gospels in his, but he doesn't. Again, you can go look up Marcion and read about him if you want. Justin Martyr in 160, produces a listing of what he calls the memoirs of the, of the apostles. In 170, Tatian did something very important. He produced what's called the Dia Tesseron. It was a harmony of the four. This is 170 AD. Again, this is before most of the Nag Hammadi Gospels are even written. They've never even seen the light of day. Tatian produces a harmony of the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And it's still available in, in fragment, fragmentary form, uh, mostly in Syriac. The Muratorian fragment, again listed, various books as canonical, again the Gospels, 170, describes the four Gospels, 13 epistles of Paul, Jude, and two epistles of John, and attributes canonical status to them. Again, this is well before we have Nag Hammadi Gospels floating around. Now, I want to rabbit trail in Tatian's Dia Tesseron because there's another reason why it's important. 170 AD, he produces this, this fourfold harmony. This edition proved very popular, especially in Tatian's native Assyria, where the Syriac-speaking church was unwilling to abandon it at the beginning of the 5th century in favor of a new Syriac version of the four separate Gospels. Very popular. Now, the Gospel of Thomas, again, some people want to date roughly contemporary with the canonical Gospels, but here's the important point. The Gospel of Com Thomas is called the Gospel to Didymus Judas Thomas. And it shows that title comes from the eastern part of the Roman Empire, the Syriac-speaking church. That's the only place that that designation is found in that part of the world. That tells us that the Gospel of Thomas, whenever it was produced, was around in the Syriac church. And guess what? They did not include it in the Dia Tesseron. Tatian did not accept it at the level of the four Gospels. If he had, we'd have, you know, the Penta Tesseron or something, you know, whatever it is. I'm being a little flippant here. It's not the, the proper terminology in Greek, but you get the idea. You'd have five. You'd have a harmony of five. Or Thomas would replace one of the other ones. Tatian did not deem it canonical. Guess what else? Tatian does not come from the western part of the empire where the evil bishops, the evil western church fathers could, you know, twist his arm behind his back and say, you better not, you know, you better say the right things about the Gospels. It's also, what, 180 years, or 150 years prior to Nicaea. The four were accepted hundreds of years before we ever get to Nicaea. If you're going to look at the primary sources, that's the, that's the only conclusion you can draw because that's what they say, you know, what we, at least what we have left. Now, the other claim in the Da Vinci Code, the Gnostic Gospels are the unaltered Gospels. This, this, I really love this one. The statement implies or assumes some flawed ideas. One, that the Gnostic Gospels all agree on the details of Jesus' life and its te his teachings. The Gnostic Gospels don't all agree about who Jesus was and what he said and where he went and what he did. There are disagreements. They do not match perfectly. Therefore, you know, there could have been some changes, some alterations, whatever. They're not, they're not this unified monolithic thing that, oh, perfect agreement. It's just not, not true. It also implies that disagreements between the canonical Gospels invalidate them as accurate sources for the life and teachings of Jesus. 
Well, let's examine the, the logic a little bit uh, before we move on. If I were to, well, let's just take a look here. Let's go to this one. The Gnostic Gospels do frequently agree or disagree. This is a quote from Dictionary of Jesus in the Gospels. You will notice here the portion that is in yellow. There are significant differences between the Greek fragments of Thomas, and we must therefore have, it must have existed in two versions, two redactions. So on the one hand, the Da Vinci Code wants you to think that the stuff in the New Testament just disagrees all the time about Jesus, and, and, and how, can they, how can any of them be right? There must be errors in there. They don't give us a unified picture of Jesus. Something's wrong here. But over here, the Gnostic Gospels are unaltered. They just present this wonderful story about Jesus, and it's so coherent. And we don't have these problems over with the evil, nasty New Testament that, or the, where the Gospels disagree with each other on points. It is just, it is just buffoonery. Okay? On the one hand, the Gnostic Gospels disagree a lot. On the other hand, disagreement doesn't mean error. Illustration. If, let's go back to 9-11. Maybe some of you did save the newspaper. If you went to New York the day after 9-11 and you bought three or four newspapers about what happened on that day, would the accounts all agree word for word? No. I mean, you pick up a newspaper any day and look at a common story, sports page, lifestyle, whatever. You have different people writing. They use different words. They highlight different parts of an event. Does that mean that any of them are wrong? Does it of necessity mean that any version is wrong? No. They might be. But it doesn't necessarily mean that because there's different people. They write from their own perspective. They choose. They have a pile of information and a limited amount of space. Same thing in the ancient world. You don't go down to your you know, to your Rite Aid or to Office Max and get another ream of paper. You got what you got. And if you screw it up, you know, God be with you to find another piece of paper to write on because it's not like you, you know, they, you can't buy it. You got to make it. And it takes a long time. Or you got to go skin the goat that you're saving, you know, for whatever meal. You know, it, it's, it's just a different world. On the other hand, let's put yourself in the classroom. Let's say you're, you know, you're a high school teacher, professor, whatever, and you've given an assignment uh, to your class to write a paper. And you go into class the day the paper's due, and you collect the papers, and you're shuffling through them in your office, and lo and behold, yeah, there's four of them here that they, they agree word for word. What would you think? Somebody's copying. <laughs> We have plagiarism here, or somebody's copying, there's collusion, and whatnot. Let's take this to the Gospels. Yeah, the Gospels disagree. Disagreement does not necessarily mean that any of them are wrong. This is why it's kind of neat when people come along and produce harmonies and synoptists. Synoptics. Exact agreement would suggest collusion, but that isn't what you find in the New Testament. I'm glad they disagree, because if they all agreed word for word, that would look like they all got together in a smoke-filled room and said, let's get the story right. That's not what you have. The Gospels disagree, again, because of difference in audience, difference in personality. You know, there, there are similarities, because these guys know each other. They probably pal around with each other periodically, but there's also independent work. It's just what you'd expect in the, in the normal circumstance of you know, those days. Now, I'm going to recommend some books. Again, check up on me. Buy them. They're not expensive. At least these aren't. And these are the best sources for historical reliability of the Gospels from people who are scholars who are aware of the disagreements between the Gospels. Craig Blomberg has produced one on the historical reliability of the Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He has a companion volume on John's Gospel. Same focus. 
This is not light reading, I will warn you, but it's the best thing in print. Just bar none. Why four Gospels? Again, from my friend David Allen Black. Black tries to write for the lay audience, so if you're going to start somewhere, I'd start with Black. But the, the mother load, the, the trench work, is, Bloom, is Blumberg. And Rethinking the Synoptic Problem, again, by Black. Okay, that is the end of the session for the New Testament. We have, I can't remember when we started, but we can take some questions again. Summary. I'll try to do this each time. The summary is you need to match the claims of the book and the sources Brown is using, that the Gnostic Gospels are older, that they're more consistent, that they're more reliable, that they're unaltered. None of those points can stand up with actual historical evidence. Guys who were alive, who were quoting the New Testament, we know their dates, their dates are fixed absolutely. They're quoting the material before any of the Gnostic Gospels even existed. Now, I don't know why Brown doesn't put this in his book. Well, maybe I do. It wouldn't sell as well, I guess. But, but again, he's just a fiction writer. He's Dan Brown, cool idea for a story. Let's write one. This is, what, this is how I make my living. I write neat stories. The people that I, that I think are more worthy of blame, blame that are really guilty of, frankly, pseudo-scholarship are his sources. People like Michael Bajant, Lincoln, Richard, you know, Richard Lay, Henry Lincoln, uh, Picknett and Prince, these people who are writing, quote, nonfiction, and they're telling you stuff, and they're not giving you the information. They either don't know it, which doesn't speak well of their ability and their, their credentials for writing this, whatever book they're writing, or they don't want you to know. They have an agenda to push. And either one is bad. I'm going to let them take the pick and explain to you, explain to me, why this stuff isn't in their works. Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. You uh, went into a long parenthesis on the Gospel of Thomas as the only exception. And I heard up the arguments, but I'm not sure exactly it's, it's the exception in what sense of age. Chronologically, yeah. And maybe the only one that is as old as the New Testament originals? Yeah. The, the, the reason that that is supposed is Thomas is the only Gnostic gospel for which there is Greek material. Remember, the, the supposition is that you, know, you have the Gnostic gospels, they're all written in Coptic, they are translations of older Greek originals. There isn't one shred of Greek material for any of the Gnostic material except for Thomas. And since we have that from Thomas, and, and I mean, they're, they're little pieces. You know, it's not like you don't even have pages you know, in Thomas's case. But the Greek original is known because of the, of the scraps that are there. And so the difficulty is, well, you know, can we get a reliable date you know, from uh, the, the scraps? You know, it, it's, it, it's kind of a carbon-14 problem because to date it, you'd have to destroy it. And there's that little of it left. So the, the guess is somewhere. It might be as early as 50, which is, would, would put it contemporary with the, uh, the canonical gospels. But that's the only one, just because there just isn't material you know, for it. Another question. Yes. This isn't redundant, but uh, Thomas preceding the uh, association with Gnosticism was it? Is considered as you're referencing as a Gnostic text? And how was it viewed before and other other references? Well, have any of you ever read Thomas? Thomas is not actually, you, you've read it? Okay. Thomas is not actually a gospel like you and I think of a gospel. When we think of a gospel, we think of a narrative history of the life of Jesus. That isn't actually what Thomas is. Thomas is a list of sayings. Think of the book of Proverbs, and you have sort of an analogy. Uh, they're called <coughs> logions, or logia would be the correct plural. They're just sayings, things that supposedly Jesus said. So the reason that this collection of sayings is, is viewed as Gnostic is because some of the content of the sayings thematically and conceptually will match Gnostic material that is much longer and more theological treatises. So there, that's where the association comes in. 
And even if Thomas is as early as the 50s or the 60s or whatever, you, what you have is you have pieces, you have threads of the fuller Gnostic thinking that comes later. You have threads of that, little pieces of it, resident in Thomas, which comes, again, as, as you know, we, we mentioned last time, Gnosticism as a movement is the result of a convergence of threads of ideas. Um, and so you, you have Thomas reflecting some of those. It, you know, if, if all we had, you could go to some Dead Sea Scrolls, and if you just selectively quoted certain lines, uh, and let, let's say nobody knew what, where this was from, and you just like put it in front of an Gnostic scholar, and he read this line, he'd say, oh, that's Gnostic. You know, because it sounds like something that's going to be expounded in Gnosticism later. But, so you have these, these threads out there, these ideas. And that's where, that's where uh, Thomas would get the association. Another question? So now, how did the Essenes fit into this? Like the Cathar Essenes? The, what well, period of time were they from? The, the, the Cathars are, of course, in the Middle Ages. And they're going to, just a quick comment on them. The, the Cathars are going to pick up on certain ideas that are associated with Gnosticism. And so they get, they get linked to Gnosticism, I, I think somewhat fairly. Um, it, it's not that, that you could label them Gnostics totally. But some of the ideas are, are there. Uh, the Cathars, of course, are centuries, frankly, millennia later than the Essenes. The Essenes, of course, are living before the New Testament era. The Dead Sea Scrolls will date uh, on the spectrum. Some of the older Dead Sea Scrolls will go back as far as 300 BC. You have some that go into the first century uh, AD uh, as far as paleography and carbon 14 dating. The Essenes are going to be residents at, at the place Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered. It's still probably the majority view that the Essenes produced what are called the sectarian manuscripts at Qumran, the ones that the community actually produced as opposed to others they were collecting, like the Book of Enoch. The Essenes didn't write the Book of Enoch, but they, they had a library there and it was in there. But some of the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls they produced and wrote about themselves and their own ideas. Those are called the sectarian manuscripts. You will have certain ideas within the sectarian manuscripts, again, little threads that will show up later in Gnosticism. But it would not be accurate to call the Essenes Gnostics because we don't, we don't have Gnosticism as a movement. Until, as a, when I say movement, I'm talking about a, a religious system that has its own books and its own fully developed theology. You don't have that until second or third century and we know that because of the Gnostic Gospels. That's, what, that's, you know, that's the evidence for that. But you'll have certain ideas that are present at Qumran. You know, I, a lot of the popular writers like Bajent and Lee and Lincoln and Picknett and Prince want to create some sort of association between the Essenes and the Gnostics and the Masons and all these other groups. Uh, the only way you can do that is to ignore the date of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And... I think there's one person, you know, maybe two that I'm thinking of here. One for sure, there, there's one scholar who doesn't like the dating, Barbara Tiering, whose writings show up a lot in these other sources. So basically they're quoting Tiering against literally the thousands of other scholars who agree with the work of the team that produced the, you know, the dating on the scrolls. And, and Tiering does not base her date on carbon-14 or paleography. She thinks that she's unlocked a code, a coded language in the scrolls uh, that convinces her that there's overlap with the New Testament. And that even though no New Testament characters are mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they aren't, go read them. I'm not keeping you from them. Go read the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're in English. You will not find any New Testament character in any Dead Sea Scroll. Zero. Nada. I mean, I don't know any other way to say it. You just won't find them. But that doesn't deter tearing. She says, well, the New Testament characters are encrypted, and they're coded in there. And I'm glad you brought that up, Ted. The best book written on this subject is right here. Written by two liberals. They're not fundamentalists. They're not evangelicals. They're not Bible bangers. Okay, they're two liberal scholars. Jesus, Qumran, and the Vatican. 
frankly, they got ticked. <laughs> they got upset. And, you know, I have often made the comment on radio and in venues like this that it is such a crying shame that scholars think themselves too far above the interested general readership to fool around with this nonsense that people like Bajent, Lee, and Lincoln and these other guys are writing. They, honestly, I mean, I, I travel in these circles. Scholars generally are elitists. That shouldn't surprise you, okay? They honestly think that writing against these guys is just frankly beneath them and is a waste of their time. Here's an exception. These two guys finally got irritated enough with, with this twaddle that they wrote this book. It's probably about 15 years old now. Let me take a quick look. Uh, 1994, 12 years. And this is a thorough dismantling of Tearing and all these popular writings. You finally had two guys. They weren't on the Scrolls team, so they're not part of the conspiracy. Okay? They're just two New Testament scholars, early Judaism scholars that just said, enough, enough. This is nuts, and we're going to address it. So they did that. I highly recommend the book. It's out of print. You'd, you'd have to get it used, but I found a cheap copy, so you can too. Yeah. Another question. Okay, let's quit then for a few minutes. Okay, the third session for today is Were Jesus and Mary Magdalene Married? And it's an assessment of the evidence for this offered in the Da Vinci Code and, of course, in Dan Brown's sources that he draws from. This, of course, is the central question, who was Mary Magdalene, uh, of the whole debate. Brown and his sources build a lot on understanding Mary as the lower left-hand corner, of course, you know, the bare breasts uh, depicted in art often this way because of the supposition, an incorrect supposition, that Mary Magdalene's you know, sins were somehow related to you know, sexual activity, that she was a harlot, a prostitute, and whatnot. There really isn't any evidence in the New Testament for that, but we're going to talk in the course of this session as to where the idea came from. And I'm going to try to show you how you know, the, essentially the chain of logic, the chain of thinking that led to a misconception of who Mary was. And then we'll talk about you know, who she really was and the, the claims of the Da Vinci Code. But the Da Vinci Code makes a great deal of casting the church as an evil enemy, an enemy to be looked upon with the hermeneutic of suspicion because they allegedly, supposedly, deliberately cast Mary as a prostitute, not because they misunderstood the New Testament, which is what I'm going to show you. That, that, that's really where it comes from. But they would say, no, Mary was taken as a harlot because the, the church deliberately wanted to suppress the idea that Jesus and Mary were married. That it was, it was, this was part of a, of a greater conspiracy to put down Mary in reaction to this truth that they wanted to suppress, that Jesus had a wife. Oh, by the way, I should mention, you notice in some of these that Mary is holding an egg. just thought I'd mention this in passing. If you wonder what that's about, there's a story. Uh, it's not a biblical story, uh, so it's, it's extra biblical about after the uh, resurrection, Mary uh, had audience with the emperor Tiberius. And she went before Tiberius and essentially was giving him the gospel, telling him about Jesus and the resurrection and so on and so forth. And she, uh, the story isn't clear whether she was going to you know, do something or whether this just was a happenstance. But the emperor said, resurrection, oh, come on, you know, that I see you have an egg in your hand. That egg would, would no sooner you know, turn red right now than the resurrection be true. And of course, the story is that the egg turns red. And she holds it up and says, you know, you, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's, it's an apocryphal story, but kind of an interesting one. But the church picked up on it uh, historically. And so you'll often see Mary with an egg, either the white or the red one, you know, in commemoration of the story. Who she wasn't. How did Mary Magdalene come to be identified as a prostitute? Now, this you're going to have to pay attention to closely 
this is not a shameless plug for the software company I work for, <laughs> but it is nevertheless our software. Uh, if you're interested, go. No, I won't give you the web. <laughs> this is the passage in uh, Luke chapter 7 where a sinful woman comes to Jesus and does you know, a certain thing and anoints his feet and whatnot. Let's just take a, look, a quick look at the passage. I don't want to read all these passages. I'm going to show you a bunch of them. But if, this is Luke 7. And so one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, took his place at the table. Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, so the woman is called a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at a table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him, that is Jesus, at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wipe them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And then Jesus, of course, answers him and basically tells him to back off. You go down to verse 48. Uh, he, says, he says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And everyone around says, wow, you know, who can forgive sins? You know, but God, he even forgives sins. And he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, if you look at this section, this pericope, to use scholar speak, you will notice that the woman is never named. There's no name given. It's really not even an indication of what kind of sins she is guilty of. Look at the next chapter, chapter 8. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages. So Jesus is even at a different location. Proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, so on and so forth. In the original New Testament, the way the Greek New Testament was written, there were no paragraph divisions. There were no verse divisions. They didn't even have spaces between the, le the, the words. It all ran together. And so it is possible, it is possible, again, we're trying to be not conspiratorial here, not, you know, not negative toward you know, the, some early church interpreters. It is possible that they just assumed that the woman in the narrative that preceded the narrative of chapter 8 were one and the same. Okay, that's one way that this could have happened. If you'll notice, though, there's no way that this is the case. What I'm going to show you here, again, it's going to be a little hard to follow until we get to a certain point, and I hope it'll come together for you. This is, in our software, a, a harmony or a synopsis, excuse me. On the left-hand column, just think that's where Matthew should be. There's a blank there now. Middle, okay, is Luke. And on the other side, we're going to have Mark. You'll notice here, this is Luke 7. We have the story of Jesus anointing by the sinful woman. Off here to your right, there's a little comment. There is a similar episode recorded in Mark 14 and Matthew 26, but it's a separate occasion. Here is Mark 14, Matthew 26. Luke in the middle. And you'll notice that the Three of them are narrating the same event, but they're, the details aren't always the same. So it starts out two days after, or after two days was the Feast of the Passover. Luke, Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which is called Passover. Matthew 26, you know, we get after this, and you know, it goes down where they're gathered again. In verse 2, it mentions the Passover. So we're locked in at this Passover event with all three. As you go on, again, these are consecutive verses. Let me go back. We have Mark 14, 1 to 2. Here's 3 to 9. So this is, this is running gospel narrative. You go back, and Luke has two verses for this event, but then he breaks off the story. There's nothing here. Here's the story of Jesus' anointing by a woman. But they're not the same story. We'll get to that in a second. Here Luke resumes, verse 3. Here's 10th verse of Mark. 
Matthew 26, and Luke resumes his account. Here's what you get if you look at them all together. You've got running narrative, running narrative. Luke starts up here at the same place as Matthew and Mark. Then there's this gap, and then they resume at the same place. This again, going back to the last thing about the synoptic problem, this is where there's disagreements between the Gospels. They won't include all the same stories or they'll disagree on details as well. Now my point here is to say that the account in Luke 7, the sinful woman anointing Jesus you know, with the, alab the ointment in the alabaster jar and weeping and wiping his feet with tears, that is a different story than the story in Matthew and Mark. How do we know that? How do we know there are different accounts? It's, the one in Luke is chronologically displaced. If you look here, this is the flow of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus begins his ministry in chapter 4, and here's your subject matter. Right here is where the sinful woman anoints Jesus. Down here is the passion and the resurrection narratives. This is where Matthew and Mark's stories are. But you can see Luke's story, again, is in the middle here. Just to illustrate, you have this gap. There's chronological displacement, so we know that they're not the same story. They also disagree in significant details. Here's Mark. Here's Matthew. The blue underlining is underlining similar elements. In some cases, pretty much identical. Here's Luke. The stuff in the red are the different details. It's not the same story. Now, what I'm angling here toward, or toward here, and I'm going to get here in a few minutes, is I said before, one explanation of how Mary could have been understood as a prostitute was they just assumed that the woman in chapter 8, who is named Mary Magdalene, is the sinner in, in Luke chapter 7. It never says that. The New Testament never makes the connection. The other way they could have done this is what I'm going to show you here by assuming that the sinful woman of Luke 7 is the same woman in these over here. The narratives never actually say that, and as we've seen, there's a chronological gap. The problem is, is that the woman in this story and this story is identified in John, the fourth gospel, as a Mary. Here's the, the passage. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany. And you read on, they're at dinner there with Lazarus and Martha. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, the early church, many interpreters, read this from John 12 and assumed that this named the, the woman in Matthew and Mark and then they assumed that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were telling the same story. And that is how Mary became, Mary Magdalene became an evil, sinful woman. The problem is, is that they're just, they're, they're still two different accounts. This, is, this has been the, the, the view since the Middle Ages. Why do I go into the detail? Because I want you to know that there is another reason why Mary could have been wrongly assumed to be a sinful woman other than the evil, conspiracy-minded early church, those nasty guys we call the church fathers, who were just doing all they could to suppress the truth of the Gnostic Christian you know, movement. It's conspiratorial logic which doesn't hold up. I'm actually going to devote a whole section to the logic behind you know, the, this view. It's very easy. I mean, good to just, just go back. If I had not showed you in red and blue. If I would have just said, sit down and read these real quickly, or, yeah, you've three read these before, you could come away thinking that they're the same. And especially when you read this in John 12, where Mary, some Mary, is named right here, because there's the feet, the wiping of <clears throat> the feet, and the ointment. You could assume they're the same thing, and that's what a lot of people in the early church did. And they were wrong. Since there are clear differences in the accounts, scholars recognize them as two separate events. 
again, what I'm going to give you here is nothing new to me. This is just the standard view among basically all New Testament scholars. They proposed two solutions for answering why the Gospels have two separate stories so closely alike. Let's talk about the easy solution. <laughs> the easy solution is that the separate stories of Matthew and Mark and Luke got mixed in John. They became mixed during oral tradition by the time John wrote, and he frankly just didn't know that they were separate stories. John goofed. He wrote the last gospel. He didn't know they were separate stories, and he mixed them up. That's the easy view. Problem with that, are, though, first, John would have been an eyewitness to these things, so you'd think he would remember what happened, at least you know, in some sense, enough to not mix them. Or two, John's gospel was the last one written. So the other stories were already around. He could have just looked. Why Wendy? He should have known. So it's not terribly coherent, but that is the easy solution. The harder but better solution is this. Matthew, Mark, and John do report the same event, and Luke's is different. Luke's is a different one. John adds the feed element in his report for a specific reason. This view is based on the observation that there are still irreconcilable differences between Luke's and John's versions requiring them to be separate events. Of course, we have the chronology problem that I pointed out a few minutes ago. Luke's chronology follows Matthew Mark, but it's an anointing event way before the other ones. And the sinful characterization of the woman in Luke 7. Now look at John and Luke 7. This is the one that names Mary, and I'm saying this one is the one that Matthew and Mark are talking about, and Luke is different. There are significant differences between Luke. Look at all the yellow and the one in John. Critical story details that are different. And though it's harder for us to understand, unless you're, you, you do this sort of thing, you, know, you study the Gospels a lot, this is the more coherent view, that Luke is just different. It's a different event. Now comments. The harder view means that the anointing of the head and feet are both for burial. This is easily explained in that the anointing of the head was a ritual act for anointing a king. That's how they usually did it in the Old Testament. The feet denoted putting one's enemies under one's feet. That's why you would anoint a king's feet, to signify that he would, it's a very common Old Testament gesture, to put the foot on the neck of your enemy meant to, that you've conquered them. If you go read Joshua, for instance, Joshua specifically commands, um, it's either Joshua or Judges, this is specifically commanded on an occasion or two where to signify victory, he says, go up and you put your foot on the neck of this conquered king to denote to everyone that victory is complete. It, it's, it was a commonly known gesture. Two, how likely is it that there would have been two anointing events in Jesus' life? Well, actually very, because it was a common practice for formal meals, which were held all the time. The harder view also means that there are two separate Simons. We found out later in, find out later in Luke that the Pharisee was named Simon. How likely is that? Very. There are 19 Simons in the work of Josephus. It's a common name. It's like Smith is now, or John, or Dave, or Mike for that matter. Simon was a popular name since it was the name of one of Israel's tribes and a Maccabean hero in the intertestamental period. Jesus' apostolic band had two Simons. Even in the 12, he got two of them, Peter and Simon the Zealot. And there were three Jameses among the 12. You just have common names, so it's, it's not much of a stretch. The harder view means that the gospel accounts don't contradict and that Mary Magdalene is not a prostitute. But there were lots of guys in the early church that just, they were wrong. And the tradition stuck. And Mary Magdalene became known in history as a prostitute, wrongly, because the New Testament never says that. It's unfortunate. So if she wasn't a prostitute, who was she? This is a search result that shows us all the places where Mary Magdalene shows up in the New Testament. This is it. Not, you know, not a, I mean, she's an important character for sure, but not in terms of quantity of reference. You've got, of course, Matthew, Mark, references there, and some of it we've already seen. She's the first one, of course, you know, to see the resurrected Christ. She's at the crucifixion, very loyal to Jesus when Peter and the apostles are, you know, getting out of Dodge. You know, Mary sticks, you know, sticks by the Lord and goes to the crucifixion site. 
Luke 8, 1 to 3 says Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. We know that for sure. Matthew 27, 55 tells us that several women, including her, traveled with Jesus and the twelve. According to Mark 15, a group of women watched the crucifixion from afar. The first one mentioned is Mary. Mark 15, again, she gets to see the empty tomb. The story makes apparent that Mary Magdalene, like the other disciples, was not anticipating encountering a risen Jesus. Now, if you stop and think about it, this runs quite contrary to the claim in the Da Vinci Code that there was a conspiracy to get Jesus off the cross early, or this was a plot that they crucified someone else. It's all the basic Passover plot stuff from the 1960s uh, by Hugh Schoenfeld that now Michael Bajent in his book, The Jesus Papers, is basically rehashing for us 40 years later. They were not expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. If they were just, if this was some sort of plot, you know, these, these kinds of references are pointless. The disciples are depressed in the Gospels. They're bummed, you know, to put it in our vernacular. This is not a good thing. They are caught by surprise. when they, they, you know, I'll grant you they should have known better because Jesus is walking around half the time saying, the Son of Man must go up to Jerusalem and there the chief priests will grab him and they'll beat him and they'll kill him and he'll rise again the third day. And the disciples are like, what? Did, did you hear something? It must have been a fly buzzing by my ear or something. I mean, it's like, why don't these guys get it? Because they're, they're like stunned when it happens. And you know, half, half, you know, Thomas doesn't even believe it after Mary comes back and tells them. He's the guy that says, well, I, until I stick my finger in the palms of his hands, I'm not going to believe it. You know, so much for the conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of ignorance if it was anything. If this is all there is in the New Testament, where does the idea that Mary, Magdalene, and Jesus were married come, come from? Now look, this right here, let's go back real quick. This is it. This is every place in the New Testament that Mary Magdalene is mentioned. So where do we get this idea Traverse forward here that she was married. Well, let's go to the Coptic Gnostic Library. And again, this is my, my pattern. This is what I like to do. I'm not making it up. What I'm going to show you, I'm not making up. This is the official publication source of all the texts from Nag Hammadi that Michael Bajent has grown to love. Okay? This is them. This is the official publication arm, Coptic Gnostic Library. And this, this is, by the way, a shameless plug for our software. We have them in electronic version. So I can search them at will, <laughs> which is really cool. Now, in the hard copy publication, this is page 169 from this source. This is the Gospel of Philip. This is the passage that the Da Vinci Code characters quote that somehow they get Jesus married from. It says, you know, the prior pages, that Jesus loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her blank. It sounds like match game you know, with Gene Rayburn. Okay, if you remember the old game show, why is there a blank here in the official publication of the Gnostic Gospels? Can anyone tell me why there's a blank here? Are they part of the greater conspiracy? It's blank there because there's no text there. There's a hole. There's nothing there. It's blank. Now, see the little asterisk here? What Michael Bajent should have done, A, is get the book, Look it up in the book and read the footnote. At the gap for 63, kiss. It says, or greet. It could even be greet. Although kiss may be correct, the Coptic construction found here is not normally used in this sense. Now, I didn't steal the book and put that in. Okay, this is from the official publishing arm, the Nag Hammadi Gnostic Gospels. Look it up. The red underlining, 
on her blank. Every time I say that, the music from Match Game just goes through my head. <laughs> on her, there was a guy at work that was actually playing that too. Like, you know, I don't know. I think he wanted me to have this moment that I'm having right now. On her blank, possibly on her mouth, on her feet, or on her cheek, or on her forehead. Now, why are there four options? This is what textual critics, like the guys who just put together the Gospel of Judas, do for a living. What they're doing, here's the Coptic. This is page 168. Uh, this is the flip page to the English I just showed you. Same underlined portion, it's a blank. The footnote down here. What they're doing is they're taking the blank and they're saying, okay, how many letters could fit in the blank in the actual manuscript? And once they have the number, based of, and they'll actually do this. And I know this sounds horrifically boring, and it probably is. But guys who do this for a living, they will measure to the millimeter the size of the letters in a given manuscript. Because they want to know when they have gaps, what will fit. And there are four words that could fit and make sense in context. Orgarete. Okay, you've got the reference to, you know, again, the cheek, the forehead. All of these have the same letter spacing. They will accommodate the gap. This is German here, a guy named Schenk. Schenk, I'll read it off, off the screen here. Aufmals auf ihre Mundi. There's a German scholar that suggests often on her mouth. And they say, well, we'll note that because this is a scholar guy who we respect. But you know what? There are four other words that would fit in there that all make sense in the ancient world. Because you kissed, when you greeted someone, you kissed them on the forehead, you kissed them on the cheek. You know, yeah, you can kiss them on the lips too. I mean, people still do that you know, in European, you know, Eastern cultures, and so on and so forth. So the idea that this is a done deal that this text says with certainty that Jesus is kissing Mary Magdalene on the mouth is just false. Okay? It might. I mean, who knows? We don't know. There's a gap there. In fact, there isn't a single text in all the ancient Gnostic material from Nag Hammadi that has Jesus and Mary Magdalene married. You say, how do you know that, Mike? Here's how I know. We have them in electronic form. And I searched them for you. Here we go. Here's a search for married. This search will find any word close to this spelling. Mary, married, marries. I put in the term. I clicked the search button. And here's what I got. This is the place where this term occurs in the Nag Hammadi collection. All the stuff known in the world now except the Gospel of Judas. And I brought that with me today too. And Jesus isn't married in that one either. So, you know, the editors haven't put it into the database yet. I guess we'll get there someday. You'll notice you don't have any Jesus married here. Let's try wife. How about wife? Well, we get a few here. I put my little hand icon here because this one kind of looks interesting. It has the phrase Mary in gaps. And by the way, when there's brackets, that means that's a blank too. It's a reconstruction. But we'll look it up anyway. Because we have the word Mary, the editors have put in there. And Mary, your wife. Well, I wonder who she's married to. Well, here's the verse. Right here in blue is the hit. Hasten, come with Mary, your wife, all your relatives, blah, 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 blah. This is the second apostle of James. And of course, if you read the few lines that precede, we're not talking about Jesus. How about bride? See, I'm, I'm trying to think of all the terms to search that have something to do with marriage, and I'm searching the entire database of the Gnostic Gospels to ask the question, is there any evidence at all, even in the Gnostic material, for Jesus being married to anybody? And the answer is no. So we search for wife, or bride, excuse me. Here we go. You know, here are the hits in context. Again, if, if you want to look them up, you can buy the print edition, whatever. I mean, here you have, you buy the DVDs, you got all the references there for you. How about husband? Well, we'll search for that one. Guess what? We come up empty there, too. 
You know, what a surprise, so on and so forth. Well, what about the word companion in the Gospel of Philip? The Da Vinci Code makes a big deal out of this, too. Pages 245 and 246. Flipping to the middle of the book, you know, the drama's building now. Teeming pointed to a passage. The Gospel of Philip is always a good place to start. You know, when we're talking about Jesus and Mary, Sophie read the passage. And the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. Jesus loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on the mouth. Of course, we know that's a gap now. The rest of the disciples were offended by it and expressed disapproval. And they said, why, don't you love, why do you love her more than all of us? The word surprise, Sophie. And yet they hardly seem conclusive. It says nothing of marriage, she says. All contraire, Teabing smiled, pointing to the first line. This, this is my favorite quote in the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> you probably know this line. <laughs> As any Aramaic scholar will tell you, the word companion in those days literally meant spouse. Landon concurred with a nod. I just, I love that quote because the word for companion in the Gospel of Philip would be in what language? Coptic. And it reflects a Greek original. It's not Aramaic. Like I said, that's my favorite quote in the Da Vinci Code because it's so stupid. As any Aramaic scholar will, it's not even the right language. Get the language right, Dan. I mean, come on. Okay, I feel better now. <laughs> Here's the word. In Coptic, it is koinonos. It's, it's, a, it's actually a, lo, a Greek loan word, so we know exactly what the word is. This is the rather thrilling entry. Don't you just love my graphics? It's a bunch of gobbledygook unless you've had Greek. This is the entry from... This is either, I uh, have the second one labeled, I think. Du, 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 du. Yeah. This one is Bauer, Arndt, Donker, and Gingrich. This is the primary Greek lexicon for New Testament and related literature in the world. It's expensive, but we have it in electronic. Did I, did I mention that before? <laughs> have a little fun with that. This is the entry for Koinonos. If you read through the entire entry, you will notice something, even if you can't read Greek. At no point, at no point, and you'll see the abbreviations. These are biblical books right here, Septuagint, if it's Old Testament, New Testament Greek. At no point does koinonos mean wife. Not just in the New Testament, but in other Greek literature too. It's not the word for wife. Now, I can call my wife my partner, my companion, but I can go into business with someone and call them my companion, my partner. Does that mean I'm having a sexual relationship with them? No. Like, use your head. I mean, when I, when I came to that passage in the Da Vinci Code, it just, it just about killed me. But I moved on. <laughs> Here's the rest of the entry. The entry was too big to fit on one screen. You know, it, a koinonos is a partner. It's one who participates in something you know, with someone else, a companion, a friend. Okay? It's not used for a sexual relationship. This is another Greek lexicon. This is the lexicon known as Lydell Scott. This is the primary Greek lexicon for non-New Testament Greek literature, classical literature, intertestamental literature, stuff like Josephus and whatnot. This is the big one. This is a mammoth resource. Um, that these two lexicons are the standard lexicons in the field of Greek studies in the world. Okay? And they're going to tell you where to look up you know, the, the abbreviations. If you do have an electronic, you can just ho hover your mouse over. It tells you where it is, where to go, all that kind of thing. Koinonos, the companion argument, is a non-argument. It is entirely fabricated. Was Jesus required to have a wife because he was a rabbi? This is another issue that comes up with the Jesus-Mary problem or issue. Jesus wasn't a rabbi in the sense of the Jewish religious office. Proof for this is self-evident in the Gospels. And again, I'm thinking, why doesn't Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln, and Picknett, and Prince just quote the New Testament? The Pharisees challenged what Jesus said several times by asking him this question. By what authority do you teach this? Why are you saying this? 
Look at, look at the verse. And he entered the temple. The chief priests and elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? If he was an ordained rabbi, that would be a dumb question because they would have had to approve his office. Okay? That would have been like, you know, mass deja vu, or not deja vu, but mass memory loss or something. John 7, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled and said, I love this one, how is it this man is learning since he never studied? He didn't even go to seminary. He's not a rabbi. Okay, you have to have formal training and you have to go through a, a, a procedure to have the rabbinical community approve you in that office. Jesus never did that. Okay, he never had that. He was not a rabbi. He is not required to be married. He is called rabbi in, in passages because the word also just means anybody who teaches. He's a teacher. We have the same thing now, like if, if we use the word instructor. Instructor can be someone who works in a daycare. If you're on a university campus, that's an official title. It usually means you don't have your PhD yet. You're a graduate student. If you, if you uh, are, a, are an instructor beyond your PhD, that is a non-tenure track specific designation. But it's the same word. It doesn't mean anything official inherently. It depends on the context. Same thing going on here. Is there anything theologically amiss with the idea that Jesus was married in principle? I would say no. It really wouldn't matter if he was, other than the fact that people would be coming up with these weird theories about his kids being like super holy or something or supermen. You know, and I think, I think honestly, that's probably one of the great reasons why he never was, because people would just come up with loony ideas about his kids if he ever had any. So in principle, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, this is from uh, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 9. Paul says, don't we have the right to eat and drink? Don't we have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Cephas is Peter. He says, hey, I could be married if I want to. Paul was single. He, Paul may have been divorced. Uh, he may have been deserted by a spouse, or he may have never been married. We just don't know. Uh, he, he refers to himself as unmarried and Unmarried just means the state of being without a spouse. So we, we don't know why he was unmarried. Uh, who knows? Traditions encouraging dedicated, a dedicated single life also existed elsewhere in Judaism. This one, this one is a kicker for me. Because often Bajent and Lincoln and Lee and all these people want to link Jesus with the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was the place where you had most, you know, 99% of the men refused to be married. Up until a few years ago, it was assumed that no Essene could be married and join the community. Since then, there have been skeletons discovered that are female and a few that are, that are children. So the assumption is that at least one of these people was married. Okay? But if you're going to put Jesus in the Essenes, why are you talking about him married, being married to Mary Magdalene? It's completely contradictory. But again, no, it, it's, it's like they don't care. They don't care about being consistent. They don't care about the primary data. Uh, the Essenes, again, were known for their emphasis on celibacy. And so that is not uncommon to have a teacher, a rabbi, a Jewish leader who wasn't married. There's no evidence that Jesus was. doesn't really matter, at least in my view. But that is the primary data. Again, to summarize, I'll just say it in one sentence. There isn't a single text, a single line in the New Testament or in the Gnostic material that has Jesus married to anybody, much less Mary Magdalene. It's a myth. Okay. Questions? Wouldn't you think that there's a great appeal for the readers to think that Mary Magdalene married Jesus? I think it gives... Um, uh, Define what you mean by appeal. Well. I'm trying to think of some people without saying this in a pejorative sort of way, but I know more than a few women who like the idea that Mary Magdalene achieved a sort of state of blessedness mm -hmm. through her union. She was redeemed, and, and uh, it gives some people a lot of um, credibility who otherwise might feel like they're second-rate followers of Jesus. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say, on the one hand, I understand how hanging 
on to that idea would, I don't want this to sound negative, but to convey the impression that that would give them a warm, fuzzy feeling, that that would just make them feel good. I understand that. What I don't understand is the flawed thinking that says, whether consciously or unconsciously, that, that I need that to be true, you know, to, to feel uh, essentially that I'm valued in the eyes of God. In other words, what I'm saying is, is if, if a woman today or even then needed to think that Mary Magdalene was married so that she could feel more worthy or worthy at all in God's eyes, that's really bad theology. And it's, and it's probably not her fault. It's probably the fault of whoever's supposed to be teaching her, probably her own household in those days. But that is really bad theology. Now we're going to see, though, I think it's the next session where we talk about women in Christianity, um, that it was common, just generally speaking, whether uh, in Jewish circles, early Christian circles, and surprise, surprise, Gnostic circles, to have a low view of women generally. Now, there's a lot going on in the New Testament, and we're going we're to look at this, in the content of the New Testament that actually elevates women well above the normal social situation, the normal social milieu of the New Testament era. Jesus does things, just one example, he has women followers that travel with him. That was just unheard of. There are things like that that are going on that with what Jesus is doing and what the, the New Testament writers are doing brings uh, the, the, the woman's social station up here. Now, it's not the 20th century. It's still a, a patriarchal culture. But to think that the New Testament puts women down at foot level, like the broader culture did, and even the broader culture, not everybody thought that way, but to think that that's what's going on in the New Testament, you're just not reading it. You're just not reading it. You're taking somebody's word for it. And you know, we'll, we'll get into that. that. I realize that in some sense, even in Christian circles, this is controversial because of the can women be ordained question, that, that kind of thing. But the fact that that's a question tells you that there's stuff going on in the New Testament that have women very highly placed. If that wasn't the case, we would not even have that debate. You follow what I'm saying? If women were not found in elevated social situations and ecclesiastical situations in the New Testament and the early church, there would be no reason to have a scriptural debate on whether women can be ordained. It would be dumb. It'd be like debating if, if Jesus was, a, was you, know, you know, some sort of beaver. Was Jesus a beaver or not? Well, let's go to the scriptures and debate that. You know, it's just, it's nonsense. I picked an absurd example because the fact that, that you're debating over, over the New Testament text, over passages, tells you that women, you know, there are some really interesting passages about a woman's position in the early church. And, and it, it caused consternation then and it causes consternation now. Another question. Yes. Guy. The passage from Philip you had up earlier, that's, uh, you kind of showed there's a hole in the text, whether it's your strong mouth or not. But the other statement in that sentence was that, um, why do you favor her so much above us? Yeah. Outside of that sentence or right there, is there anything else in the Gospel of Philip or not, or, or in the Gospel of Philip or the Gnostics? that actually show Jesus did favor her above the other disciples in any way? I would, I would tend to think, my, my own view is, is I tend to think that, that the, Jesus is definitely kissing her, okay, somewhere. Uh, it may have been on the mouth. If, if you put a gun to my head, I'd, I'd probably say it was either the mouth or the forehead or something like that. What you need to parse that passage is to understand what the significance of kissing was to a Gnostic. There are other passages in the Gospel of Philip where when not just Jesus, but Jesus or somebody else, but especially Jesus, but not only him, when he kisses someone, they become pregnant. Now, you either have to believe that in the Gnostic community, nobody knew where babies came from, or you have to believe that kissing and words like pregnant meant something mystical and spiritual to the Gnostics. And it did. What it meant was, again, you have, you have to put yourself in the mindset of this physical, 
sexual or, or semi-sexual content because the Gnostics used those terms, those physical bodily terms, to describe what they imagined going on or what went on eons ago with the aeons, that there was this coming together of Sophia and the Christos to unite the Pleroma, to make it whole again, to fix it, to make, make all things new, to, to make it the way it, it should be. To a Gnostic, when the earthly Jesus kissed someone, he was imparting to them, he, he was doing that because he viewed that person as spiritually enlightened, and he was transmitting the spirit to them. He was transmitting spiritual stuff. You know, like in, in Christian circles, we use words like grace. You know, you take communion or you do something and you, you receive the grace of God or something like that. It's the same idea in Gnosticism, but there was this idea of when you kissed someone, you were, especially when it was Jesus, you were saying this person is spiritually advanced. And so he's kissing Mary, and apparently more than once, wherever it was, mouth, you know, cheek, whatever. And the disciples are like, hey, what gives? I mean, we're the 12. Why are you kissing her more often than us? We're the ones that travel with. I mean, you're, we're the ones that you called. I mean, we're the disciples. Did you forget about us? So they're offended because Jesus is essentially saying Mary's just more advanced spiritually than you guys are. To a Gnostic. I mean, that, that, that's how the Gnostics look at that. So again, that's either, again, you, you can read the Gnostic Gospels and, and you know, look up references to kissing and, and whatnot, and you, you'll see those passages. So you either have to believe that that's what's going on or that nobody in the Gnostic circles knew where babies came from, which is really dumb. I don't think any of us are going to say that, yes. Since you already covered how much later the Gnostic Gospels came or were written than the New Testament, do you even consider that account um, feasible that he did kiss her or that he did whatever? I would, I, I would, I would say I, I think it's feasible in that Paul, you know, uses the same terminology: greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, and and when we're going to get to Romans 16, which is a really important passage about the role of women, the elevation of women in the early church. Uh, and you have the same language there, so it, it, it could apply to male or female. And if, if Paul's doing it, and it's an accepted Jewish custom, I don't see why, why Jesus would have shuddered at the thought. I, th I think it just would have been the thing to do. You know, it's just a normal cultural thing. It, it, it might have meant something more coming from Jesus because it's Jesus. Jesus approves of me, makes me feel good or something, um, recognizes me as one of his disciples. You know, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. So I don't, I don't see any reason why Jesus would not have done that. Another question? Okay. Oh, yes. Um, some researchers would equate um, the word companion with consort. I think there's some studies of that. Do you see any connection at all between uh, defining that word companion? Is that quite a stretch to well, jump to Yeah, the reason it's done is, is usually based upon English usage, which right there, there's a, there's a methodological flaw there. But, okay, my, my wife was here, and, and she's left, but if she was here, I mean, we could, I, you know, I guess I feel better that she's not here. <laughs> but, I mean, my wife is my companion. That's, that's sort of a, of a base-level designation. Uh, it, it, it has semantic variability, what we'd call valency in linguistics, okay? She's my companion. Is she also my consort, okay, in, in sexual terms? Well, yeah, because she's my wife. But I can use the base level word companion of other people, and there is no necessary linkage in meaning. You know, it, it's just simple vocabulary. You know, we use words... In, in varied ways. And what you have to ask yourself as a reader is when I read this in the Da Vinci Code or whatever the source is, is there a necessary cause and effect relationship? This meaning causes that one. Just ask yourself simple logic questions. You know, how do, how do I frame the issue so that it, it becomes coherent? And I think, you know, if we do that, we start seeing things like I call lots of people companions, but they're not necessarily my consort. They might be in a given context. And if it's in Jesus, I would say the same thing with Jesus and Mary. Okay, Mary was the companion of Jesus. 
we could say, well, then she might have been involved sexually with him. Yes, she might have. Are there texts that say that? The answer is no. So if you're going to say something either publicly or in writing and you care about the, the primary texts that tell us about these people, then I would think the responsible thing to do is go look at them and say what they say and don't say what they don't say. But you know, again, I, I'm not blaming Brown for this because it's a good storyline. That's where it started with Dan Brown. I have no doubt that this, is, this would make a cool novel. You know, good storyline, good plot line. The people that I you know, object to more are his sources who are purveying this stuff as though it is just unassailable truth and we are the real researchers in these texts and this information has been hidden from the public. Bunk. Okay, if anybody's hiding anything, you are. Either by default because you're not looking it up or if you did look it up and saw it and it didn't fit with your theory, you're not telling people. Okay. I don't know which it is. I don't, I don't worry about questions like that. I'm just saying, if you're going to say something about figure A, figure B, and you're going to use this text or that text, read the thing and be honest. That's all I care about. That's what drives me when I do stuff like this. Next, any other questions? We can take a little break. Okay, let's take a few minutes. Our fourth session is titled as follows. Enlightened Gnostics and Misogynistic Christians? Question mark. The New Testament attitude toward women. I've made the comment before that much is made in the Da Vinci Code of the, you know, frankly correct, or at least real, abuse and uh, negative attitude toward women that you can find in Judaism, uh, in Christianity, you know, the early church, the wider culture into which the uh, the, the New Testament church was founded, the biblical milieu, as we'll call it. Uh, there, there was a prevailing attitude, and much is made of this prevailing attitude to say, to prop up the idea that Judeo-Christian worldview, and hence, of course, Judeo-Christian Bible, bad, Gnostic Gospels, good, okay, because of this allegedly elevated view of women that the Gnostic communities Gnostic sect of Christianity had. And that's what I want to focus on uh, today as far as this session, because again, I think what's going on here is a lack of information and also a little bit of overstatement. I will telegraph this one other way by saying, even if you're a Christian here in the room, there is going to be disagreement on certain issues um, you know, within the Christian church, the Orthodox, what we, what we would call Orthodoxy. This is one of them as far as the role of women in the church. Uh, I'm not going to specifically uh, address that in the session. I will bring up passages that are central to the discussion. And if you want to ask me uh, after, you know, the, during the question and answer period and have that on, on tape, that's fine. You can ask me anything you want and I'll tell you what I think. I'm just not zeroing in. This isn't going to be necessarily a theology class, although it'll sound like it at, at some certain points. Now, Women in the social cultural context of the first century AD, the general attitude, I'm going to have a few quotations here from primary sources again, that if you're a woman, this isn't going to make you feel real good. <laughs> but this is the prevailing attitude into which Jesus you know, was born and, and had his ministry. Uh, quotation from Josephus, but then what are our laws about marriage? This is a discourse on marriage. The law owns no other mixture of sexes but that which nature hath appointed of a man and his wife, and so on and so forth. He says that this may be used only for the procreation of children. So this idea that you, know, you should engage in sexual intercourse only if your intent is to have a child. Again, Josephus was a uh, you know, Jewish personality of the time. And he has in the last line, this, this is kind of an amazing quote to me. This is a Jew, and it, it, it tells me that Boy, you didn't really know that much about your Bible, but, you know, I, I just don't know where you're coming from here, Josephus. But he says, the scripture says, thus says the scripture, for says the scripture, a woman is inferior to her husband in all things. Now, the, the kicker there is, says the scripture. 
if you actually tried to find this quotation in the Bible, guess what? Good luck with that. Because <laughs> it's not actually in there. Uh, says the scripture, again, to a Jew like Josephus, he's not a theologian, he's not a biblical scholar. You have to realize, too, that oral tradition in Judaism, you know, the oral law, the, 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 you know, what we would become known as the Talmud, the Mishnah, and all this, that was set at the same level as scripture. And so what he's really doing is he's quoting a prevailing opinion in extra biblical literature. But he says, he uses this phrase, says the scripture. But again, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe me, just you know, get a Bible, get a concordance, and look it up. You're, just, you're not going to find it because it's not there. Philo, another first century Jewish writer, says, again, this is astonishing to me. I'm thinking, go look it up, friend. And I like, I like Philo for other, other reasons, but this is just bizarre what he says here. After this, he says that God formed man by taking clay from the earth and he breathed into his face the breath of life. By this also he shows very clearly that there's a vast difference between the man now formed and the man that came into existence earlier after the image of God. For the man now formed is an object of sense perception and partakes already of quality, consists of body and soul as man or woman and by nature mortal. But the man who came into existence after the image of God is what one might call an idea or a genus or a seal, object of thought. Neither male nor female by nature incorruptible. And if you look at the bottom part of the quotation, this is also from Philo, same source. The woman who has no part in the noose, that is the mind. Okay, if you look over here, this soul principle is called the noose. What he's saying here is after the image of God. He's saying the woman who has no part in the noose, is not fashioned in the image of God. It's astonishing because it's exactly the opposite of what Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says. It says, let us create humankind in our image, so on and so forth. It says, male and female, he created them in his image. I don't know where Philo is getting this, other than, again, oral tradition, because Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says exactly the opposite, but this reflects a prevailing attitude among, you know, in educated Jewish circles at this time. Philo, again, says, The woman was more accustomed to be deceived than the man. Of course, talking about the fall, uh, you know, blaming you know, Eve's, the, the fact that she was deceived in the account. And, you know, we know that the Old Testament says that. It doesn't say that, that the woman was somehow kind of dumber. Uh, but again, this reflects a prevailing not a biblical opinion, but the opinion of people you know, who were educated and uh, who were Jews at the time. Philo again, wives must be slaves to their husbands, a servitude not imposed by violent ill treatment, but promoting obedience in all things. He's just saying this is the way it should be. I mean, I'm not advocating that men be brutal to their wives, but this is just the way it should be. Again, so this is a, a prevailing Jewish attitude. Other general attitudes... Uh, you have the sources there from the Talmud, another one from Josephus. It is better that the words of the law, the, the Torah, should be burned than that they should be given to a woman. I mean, come on. That's just, that's just unbelievable. He that talks much with women brings evil upon himself, neglects the study of the Torah, and at last will inherit Gehenna. Now, this one is really significant because... One of the things Jesus does most often in the Gospels is talk to women. I mean, so it, it is, Jesus' behavior is completely contrary to this passage in the Talmud. Again, it reflects a later Jewish opinion, but it's just unbelievable this, that it's evil to do this. And you're, basically, you're going to go to hell if you do too much of this. You know. Josephus, again, women are, were not allowed to testify in a court of law. Josephus makes this comment. The rabbis taught, quote, this is the governing principle. Any evidence which a, woman, uh, which, uh, which a woman is not valid to offer testimony, also they are not valid to offer testimony. You could not call a woman to be any kind of you know, material witness or any kind of witness to any issue that had to be brought before the, the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin, because women just, they're not trustworthy. They're not good witnesses. They're not fill in the blank. I mean, this, again, this is the, the prevailing attitude. Simon Peter said to him, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male. 
so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Does this sound negative toward women? Everybody's going, yeah. Guess where this comes from? Are you ready for this Dan Brown? Are you ready for this Michael Bajant? Picnic Prince, the whole bunch. That's from the Gospel of Thomas. Oops. Dan Brown didn't tell us about that one. If you want a misogynistic statement, that's my candidate. And it's from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. Now I'm prepping you with this because one thing I want you to, uh, I want you to go away with from this session is the fact that the idea that Gnosticism elevates women and these Christians over here are basically Neanderthals is just a myth. It is another myth. Now, we move on here. There are exceptions in the wider culture. We're not, we're not at the New Testament yet. There were exceptions to the attitude toward women that you do see here and there in, in different texts. There is evidence that some women held the office of a ruler or a president of a synagogue. There's one, a woman called Ber Beruria, second century rabbi. So you know, she's a, a fact of history. The non-canonical book, The Testament of Job. Uh, Job's three daughters speak the, the language of angels. They were prophets or prophetesses. You get that. There were infrequent exceptions until you get to the time of Jesus and the apostles. when those Neanderthal Christians came along and they did all sorts of things that were against the prevailing attitude. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that the New Testament was just like it is today. It wasn't. But I will tell you this, it was a whole lot better than the wider culture. And Jesus did some things that were just utterly would have, well, like, like the quote I gave you from the Talmud, they would have said, Jesus, you're just going to hell because you spend time talking to women and teaching them the law. Jesus did all sorts of things that were contrary to the cultural expectation. What is the New Testament attitude toward women? And what did Jesus' actions tell us? Again, lots and lots of differences. Here's one. This is Matthew 19. This is a famous passage on divorce. At the time, if you look at the actual narrative, the, the Pharisees in verse 3 come up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now the question is important because there was a very popular rabbi at the time, Hillel and his followers, that they said you could essentially divorce your wife for anything that didn't make you happy. They, there, there's really only one major passage in the Old Testament that talks about divorce, and that's Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. And it says, a man can put away his wife for uncleanness. And there's a big debate over what uncleanness means. Hillel said it's basically anything you don't like. She burns a toast, give her a bill of divorcement. You know, she doesn't give you the newspaper when you come home, tell her to take a hike. Say that, so they ask Jesus and they say, they want to know what he thinks. Do you think this is right? Do you divorce your wife for anything you want? He answered, haven't you read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to wife and they shall become one flesh? So they're no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, why did Moses then say divorce was okay? You know, you could send her away. He said, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it wasn't so. Basically, Moses faced reality and allowed it because of you. Because of people like you. Not because of God. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, the point being that Jesus does give permission. He, you know, he doesn't man necessarily mandate it, but if your spouse is sexually unfaithful, he doesn't condemn the woman to living with that situation. But it's a pretty narrow list. It's not like she burned the toast, you know, kiss her goodbye. So he takes a, a, an unpopular view there, and the disciples say, oh boy, you know, well, better not to get married. Man, it's tough to get out of marriage, according to Jesus. Yeah. Jesus re had, had respect you know, toward a woman's situation in that instance. This is a classic passage. Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4. 
This is directly against that Talmudic statement I gave you earlier. Verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus was at a well. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The Jews and Samaritans did not get along. There was a racial problem there, interracial problem. Plus, she, she was a woman. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that it's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And they get into this, this conversation. And you'll notice when it's over, if you go down to verse 27 at the bottom, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. Holy cow, what's he doing now? <laughs> we never know what to expect, do we? But no one said, what do you see, girl? What are you doing? Why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Maybe this is the Messiah. You know, and she was, you know, frankly speaking, pretty immoral. Jesus sat down, talked with her, told her who he was. In fact, this is the first person in the New Testament that Jesus tells who he is. He picks a woman and he picks a Samaritan. I mean, that is going to raise eyebrows. She's the first one. You go to Luke 13. Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself, and when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on, come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath. And Jesus answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath day untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? Ought not this woman, here's an important phrase, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Daughter of Abraham is a significant term. It signifies that she is spiritually worthy. She's a believer. Jesus, in essence, doesn't say things like, you have to become a man to enter the kingdom of God. You have to become a man to go to heaven. You've got to be male, like the Gospel of Thomas does. He says, God had me do this because you're one of his. Go down to Galatians 3, you have the phrase, we are all, for in Christ, verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor free, it doesn't matter who you are, male or female, you are all one in Christ. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring. Jesus does not make maleness a condition for being spiritually enlightened or a member of the believing community. You don't need to become male to go to heaven. Matthew 12, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied again, Jesus speaking to the man who told him, who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus publicly identifies himself with women as his disciples. All four Gospels attest the fact that a group of women followed Jesus in Galilee and to Jerusalem. The verb used to designate these followers is akalutheo in Greek, a term which occurs over 75 times in the Gospels and normally means following Jesus in the sense of being a disciple. The Greek noun for disciple is mathetes. A feminine form occurs in Acts 9.36 where Dorcas, also known as Tabitha, is called a disciple. Here's the quote. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, a mathetes, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. The New Testament doesn't have any qualm with using words like disciple of women. Apparently the Gospel of Thomas did. 
unless you were male. Then you can be a follower of Jesus. Acts chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is kind of interesting here. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Remember, after the, the resurrection and the ascension, Jesus says, you know, well, they're, they're directed to go gather in this upper room and, and wait for the coming of the Spirit. And so his disciples do that. And if you look at, at the wording here, suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you go down to verse, let's see here, verse 14, it happens, they're astonished. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. By the way, notice that even in the larger group of disciples, there's still this, the inner group, the eleven. The, 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 Judas isn't there because he's gone out and hanged himself by this time. But you've got the apostles and then you've got the rest. Standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men will see dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants. There's no distinction. There's neither bond nor free, male or female, Jew or non-Jew, Jew or Gentile. Didn't matter. Women played important roles in eyewitness testimony to the resurrection and the gospel. Again, all four have the female disciples of Jesus as the first ones to receive the angelic account of Jesus' resurrection. The first one is Mary Magdalene, and she is commissioned by Jesus to tell the male disciples what she's seen. Now, didn't we just read in Josephus that what? Women could not be witnesses legally. They were viewed as inferior. Who gets picked to be the first witnesses of the resurrection to the men? It's the women. If that isn't contrary to reader expectations, I frankly don't know what is. They're going to look at that and they're going to go, he appeared to women. Like we're supposed to believe women. I mean, come on. And and the disciples, you know, contrarily enough, do believe them. Except for Thomas. He's a little stubborn. Maybe he had a problem. (laughs) You know, who knows? This is a quote from Dorothy Sayers that I just kind of liked, a famous uh, uh, literary author, uh, lots of literary fiction and nonfiction. They, the women, had never known a man like this man. There never has been such another, a prophet and teacher who never nagged at them, never flattered or coaxed or patronized, who took their questions and their arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no axe to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend, who took them as he found them and was completely unself-conscious. This is the portrait of Jesus in the New Testament. We've already seen the portrait of Jesus in the New Testament, or Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas. Hey, you're okay if you become male. Cool. What about Paul? Paul takes a lot of heat from, again, these popular writers because he says this, In 1 Timothy 2, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now, there's an incongruity here. While Eve was deceived, and of course she is the first sinner, it's a matter of chronology, Adam was not deceived. Adam sinned willingly. He was informed and still did it. Which is why when Adam, or excuse me, when Paul blames the course of sin, blames the fall on one person and the effects of the fall on all humanity, he does not blame Eve. Who does he blame? 
Adam all over the place in Romans 5. I have these highlighted for you. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, the transgression of Adam, who was the type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass. I mean, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It is very clear. The same guy who says this blames men for the fall. There's an incongruity here. We'll, we'll get a little bit to this, this Pauline stuff. My own opinion is that this statement here was conditioned by a specific set of circumstances. Because if this applies to everything across the board, and in verse 14, if we assume that Paul's point is that Eve gets the blame, then Romans 5 doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Then Paul is basically schizophrenic. Adam gets the blame because he sinned with knowledge. He had the greater responsibility. This is again Galatians 3 again and 1 Corinthians 7. My point in Galatians 3 is this phrase right here. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ. Let's talk about 1 Corinthians 7. Whereas Philo said, you should only have sexual relations to procreate. What does Paul say? What does the misogynistic evil Paul say? How does he contribute to the suppression of women's sexuality? Well, he says this in 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the matters about which she wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Literally, it says it's good for a man not to touch a woman, but in the context, probably that's what he's talking about. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the, hus her own body, but the husband does. And like, he doesn't stop there. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so Satan doesn't tempt you for your lack of self-control. Okay, this is Paul. Where in this passage do you read that you should only have sexual relations if your intent is to have children? Paul's saying you should have sexual relations because you're going to want to. And husband, wife, you should give that to your respective spouse at their pleasure because they should have control over your body. You should, you know... You, and you're, you know, vice versa. I mean, you, you, each spouse is supposed to be able to, you know, have the say over the other person's, you know, self, over their other person's body, so that there's mutual pleasure and satisfaction for the specific purpose of avoiding immorality. Paul is hardly a prude in this passage, or a misogynist, I would say, especially when you compare him to guys like Philo. Okay, who were very influential writers of his time. Now here is we get, we get into some controversial stuff. Notice here, these are the qualifications for ESV has overseers. Other translations will have bishops. The word is episkopos in Greek. These are the qualifications for who the church leaders are. It says here, the husband of one wife. Deacons, likewise, this is overseer, this is deacon. Deacons, likewise, should be the husband of one wife. Mentions their wives. So we're talking about, it looks like men should be the overseers and men should be the deacons. But there's a problem. These are the Greek words highlighted in corresponding colors. We have Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sencrea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a worthy way of the saints, so on and so forth. Again, this is Paul writing, the evil, nasty Paul. The word for servant is the word diakonon, the same word right here. The directions, one would argue or could argue, are not just aimed at men because they mention wives and the husband of one wife, because lo and behold, you get at least one female diakonon 
in the New Testament. Priscilla, or Prissa in her abbreviated, uh, abbreviated form of the name, the female expositor, we'll call her that, or the teacher. You can't very well do exposition without teaching. So remember, the same Paul who wrote 1 Timothy 2, I suffer not a woman to teach, is the same Paul who runs into these two people, Priscilla. And we're going to introduce her here because Paul's going to say something about her in a little bit that will seem quite contrary to 1 Timothy 2. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth and found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because so on and so forth. Notice that the order here is Aquila and then Priscilla. The male's name is first. I mention that because every other time the two appear together, Priscilla is first. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him, they, not just him, they took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Explained is this word in Greek, exathenta, and that is the same word that shows up in this interesting passage. This is Paul in Rome. This is the end of the book of Acts. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging. Him is Paul in this narrative. This is the life of Paul. They came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he, that is Paul, expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets. Paul's preaching and he's teaching. This word expounded is the same word, different form. One is an aorist, one is imperfect if you've had Greek. Same root term as what Priscilla does. This is quite contrary to what Jews like Philo and Josephus and later in the Talmud want to see and hear. In fact, Priscilla is sort of commemorated in art. This is the Fractio Panis. The breaking of the bread in the Greek chapel of the catacomb of St. Priscilla. And she was a major figure in church history. This one you probably know less about. Romans 16, 17, 16, 7, Junia, the woman apostle. Now, there's a big debate, as you can imagine, over this passage. I'm going to try to walk you through a little of it. Here's what the verse says. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. This is Paul writing. Same guy that said, I suffer not a woman to teach. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, or the phrase could be translated, they are well known among the apostles. And they were in Christ before me. They were believers before I was. The word Junia, right here, look carefully at those two words. What is different about them? The little accent marks. One, the one on the top, is feminine. The other one is masculine. In the original Greek New Testament, the manuscripts, the papyri, they did not use accents. They were added later. That means that Junia here could very well be a woman who was known among the apostles. Andronicus would be her husband. They appear in a natural pair. Here is the entry in a book called Metzger's Textual Commentary of the Greek New Testament. Metzger explains you know, significant textual issues and variants in his book. And he says here, on the basis of the weight of manuscript evidence, the committee, the ones who assembled that particular edition of the Greek New Testament, was unanimous in rejecting Yulian as a reading for Union, right here. So, some manuscripts have Julia, and they say, oh, that wasn't it, because they probably get that from later in verse 17. But it was divided as to how the latter should be accented. Some members, considering it likely or unlikely that a woman would be among those styled apostles, understood the name to be masculine, Junian, Junius, thought to be a shortened form of Junianus. 
Others, however, were impressed by the facts, and get this. The female Latin name Junia occurs more than 250 times in Greek and Latin inscriptions found in Rome alone, whereas the male name Junius is unattested. There are zero attestations of the male form of the name. That argues quite strongly that this is a woman. 250 to zero, okay? <laughs> It's not close, all right? Now you ask, well, what does that mean? Let's go back here. Among the apostles or to the apostles? Here's the, here's the issue. It's really clear that this is a woman from all the external evidence. Do we understand, though, that Junia was well known to the apostles? Like, those guys over there, they knew about her. They thought she was cool. Or does it mean that she was well-known among them. Now, without getting too technical, the weight of evidence is on this view. If you're going to use external sources to the New Testament, this is probably a person known among the apostles. Does that mean that Junia was an apostle, that we had female apostles? The answer to that question is, it might. And here's why I hesitate and why my qualification. Because... Go back to the upper room. Apostle just means sent one. In the New Testament, you have the 12 called apostles. That's pretty obvious. They're the, the 12 that were called. You also have people after the resurrection called apostles who were not in the 12. So there are other apostles besides the 12. That doesn't mean that these guys or girls were members of the 12. I mean, that's logical because there's only 12 of them and they're going to die and they get old and stuff like that. So the real question is, what does it mean to be an apostle? This is probably a woman who is an apostle, but the real question is, what does that mean? Does that mean something as simple as a church commissioned her and her husband or maybe just her and sent her out? Apostle means sent one. Sent her out to do the work of God. Or does it mean that there was some idea of apostolic succession now, if you're a Catholic, apostolic succession is transmitted through Peter in your, in your tradition. It, it's a male succession, and it comes from Matthew 16. I think it's 16, or Matthew 18. One of those two. I'm drawing a blank on that now, where, Peter, where he says to Peter, Thou art a rock, you know, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, so on and so forth. So it really doesn't answer the question because even if you believe in apostolic succession, you want to go to Peter and then, you know, as it's transmitted in, in church history as far as the Bishop of Rome. It doesn't really answer the question whether women were at the level of the 12. That's possible. And I'll guarantee you this, you're not going to find that in the Gnostic Gospels. You will not find anything near that level of authority. What it, it, what it has to mean in the least is that you had women sent out to preach. Now that might be different than ordaining an office, but at the very least, why would you send one out? Go out and be quiet. Go out and don't say anything. Like, well, what am I supposed to do then? Okay. Again, I realize it's controversial, but the point of the session today is basically that it is a myth when it comes to the apostleship. Now, how much time do we have yet in this one? A few minutes. I hold here a book called, this is a scholarly dissertation that was published. I will give you the date because, again, I'm doing this for people who are going to be viewing the DVDs. I ain't making it up. It's real. It's a book. Okay? It's Edward Mellon Press, 1995 by Daniel Hoffman. And the title of this book is the status of women and Gnosticism in Irenaeus and Tertullian. Irenaeus and Tertullian were two church fathers who talked a lot about Gnosticism. I'm going to read to you from the preface, actually the foreword of this book. The guy who wrote the foreword is a guy named Craig Evans. You're going to meet Mr. Evans, Dr. Evans, in another couple sessions. 
Dr. Evans, who I met a year ago, and we, I can say he's a friend of mine now. This is the guy that I was able to get on Coast to Coast AM to talk about the Gospel of Judas because Dr. Evans is an authority on Gnosticism. He was a member of the secret National Geographic team that put together the Gospel of Judas. I didn't know that until about two weeks ago. When I found out, got a hold of him and said, hey, now that I know you're on this team, would you like to go on this show so that you can inject a little sanity into this subject? And he said, fine, got him on, it was a great show. But here's what Evans writes about this book. The timely appearance of Dr. Hoffman's study will be welcomed by all scholars who are committed to the interpretation of ancient texts in their context as opposed to ours. I recognize, of course, that the question of the, what relevance ancient texts have for us moderns is a perfectly legitimate one and one that often drives historical inquiry in the first place. But with the onslaught of our, in our times of deconstructionism on the one hand and politically correct agendas on the other, the message of ancient texts is often drowned out by the clamor of popular and faddish theories competing for the ear of the modern public. I move down a little bit. Swimming against the politically correct stream, Dr. Hoffman demonstrates, get this, that Gnosticism did not hold to views of women that were higher than those held by mainstream Christianity. He has shown that the heresiologists, Tertullian and Irenaeus, recognized and praised the personal qualities and ecclesial contributions of Christian women. And more importantly, Hoffman has shown that the conclusion articulated by Elaine Pagels, whose name you hear everywhere associated with the, with the Da Vinci Code, the conclusion articulated by Elaine Pagels and others that Gnosticism's supposed high view of women correlated with the role of the feminine in their cosmogenies and cosmologies is unfounded. Hoffman further shows convincingly that the thesis that Gnosticism's understanding of the feminine led it to hold to a higher status and to permit a more prominent function for women is unsupported by the ancient texts when considered in full context. In essence, virtually every facet of Pagel's presentation is called into question. Now that's one academic writing to another, and that's pulling no punches. Basically he's saying, this guy's book kicks her butt. Okay, that's what he's saying. I want to read you a few excerpts from the Gnostic Gospels. We already saw Thomas, where you have to become male to enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's try a couple more, and then we'll be done with this session. In our first session, we talked about the Gnostic worldview, where the Demiurg and his pals, the Archons, create Adam. And then Sophia puts a little spark of her divinity into Adam. And I made the comment earlier that that's nice for Adam. He gets to say the spark of divinity is within me. But Eve is taken from Adam and he, she gets no spark. She is put on a lesser level spiritually in the Gnostic texts than Adam. She is subordinated to him. We have, uh, let's see here. In the creation of Eve, there was no power or light transferred from the higher realm. And here's the passage that the author quotes. Key passage in, uh, let me get the source here, the Apocryphon of John, ch uh, chapter 22, uh, verse 28, beginning there. Then the epinoia of the light hid herself in Adam, and the chief archon wanted to bring her out of his rib, like, you know, get out of there. But the epinoia of the light cannot be grasped. Although darkness pursued her, it did not catch her, and he became part of his power or out of him. And he made another creature in the form of a woman, according to the likeness of the epinoia. Epinoia is another one for the first thought. Remember we talked about that in the, in the first session, the, the, the divine feminine in Gnosticism. So we're going to create Eve to be like her. And he brought the part which he had taken from the part of the man into the female creature, uh, and not as Moses said, in his rib bone. And then it's over. The point is, she doesn't get the spark. If you go over, here's another one. In verse 36. Attitudes towards sex, sexuality. And Dan Brown hits on this all the time about how the Gnostics were just so more enlightened when it came to, to sexuality. The origin of all sexual desire, according to Gnostics, comes from Eve. She's the reason why men lust. It's her fault. Now, here's the passage, Apocryphon of John again. Now, up to the present day, sexual intercourse continued due to the chief archon. 
And he planted sexual desire in her, Eve, who belongs to Adam. And he produced through intercourse the copies of the bodies, and he inspired them with his counterfeit spirit. So women is the transmitter of the counterfeit spirit, the bad lust. This is completely, this is 180 degrees removed from where Dan Brown is in the Da Vinci Code. If you've read the book, you know that by now. 180 degrees. Another selection here. I think I'll read one more to you. The Gospel of Philip. This is a, this is a selection from the writer. I'm not quoting a passage. As noted by Pagels, the Gospel of Philip refers frequently to a feminine Holy Spirit. However, these references do not have clear positive implications for women since the role of the Holy Spirit is ambiguous in this book in a manner reminiscent of the role of Sophia in other Gnostic texts. The Holy Spirit, quote-unquote, has a double name according to the author of the Gospel of Philip. And this apparently meant that this being had both a higher pleromatic self, the pleroma, and a lower worldly self. Worldly features in contrast to the features of the Father and Son whose names are single names. An example of the lower negative character of the Holy Spirit, get this, is in the Gospel of Philip, chapter 59. It's the same Gospel with Jesus kissing Mary. Same Gospel. The Holy Spirit is said to blind the saints into pursuing evil ways. And the Holy Spirit is Sophia, who is the divine feminine. I realize this is kind of throwing a lot of stuff at you. Okay? But if you think that what Dan Brown and his sources are telling you about the elevation of the divine feminine is like up, it's way up here and virtuous and wonderful in Gnosticism. And then again, you have the Neanderthal Christians over here who are doing things like appointing them deacons you know, and, and letting them, them speak in churches. You know, get a clue. You know, I just have to say that to, to, to Bajan because I just think, again, my problem isn't with Brown, it's with these people who just have an agenda and are not giving you the texts. You should insist as a reader to get the primary material and go look it up. You should insist that they tell you where to go for the research rather than just saying something and leaving you hanging. Those who go astray are the ones that the Spirit begets. That you go astray because of the Spirit. It's the Gnostic Gospels. Again, I'm not quoting anything from a Roman Catholic source that was part of the greater conspiracy. Okay, I'm not quoting something from a fundamentalist Christian. I'm quoting something from a guy's dissertation on the role of women in Gnosticism, who, which, by the way, is approved by one of the guys on the team who put together the Gospel of Judas, an expert on Gnosticism. Okay. By way of summary, again, go and insist. Insist in these writers, the ones who are proclaiming what they're giving you as research, as the truth. You should insist from them, I want to know where you got that. You give me chapter and verse in the Gnostic text, and I will go look it up. Because if you do, if they're brave enough to do that, you're going to find a quite different story than what you're getting. Questions? Yes. This, the first woman that, the Samaritan woman at the well, what was the book from? John chapter 4. Gospel of John chapter 4. Yeah. Yeah, this, this, was the first, this was the first person that Jesus lets know who he is. She goes back to town and says, boy, guess who I met today? <laughs> you know, and the, and the whole town, the, 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 the amazing thing is, is that, again, these are Samaritans. So the, the, the Samaritans are essentially half-breeds. They were viewed Im, as impure by Jews. If you, if, you, if you know a little bit of Old Testament history, what happened was, the, the nation of Israel was 12 tribes, and at one point, the kingdom split. They had a civil war, 10 in the north, 2 in the south. The northern uh, kingdom of the 10 tribes was eventually conquered and carried away by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. What the Assyrians did to people was they would take one population and move it out, and then they would take other people from some other area uh, in, their, in their empire and move them in. 
And so just things being what they are, you had Jewish people who were left behind who transgressed the Torah. You weren't supposed to marry Gentiles. And you know, they, they married Gentiles, they married you know, who was there, and they started having you know, mixed children, mixed marriages. And since the region of the ten tribes, their capital was Samaria, they became known as Samaritans. Uh, it was a pejorative term. It, it's not always the same in the Bible. A Samaritan isn't always pointing to that situation. But the Samaritans were not popular. In fact, Jesus in, in, that, in that chapter, so he's going uh, to his destination, and he says, I must needs go through Samaria. I need to go through Samaria. And the disciples are like, why? Because the usual road was you went from Galilee and you hit Samaritan territory, and then you went around. <laughs> you just avoided the whole place. And then you went down and you came back over to Jerusalem. And he says, I need to go through it. Because he knows he's going to meet this woman. And she's the, f the first one he picks. Another question. Okay, for our fifth session, the topic is neither Lord nor Christ, the belief in Jesus as God before Nicaea, and the exalted Christ of Gnosticism. Uh, if that title is a little bit unexpected, <clears throat> I do want it to draw your attention because part of this uh, session is going to deal with the Gnostic view of Jesus. Now, in the Da Vinci Code, uh, Dan Brown has his characters, and again, this is typical of his sources, tell us that Jesus in the wonderful, unaltered, more ancient, you know, add, add to the adjective list as you want, Gnostic texts, that Jesus was just an ordinary man, just an ordinary guy. Uh, this whole idea of Jesus being a divine being was invented by the Council of Nicaea, specifically at the behest of Constantine for political purposes and, and whatnot, some variation of these themes. And Gnosticism itself, I'm, I'm going to show you a few texts again right out of the Gnostic Gospels. Gnosticism itself has a very exalted view of Christ. Jesus, uh, the Jesus of Nazareth to a Gnostic was not just an ordinary guy. Uh, their, their idea was not the same as those who would have penned the Nicene Creed. It's not the same uh, position, I think, correctly uh, that was arrived at before Nicaea that became the majority opinion in the early church very, very quickly that Jesus was God in the flesh. It, it's not that, but the Gnostic view of Jesus is nevertheless still that uh, Jesus is a very exalted being who is more than a man. And for those of you who have just read the Da Vinci Code only, or again, the sources that Brown uses, that might strike you as quite a surprise. And if it does, that's, that's a good thing, because again, you'll see that there's more than meets the eye than what Dan Brown is telling you. <clears throat> now, these are again some quotes, a passage from the Da Vinci Code, where our hero, <laughs> at least one of the major characters of the novel, uh, Sir Teabing, says, many aspects of Christianity were debated and voted upon. The date of Easter, the role of the bishops, the administration of sacraments, and of course the divinity of Jesus. And then Sophie, the female character, says, I don't follow his divinity. My dear Teabing declared, until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal not the Son of God, she asks. Right, Teabing said, Jesus' establishment as the Son of God was officially proposed, you know, as though it had never existed to that point, officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. Hold on, you're saying Jesus' divinity was the result of a vote? A relatively close vote at that, Teabing added. Nonetheless, establishing Christ's divinity was critical to the further unification of the Roman Empire into the new Vatican power base. By officially endorsing Jesus as the Son of God, Constantine turned Jesus into a deity who existed beyond the scope of the human world, an entity whose power was unchallengeable. So very clearly, Brown has this notion, and again, he's just drawing on sources, 
that the idea that Jesus was a divine being, was more than a, just an ordinary man, was proposed at the Council of Nicaea, voted on there, and he says as, by a very close vote, uh, we're going to find out that that is, that is just absolutely untrue in our next session about Council of Nicaea specifically. Because we know how many, roughly, people were there. We know how many people voted. And we know who voted what way. But I'll save that for the sixth session. In this session, I want to focus on these other claims about the idea of Jesus being a divine being invented at Nicaea, uh, which I will say very plainly is patently false. This, as it turns out providentially, um, draws upon my own dissertation. My, my specialty, as it were, uh, academically is, oh, excuse me, my specialty in terms of academics, this guy here, my specialty is divine beings, uh, the whole issue of polytheism, monotheism, that sort of thing in, uh, in the Bible, specifically the Hebrew Bible. And my dissertation was on the idea of binitarianism, two, a, a godhead of two beings in Judaism, which of course naturally predates Christianity. And I didn't know at the time that that would be of some value uh, to this subject here, but here we go. So what the Da Vinci Code wants us to believe is that the belief that Jesus was God was foreign to Judaism? I mean, was it really? Was it foreign to early Christians? Was it invented by Constantine? And was it really decided on by only a vote? I'm going to show you that this idea is quite old, quite ancient, yes. Go ahead. Gotcha. Look at the verse on the screen. This is Genesis 19.24. Take a good look at it. Tell me what's odd about it. Anybody, what's odd about this verse? Yeah. The word here is Yahweh in both, in both occasions. Then the Lord, then Yahweh rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. That's kind of weird. And the rabbis and other Jewish scholars noticed that. And it gave them pause to wonder. What is going on here? Let's try another one. Genesis 31, 10 through 13. Now this is the account where Jacob, one of the patriarchs, is having some problems with another fellow named Laban, who he is related to by marriage. And Jacob's flocks, his herds, are multiplying exponentially, and Laban's are not. And we read in Genesis 31, in the, in the midst of this little anecdote, In the breeding season of the flock, I, this is Jacob speaking, lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob. And I said, Here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban's doing to you, basically saying, I know Laban's been cheating you, and I'm going to multiply your wealth here. The important observation for our point is who tells Jacob that? Anybody? Who speaks to Jacob? The angel of God. Oh, no, wait a minute. The angel of God says in the next verse, I am the God of Bethel. Now, wait a minute. How can the angel of God be the God of Bethel? Now, if you, notice, if you know anything about Jacob's history, and we're going to go back to some of these passages. He wrestles with a divine being at this place. Other things happen to him at this place. But the point right now is here you have an angel saying, I'm God. I'm this deity, even though I'm called the angel of God. The rabbis noticed this and thought, hmm, wonder what that's about. Exodus 3. Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, 
The God of your fathers has sent me to you. This is, of course, Moses getting his commission at the burning bush. And God says, you're going to go back to Pharaoh and say this, that, and the other thing. And Moses is like, well, what if they don't believe me? And he says, if I go back and say, hey, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, the Israelites ask, well, what's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. In Hebrew, it's ehya asher ehya. I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So this is a passage that connects the I am who I am with the name Yahweh. This is my name. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Now, I'm going to ask a dumb question, but it has a point. Did God tell Moses his name? not a trick question. Yeah, he says, I am who I am, and, and my name is Yahweh. Then why do we read this? Exodus 33. Moses said to Yahweh, seeing you say to me, bring up this people, and you've not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Moses said, oh, this is all nice and well, but <clears throat> now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, he's speaking to Yahweh, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, God says to him, my presence will go with you. Don't take it easy, Moses. My, my presence will go with you, and I'll give you rest. And he, Moses, said to him, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. You know, I, I need you to be with us, Lord. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? So God says, I'm going to go with you. Don't worry. The narrative continues. And Yahweh said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name of Yahweh. Well, that... That's kind of weird. Didn't Moses already know his name? I mean, he got his name the first time they met at the burning bush. And so God says, I'm going to proclaim before you the name of Yahweh. Yahweh says, I'm going to proclaim the name of Yahweh to you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And Yahweh said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. I mean, Moses wants to see God physically. And God says, he answers him by saying, I'll show you my, the name of Yahweh. I heard your question, Moses. I'll show you the name of Yahweh, but you can't see my face. I mean, catch the incongruity in the language here. You can't see my face. That would be trouble. You'd die. So I'm going to put you in this little cleft of a rock and protect you. When I take away my hand, you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Well, now, well, now wait a minute, God. I mean, Moses doesn't say this, but am I going to see you or somebody else? Because you said I'm going to... I'm going to see the name of the Lord, and then now you're talking in the first person. Like, what? I'm a little confused. Introduction to the Jewish Godhead. We're going to go back to that passage because there's something that is kind of remarkable about it. We will get there in a second. These passages and this language was noticed. This is not new with me. Okay, I'm not presenting this or myself to you as something like, nobody's ever seen this before. No, lots of people saw this and other passages where it seems to be that there are two Yahwehs in the text. The Jews noticed this and they devoted a lot of time to thinking about it and articulating what is going on. known as the two powers in heaven of ancient Judaism. This was an idea, two powers in heaven, 
that was well accepted in Judaism, no problems with it, not a heresy, yeah, we know this is going on, good for you, you noticed this, until the second century A.D. What's significant about that? Well, that's post-Christianity. After Christianity came along, the two powers in heaven became declared officially a heresy in Judaism for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, well, yeah, if we go around talking about two gods in heaven, we sound like Christians. And we don't want that, do we? <laughs> um, hmm, guess not. What am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that the Jewish scriptures teach that the God of Israel had a second self. There was a second Yahweh. The second God both was and wasn't the Father God of Israel. Put another way, the Hebrew faith had a binatarian Godhead, two persons of the same essence. This belief was embraced again until the end of the first century, you get into the second century, and it's bad news. This belief, therefore, goes back at least 1,200 years prior to Constantine. We're not even in the, we're not even in the, the range. There is just no comparison to be made. The best book on this, and it's actually affordable this time, is Two Powers in Heaven by Alan Siegel. Siegel is Jewish. He's a Jewish scholar, uh, still teaching, I believe, at Columbia. Notice the subtitle. You know, fans of Dan Brown and Michael Bajant and the rest, notice the subtitle. Early Rabbinic Reports About Christianity and Gnosticism. That's a clue for saying that Gnostics had the same or similar idea. Jesus was not just an ordinary guy in Gnosticism. The second power in heaven, let's take a look at a few things. Oh, my font didn't work. The name. There's a phrase in the Old Testament, the name of the Lord. Now, if you're a Christian, you're probably familiar with this because of Romans 10. That's in the New Testament. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Most of the time when the phrase name of the Lord occurs, it's really referring to Yahweh. You know, that, that it's just his name. It's his reputation or something like that. There are a few passages, though, that are different, where the name is something different. Isaiah 30, 27. Just look at the wording. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar. In blazing wrath, with a heavy burden, his lips full of fury, his tongue like devouring fire. Now, unless you have four let letters, Y-H-W-H, floating around somewhere, coming from afar, unless we're like doing alphabet soup, like you know, Sesame Street or something, this phrase, the name of the Lord, is described as though it is an entity, a person, a being that comes from afar. This is personification language. Isaiah 69. Behold, the coastlands await me with ships of Tarshish in the lead to bring your sons from afar and their silver and gold as well for the name of the Lord your God, for the Holy One of Israel who has glorified you. Here the phrase, name of the Lord your God and Holy One of Israel are in parallel. This is classic Hebrew parallelism where the thought of one line rhymes with the thought of another. It re-echoes the same thought. The name of the Lord is not just a reputation here. The name of the Lord is the Holy One of Israel. The name of the Lord is God. Sounds kind of strange. Psalm 20 verse 1 and verse 7. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Now, unless the psalmist here is saying, hey, quick, somebody stamp the four letters on my forehead so that I'm protected from my enemies. No, he's saying, I want the name of the God of Jacob to protect me. It's not just four letters, you know, Protecting any, four letters don't protect anybody. A person, a divine being protects. 
those who are his. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Four letters scrawled on something don't win battles for you. Psalm 44, verses 5 and 6. You are my king, O God. Decree victories for Jacob. Through you we gore our foes. Through your name we trample our adversaries. So when the, the army of Israel goes out, they just shout Yahweh and like they win. No, it's through the power of their God, who here is called the name, your name. The name used as though it were an entity, a person, a being. Deuteronomy 12. This is describing again the <clears throat> installation of the tabernacle, the place of worship. Verse 4, do not worship the Lord your God in like manner like the other people do. But look only to the site that the Lord your God will choose amidst all your tribes as his habitation, the place where God lives, to establish his name there. There you're to go, so on and so forth. Verse 11, you must bring everything that I command to you to the site where the Lord your God will choose to establish his name. Now, we get a better idea what that means when we hit 1 Kings when the temple is built. When the priest came out of the sanctuary, for the cloud had filled the house of the Lord, and the priests were not able to remain and perform the service because of the cloud, for the presence of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon declared, The Lord has chosen to abide in a thick cloud. I have now built for you a stately house, a place where you may dwell. Skipping to verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Well, you know, we know that the heavens and the highest heaven can't contain you, how much less this house. Next chapter, but when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the royal palace and everything Solomon had set his heart on constructing, the Lord appeared. Look who appeared. Yahweh appeared to Solomon a second time. Okay, building from chapter 8. As he had appeared to him at Gibeon, the Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and supplication which you have offered to me. I consecrate this house which you have built and I set my name there forever. There are other passages in Deuteronomy and Kings that talk about that interchange, here's the point, interchange the name with Yahweh. They're interchangeable statements, interchangeable entities. Back to Exodus 34. Now, we said in Exodus 3 that Moses knew what God's name was. And then Moses says, hey, I, I want to see you. And God said, my presence will go with you. And Moses said, ah, it's not quite good enough. I, I, I want to see you. And God says, I will, you know, I will proclaim my name to you. You will see the name of the Lord. And then in the next chapter, we get this. Yahweh said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as Yahweh had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. Now, just catch this. Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him, with Moses there, and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, I want to illustrate something for you. Guy, can you come up here? You got two ways to look at this, and I'm going to ask you which makes more sense. Let's just pretend, for the sake of the illustration, that Guy is Moses. <laughs> and I'm Yahweh, I descend in the cloud, I stand next to him. Now, are there two characters or three in what happens? You look at the text, Yahweh descends in the clouds, stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Do I say Yahweh, and then do I walk past him saying Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh? He already knows my name. Or 
do I come down the cloud, stand next to him, and say, Yahweh, 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 the name of the Lord. Are there two or three? Go ahead, thank you. Again, this was the question in the mind of Jews as they looked at passages like this. Because Moses already knows the name. What he hasn't seen, what the issue really is, is you have the name of the Lord, you have other characters, and we're going to look at them today, who are the physical manifestation of the God who is a spirit. Jesus says, God is a spirit. John chapter 4, he tells that to the woman at the well. Well, if we assume Jesus is correct, which is probably good authority, then all these other manifestations are physical manifestations of Yahweh's own essence in visible, tangible form, even to the point where you could reach out and touch. And yet the thing that you can touch, the thing that they're seeing visibly, the physical manifestation of this spiritual thing is also called Yahweh. There is an identification between the two. It also occurs in texts outside of the Old Testament that are not canonical. Jubilees, this is a pseudepigraphical book. Remember, my sons, the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the writer says, I will make you swear an oath, for there's no oath which is greater than it, by the glorious and honored and great and splendid, wonderful, mighty name which created the heavens and the earth. The name created the heavens and the earth. Did you know that? Yeah. Standard Jewish text. Now, this is a key passage. Exodus 23. God says, I am sending an angel before you. He's speaking again to Moses. I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place which I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. First of all, I thought only God has the authority to do that. But he says, this angel, you better obey him. He will not pardon your transgressions, since my name is in him. Now, either God wrote out YHWH on something and made him eat it, or he's saying, my very essence that you know you have seen in the cloud, my name is in this being. He is me. But yet we're still different. My name is in him. And when my angel goes before you, brings you to the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the whole list, this is when Israel is being led to the promised land. This is the angel of the Lord. The special angel in Exodus 23, my name is in him, turns out to be the angel of the Lord. We know this from a variety of accounts. We'll go backward in time first. Remember the burning bush? Everybody knows this, Charlton Heston, okay? Guess, guess who's in the bush? It's not just God. Now Moses, tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire out of the bush. It's the angel. He gazed and there was a bush all aflame. The bush wasn't consumed. Moses said, I have to turn aside and see this marvelous sight. Why doesn't the bush burn up? When the Lord, in the Hebrew it's Yahweh, when Yahweh saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, he said, here I am. Takes his sandals off, verse 6. He said, you better take the sandals off, you're on holy ground. I am, the voice said, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now we have first person language, but there's more than one being in the bush. Leviticus 11.45 I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Who brought Israel up out of the land of Egypt? Yahweh. Deuteronomy 21, same thing. The Lord your God brings you up. Who brought Israel up out of the land of Egypt? Yahweh. Oh, well, then why do we read this? The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I have brought you up from Egypt. And I took you into the land which I had promised an oath to your fathers. And I said... 
I will never break my covenant with you. But you have not obeyed me. Look what you have done. Therefore, I have resolved not to drive them out before you. They shall become your oppressors and their God shall be a snare to you. And as the angel of the Lord spoke these words, it's the angel doing the first person. As the angel of the Lord spoke these words, all the Israelites started to cry. Why? Because he said, I've been with you up to this point. You haven't obeyed me. You are on your own. You're on your own. And they weren't too happy about it. Genesis 28, going back to Jacob. Jacob had a dream. A stairway was set on the ground. Its top reached the sky. The angels of God were going up and down on it. And the Lord was standing beside him. And he said, I am the Lord. I'm Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord's present in this place, and I didn't know it. He named the site Bethel. That's important. Genesis 32. The same night, this is a little bit later in Jacob's life, Jacob arose, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him. This is a physical entity. Described as a man wrestling with Jacob. They're actually touching. Okay? A man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket so that the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But Jacob answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He says, what's your name? Jacob. And he said in verse 29, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with an Elohim. You've striven, you've fought with God or a God. Either way, it's a divine being. And man, and you've prevailed. Jacob asked, pray me, tell me your name. And he said, you must not ask my name. And he took leave of him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, meaning I have seen Elohim. I have seen El. I have seen God. Hosea, the prophet, referring back to this chapter and to this episode, says this. The Lord once indicted Judah and punished Jacob for his conduct, requited him for his deeds. In the womb, this refers to the way Jacob was born. In the womb, he, Jacob, tried to supplant his brother, grown to manhood. He strove with a Elohim. He strove with an angel and prevailed. Point blank, the angel is an Elohim. This is my favorite passage in the Old Testament. I just love this one. This is just, this is cool for language geeks like me. But Israel, that is Jacob. Remember Jacob's name got changed to Israel. Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head. This is when Jacob is about to die. He's blessing his children, Joseph's children. He stretched his hands out, hand out, lays it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head and crossed his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph. These are Joseph's two kids. He blessed Joseph, saying, The God in whose ways my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd from my birth to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm. And here's the kicker. May he bless these lads. Who's the he? Is it God or is it the angel? And the answer is yes. The verb is singular. This is a complete, tight identification of the Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord, as God. There are two. And this is where the idea of a Godhead comes from. These passages, this is not a Christian invention. This is not something Constantine came up with and sucked out of his thumb for political reasons. This is in the text. Jude 5, and here's some of the the neat things about what the New Testament does with this. Jude writing, it says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Well, now, wait a minute. I thought God delivered them out of the land of Egypt. I thought the angel 
delivered them out of the land of Egypt. Jesus delivered them out of the land of Egypt. For those of you who are wondering about Trinitarianism in the Hebrew Bible, Isaiah 63. This passage to me comes the closest to it. And I, I, I want to just mention it. This again is recounting Exodus wanderings and Exodus stuff. The prophet Isaiah looks back and says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord. According to all the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, so on and so forth. Verse 8, he says, these are my people. He became their savior. If we look at verse 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his... the Holy Spirit. Why doesn't it have God or angel there? Yahweh and the angel were the ones that were doing all that stuff back there. And here, Isaiah says, no, it was the Spirit. Now, again, I don't have time to go through all the passages in both Testaments that demonstrate a Godhead in both Testaments. This is only to give you an idea. The church fathers did not just suck this out of their thumb. John 17, Jesus praying. This is the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ in John 17. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. What does that mean? Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I would suggest to you that when Jesus was around, the essence of God was in town. And keeping them in the name refers to the fact that he kept them with himself and protected them during his ministry. It's a really strange phrase. The word. We all know this passage again as Christians. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. No one has ever seen God, the only God. Catch this, the only God who is at the Father's side? That's two. He has made him known. Where does the word come from? Well, the theologians would say, oh, it comes from Greek philosophy, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, I'll grant it may have had something to do with that. Guess what? You'll find this in the Old Testament too. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. This isn't something he's hearing in his ear alone. He's seeing it. The word of the Lord came to me, came to, to Abram in a vision do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, oh, Lord God. He sees the word in a vision and identifies that being as the Lord, as Yahweh Elohim. You go down to verse 4. The word of the Lord came to him. And then he starts talking. This man won't be your heir, so on and so forth. Verse 6, Abraham believed Yahweh. He's talking to Yahweh, but Yahweh is called the word. Jeremiah 1, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. This is Jeremiah's like personal testimony here in chapter 1. And I said, oh, Lord God, truly, I don't know how to speak. You know, I can't be a prophet. I'm only a boy. But the Lord Yahweh said to me, don't say I'm only a boy. Get out there and do the job. And then in verse 9, it says, then the Lord put out his hand and touched me touched my mouth. Sounds don't touch your mouth. Phantoms, things that you just see that are not corporeal, do not touch your mouth. Physical entities touch your mouth. And this physical entity is the Lord. 1 Samuel 3. 
the story of little Samuel. Now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. I didn't see the, didn't see the Lord too often. Down to verse 8. The Lord called to Samuel. Yahweh calls to Samuel again the third time. If you remember the story, Samuel's trying to go to sleep and he keeps hearing this voice, Samuel, Samuel, and he thinks it's Eli. Little Samuel gets up and runs over to Eli and says, what do you want? And Eli's like, what? I didn't, I didn't say anything. Third time it happens. Came again the third time. He rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. And Eli finally gets a clue and says, you know, it must be the Lord calling the young man. He says, go lie down. If he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And so Samuel says, okay. The Lord came and stood, stood, calling as at other times. This is a visible, physical entity. Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. Go down to the, the end of the chapter. And Samuel grew. The Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared, appeared again. Hearkening back to what we just read. The Lord appeared again at Shiloh. That's where they were living. That's where the tabernacle was. For the Lord revealed himself at, to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The word is a being in these passages. Philo, our Jewish friend, also picked up on this concept. He refers to the logos, which is the Greek word for word. He actually calls the word God. But he maintained a, a distinction between the logos and the God of Israel. Gnosticism actually is very close to what Philo believed. Philo said that there was a second God. This is a Jew who wrote lots of stuff and was very influential. He referred to the Logos as the Deuteros Theos, the second God. But he believed that the second God was a created being, an intermediary. And that's essentially what Gnosticism held, as we saw in our first session. The early church did not accept that because the essence of Yahweh cannot have a beginning. If it's Yahweh, it was always there. And that becomes the focal point for Nicaea. The dominant view was always the orthodox view, that there are two, there's a, there's a Godhead, and every member of the Godhead is the same essence as the Father. They didn't get it because Constantine liked it. He wasn't a theologian. They got it from all those passages I just showed you, and others. Okay? And the Jews of the day... Again, not everybody you know, could wrap their minds around that. And Philo came up with, the, oh, this sounds a little more reasonable. You know, yeah, he's a second god, but he had to have a beginning. because, you know. And those became the two tracks, the two views. The rider on the clouds. Guy, how much time do we have? 10, 15 minutes. Okay, here's another one. I, re I really like this one. The rider on the clouds, this phrase, he who rides on the clouds, he who makes his, the clouds his chariot, this is a phrase actually taken from pagan texts that winds up in the Old Testament, specifically that's drawn from Ugaritic texts about the god Baal. I mention that because it's, it's very common for Old Testament prophets and writers to draw from literature around them and, and put it into the Hebrew Bible, as it were, to make a theological point. One of the things they do is they take this title, because Baal was like the big enemy in the Old Testament. Baal against Yahweh happens all the time, like with Elijah at Carmel. And, they, and they, they take the title, the one who rides the clouds, and they put it on Yahweh as if to say, no, Baal isn't the one who controls the heavens and rides the clouds. It's Yahweh. Five times this title is used in the Old Testament for the God of Israel, for Yahweh. Here they are. Deuteronomy 33. There's none like God, O Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. None like God. Psalm 68. O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, sing to the Lord, to him who rides in the heavens. Okay, clearly it's God, it's Yahweh. 
Psalm 104, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, my God. You are very great. Go down to the last verse there in the section. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. These are all titles of Baal, descriptions. Point is, everybody in, everybody in the ancient world knew Baal was a god. Or, you know, they, they believed that. And the writer's saying, no, you know, Baal is, you know, whatever. Baal's an entity, but, but he is subordinate. Yahweh's the one who really has this position. And they kept at putting the phrase to Yahweh. Isaiah 19, an oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud. Yahweh is the one who's riding on the clouds. The lone exception. Every place in the Old Testament, the rider on the clouds is Yahweh. There is one exception. And it's this passage. Daniel 7. As I looked... Daniel says, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. By the way, that's the same description as in Ezekiel 1. Uh, It's God, the Ancient of Days, is sitting on his throne, fiery throne, you know, wheels. If if you've ever seen my session on uh, throne iconography that I do for some other topics, very familiar imagery. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. In the court, the divine council sat in judgment and the books were open. There's no doubt who this is. But the passage goes on. I saw in the night visions and behold, upon the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. The phrase means a human one. Son of man as opposed to son of God. And he came to the Ancient of Days. So these are clearly two different people, two different entities, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. You have a second person referred to as the one who rides upon the clouds. And this passage became a real focal point of debate, and guess where it shows up in the New Testament? Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Jesus is brought in front of Caiaphas. And the high priest says to him, verse 63, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. You know, you're getting tired of this. You know, quit beating around the bush. Are you the Son of God or not? And Jesus said to him, well, you've said so, but I tell you, From now on, you will see, he quotes Daniel 7, 13. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus' favorite title for himself in the Gospels was Son of Man. I'm the human one. I get to be human. Isn't that cool? Jesus thought it was cool to be human to be embodied as a man. And he stands before Caiaphas, and Caiaphas says, you know, you know I mean, this is a serious situation. This is life and death. And he, Caiaphas says, okay, you know, tell us who you are. And Jesus gives us this throwaway, you know, what are you doing? quoting Daniel 7? Just yes or no would, would suffice. And he quotes Daniel 7, 13, and says, I'll tell you who I am. Hereafter you'll see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds. And you know how we know that the Jews knew he was claiming to be God? The very next verse. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. We don't need any more witnesses. This guy is claiming to be God. He is claiming to be the one who rides on the clouds. He's a blasphemer. There's no ambiguity. You know, when, when you read these new, you know, the, the news media, oh, who did Jesus think he was? You know, I think Caiaphas got the message. You know, maybe, maybe people today don't, but Caiaphas certainly did. Again, the main source here is Siegel, and I draw your attention again to the subtitle, Gnosticism. If you want a book on Jesus in the Nag Hammadi writings, I recommend this one. It's a scholarly title. Somebody's dissertation work again, but it's the most thorough thing there is. Jesus in the Nag Hammadi writings. 
just so that you can check up on me. Going back to Dan Brown's quote, my dear, T being declared until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed as just a mortal prophet, just a man. Well, let's take a look in the Nag Hammadi texts again. The Apocryphon of John. We look at the text here. Oh, let's see if I can find it here. I don't, did I mark it up here? No, you can't see it visually. The teaching of the Savior. In the revelation of the mysteries, the things hidden in silence, even these things he taught John, his disciples. It happened one day when John, the brother of James, who were the sons of Zebedee, came to the temple that a Pharisee named Arimanius approached him and said to him, where is your master whom you followed? And he said to him, he's gone to the place from which he came. This is after Jesus' death. The Pharisee said to him, with deception did this Nazarene deceive you? He filled your ears with lies and closed your hearts and turned you away from the traditions of your fathers. Then I, John, heard these things, or when I heard these things, I turned away from the temple to a desert place. Kind of hit me pretty hard, John says. And I grieved greatly in my heart, saying, well, then how was the Savior appointed, and why was he sent into the world by his Father? And who is his Father who sent him, and of what sort is that aeon to which we shall go? When I went, you know, I... Then why did the Father, remember, you know, the Gnosticism, the God, the ultimate God-Father thing? Why did he send him into the world then? Not just an ordinary guy if the ultimate God is sending him somewhere. Know who Christ is. This is the teachings of Silvanus, another Gnostic text. And acquire him as a friend, for this is the friend who is faithful. He is also God and teacher. I'm sorry, Dan Brown, you are incorrect. Okay. This is, these are the Gnostic texts. Know who Christ is. He is God and teacher. This one being God became man for your sake. You know, frankly, folks, this could go right into the New Testament. This could go right into orthodoxy. Now, I'm not saying that the Gnostics understood the language the same way, but they're saying this is a God who became man. Teachings of Sylvanus again. Let's see. Do not tire of knocking on the door of reason, the middle section here. Do not cease walking in the way of Christ. Walk in it so that you may receive rest from your labors. If you walk in another way, there will be no profit in it. For all those who walk on the broad way will go down at their end to the to perdition of the mire. For the underworld is open wide for the soul. And the place of perdition is broad, except Christ, the narrow way, for he is oppressed and bears affliction for your sin. Even sounds like substitutionary atonement there a little bit. O oh, soul, persist in what ignorance do you exist, for who is your guide into the darkness? How many likenesses did Christ take on because of you? Although he was God, he was found among men as a man. You could put that in the New Testament too. The only thing different is likeness says, the plural. Because the Gnostic view of what's going on here is a little different than the Orthodox view. This is the classic passage from, guess where, the Gospel of Philip, the one that everybody quotes in relation to the Da Vinci Code. Same text. Jesus took them all by stealth, for he did not appear as he was, but in the manner in which they would be able to see him. He appeared to them all. He appeared to the greatest great. He appeared to the smallest small. He appeared to the angels as an angel and to men as a man. Because of this, his word hid itself from everyone. Some saw him, some indeed saw him, thinking that they were seeing themselves. When he appeared to his disciples in glory on the mount, he was not small, he became great, so on and so forth. What the Gnostic view of Jesus was, and again, we'll have to quickly go through this. The, Gnostics, the Gnostic position about Jesus was this. Jesus is not just a man. He was a god. He was one of these aeons. And so was the Christ. Jesus and the Christ are two different things, two different entities in Gnosticism. What the Gnostic scriptures, and you know, Michael Bagent and others make a big deal about this, about there are certain Gnostic passages, and this is one of them and some of the other ones, where Jesus sort of, he's crucified, but yet it's not really him. 
Jesus is like looking at some man they're crucifying and standing there laughing, thinking, ah, oh, the archons, those, those evil you know, entities think they got me, but they really didn't. I'm over here. It's not really me. And Bajent and Lee will take this in their minds as evidence that, that it wasn't the real Jesus. They don't understand Gnosticism. To the Gnostic, the eon comes down, becomes a human being, but it's like a shell. It's like a facade. It's like, it's like a, you know, I'll use the word deception, but I don't mean it to be negative. It's just as the Gospel of Philip said, Jesus appeared as he needed to appear when he needed to appear as that. Jesus is faking them out. He comes down, he manifests himself as this man, Jesus, the heavenly Jesus. If you're, if you're familiar with Platonic philosophy, this is another stream in Gnosticism, you know, that there's the ideal, there's the cosmic Jesus, and there's the earthly Jesus. And the earthly Jesus gets killed, but the cosmic Jesus is still up here having a good time, untouched, unscathed. If anything, what the Gnostics did was they, they downplayed the humanity of Christ. They didn't think he was really, 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 you know, this God in flesh, and that, that was it. It's, it's sort of a disguise is what they're looking at. Treatise of the Great Seth, um, again, talking about the crucifixion here. I know I have to hurry a little bit right up here. I did not die in reality, but in appearance, lest I be put to shame by them, so on and so forth. This is the Gnostic view, and I've just summarized it. Uh, for the sake of time. Summary again, what I want to convey to you, I know this was a, a longer session because there's a lot here, and I'll grant you this is my favorite part of the whole thing, which is why it took longer. The idea that Jesus was the second power in heaven, a God in flesh, is built upon stuff that's in the Jewish Bible and the church comes out of Judaism and accepts the Jewish Bible as inspired revelation from God, this idea precedes the Council of Nicaea by at least 1,200 years. That's a millennium plus some. Constantine did not invent this. Okay? This is something that Jews, before there even was a Christianity, noticed, tried to deal with, tried to articulate, and when Jesus came along and the Christians said, we know who the second power is. It was this guy who lived among us. And by the way, you just crucified him. But there was a reason for that. And we'll tell you about it. Okay? It's not something that was contrived at the Council of Nicaea. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I've always had a little bit of problem with um, the concept of Trinity. And that oh, well, seemed to be too <laughs> limiting in what the essence of God really was. And noticing the inconsistencies, I've seen three or four manifestations here, or maybe even five, of what we could say would be the essence of God. Does it go beyond that? When you say three or four or five, you are referring to? The different. Uh, the personages or Person. the revelations, in other words. Like the name, you know, right. the glory. We, what, we didn't cover the glory. We didn't cover what scholars call the divine man. And specifically, that would be a, a situation like Exodus 24 or Ezekiel 1, where the person seated on the throne is described in physical bodily terms. I saw his feet. I saw his legs. You know, that, so that, scholars refer to that as the divine man. We also didn't talk about, uh, my dissertation actually focused on non-biblical stuff. In other words, how did Jews between the Testaments try to deal with this? And so you have a whole separate category of trying to explain who the second power was in other terms. They would, they would take things like phrases like the friend of God, uh, the, divine, the, the warrior of God in the Old Testament, and they would say, well, the second person must be, who was a friend of God? Abraham. When Abraham died, then he got to sit on the throne. And yeah, I know he was around before Abraham, but it's kind of weird, but God can do anything. I mean, they were, they were trying to fit people and angels and persons into the second category. Some people thought it was Michael. Some people thought it was Gabriel. Some people thought it was Elijah because he was taken up and never died. 
I mean, there, there are a lot of dozen explanations that Jews offered in the period between the Testaments for the second power, and we didn't go over any of that stuff. In a sense, are we still doing that now? I, th I think when we talk about Trinitarianism, we're still sort of asking the same questions. Yeah, still to put that right, God right. In box. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, I, went, I spent a couple of years in seminary. I never ran into any of this stuff. I was never taught this. What changed my life, and it sounds goofy, but I, when I tell people this, I really mean it. Ugaritic changed my life because for the first time, I had to study an, an ancient, it's an ancient alphabetic cuneiform text. And the reason why it's important is because the description of the divine host, the heavenly host at Ugarit, is often used in the Old Testament. And when you're forced to look at comparative material that is, not, that is in some cases word for word and letter for letter brought into the Hebrew Bible, and then the prophets or the psalmist will do things with that to, to illustrate concepts. When you start looking at comparative material and you start getting into this, well, you know, I keep coming across this two powers debate. What's that? You know, when you get exposed to the literature, the broader ancient world, that is how I, I bumped into this. And it became a fascination for me, this whole thing about divine counsel and the nature of the heavenly host and whatnot. I didn't get any of this in seminary. I, the, the most surreal experience I've had doing this kind of lecture, at the University of Wisconsin, I taught for three summers in a non-credit uh, situation. The first year I was in, I, it was one of these things where they went around to grad students and they said, hey, suggest a class and if we like it, well, you can teach for us. So I suggested angelology. Oh, that sounds kind of interesting. Well, let's do that. We've never had that before. I walked into the room. There's 40 people in the room and I start doing this and they were all Jewish. Every last person in the room, except for me, was Jewish. <laughs> and the way I found out was not, no one threw anything at me. But, <laughs> but somebody raised their hand and said, it was like five minutes into this, my rabbi never told me this. And it's like, well, are you Jewish? Yeah. And everybody's like, yeah, I am too. And it's like, everybody in the room is Jewish. And I'm staying there. It's like, well, I got to fill up the hour. So like, what do I do now? And, but you go through it with them because they know their text. You know, some of them did anyway. And it's like, I actually had one of them say in front of everybody else, in front of their peers, I understand now why people became Christians. I get it. You just, you don't get it. You, you, you know, you go to seminary, you, you, don't, you don't get into this nitty-gritty stuff. And for me, it's, it just has become a fascination. This is where I spend most of my time, you know, doing this stuff. Since the second power is, you know, even, even referring to that, we're, yeah. we're really trying to nail something in the box. Yeah, be I, I, I really think, and I, I gave two academic papers on this last year at academic conferences, and uh, I really think that, that this, is, this is the bridge. This is the answer. This explains why the early church was so quick to worship Jesus and still die for monotheism. That, that is probably the thing that offends me most about the Da Vinci Code, this idea that all this was invented. I'm you know, sorry, but there were hundreds and probably thousands of people who were put to death by the Romans and in some cases, I'm sure Jews as well, because they worship Jesus as God, but they refuse to bow the knee to the Roman emperor who claimed to be a deity. And, and the Romans thought this was insane. Well, you're already worshiping this second one over here, and don't tell us you're monotheist because you're doing this. And the Christians, and, and Jews for that matter, would say, sorry, we're not afraid to die. And I think what Dan Brown and his sources do with this material just makes that a mockery. So for me personally, that's my biggest irritation with the book. But you know, no, no, that, that's just me because I'm thinking about this. And I'm not saying Brown's out to do that. He's, he's not. But that's just me personally. Go ahead. How does this uh, connect to um, the only begotten? In other words, when, I think when a lot of people hear that, they think of right. uh, the birth of Jesus. Uh, begotten takes place before time. Okay. Yeah, part of the part of the problem is the is the chronolo it, It's a twofold problem, actually, it's a threefold problem. Part of it is a word like begotten does convey chronology, because we have the sense that it implies a beginning. 
the, the early church, though, used that term to distinguish the idea behind that term from being created, the Nicene Creed. He's, the Son is begotten but not made. So they knew there was a distinction there that they had in their heads. We have lost that because we, don't, we just don't use words like begotten. So that's the second issue. The third issue is it's a, just, it's a terrible translation. Uh, there's a translation problem. The, the word that is used that we, we typically think of as only begotten in the New Testament is monogenes. It used to be assumed that that came from monos, which is alone or only, and it, and it came from the verb genao. So only, genao means to beget, to give birth to. And so the, the supposition was that it meant only begotten. After there was a lot of other Greek papyri discovered in the late 19th century and early 20th century, where, it, by the way, when papyri are discovered, the neat thing that that does is it widens the vocabulary, the known vocabulary of, of a, and the known meaning range of a certain word. It was discovered, and this is 100 years old, it was discovered that monogenes does not come from manas and ganao. It comes from manas and gene, which means unique or kind. So Jesus is the monogenes. He is the unique kind. He is the only kind of something. And the way we know that that's what's going on in the New Testament is in Hebrews chapter 11, the word monogenes is used of Isaac. Think back to your Old Testament. The, book, the writer of the Hebrews calls Isaac the monogenes. Isaac is the son of Abraham. Here's the question. Was Isaac Abraham's only son? No. He had Ishmael first. Isaac wasn't even the firstborn. So that tells you that monogenes cannot mean firstborn or only born. What it means is unique. There was something unique about Isaac out of all the sons of Abraham. And what was it? Isaac was the son of the promise. He was the one that came from Sarah, which was the original prophecy that God gave to Abraham and said, you're old and your wife's old, but from Sarah you will have a child, and that child will be the chosen one of my covenant. The same word that's used in John 3.16. So it's, there's a translation issue. So back to your original question, it relates because Jesus is unique. We have plural sons of God in both Testaments. Haven't you ever asked yourself this question? Why, do, why is Jesus called the only begotten Son of God when there are plural sons of God in the Old Testament? It's a good question to ask. The reason is, is there's something unique about him. What's unique about him with respect to all the sons of God, all the heavenly host? He's the essence of the Father. They are not. He is uncreated. They are not. He is Yahweh. They are not. He's unique. He is species unique. Go ahead. Is there more of a, a more familiar pattern that maybe we see day day now that you can like and dot that too? As far as an illustration? Correct. Right. Oh boy. You know, I. The, the short answer is nothing that I either A, like, or B, understand. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, you, you read some of the simpler ones like an egg or like the three states of water or something like that. And, and they're all, you know, some of them are kind of useful, but they all seem to break down somewhere. Physicists, I've seen physicists try to tackle this with different states of matter, and that's just right over my head. You know, I, I, I can't claim to understand it or even have anything to really suggest that would be helpful in that. But it seems difficult at times because, you know, well, at least in most Jewish uh, circles, most of the people proclaim the Shema. Mm -hmm. The Lord our God is one. Right. And, and it's difficult to try to, to reconcile the two. Yeah. But it, think of it this way. The, the claim in the Shema is the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. By the way, it, it never claims there aren't any other gods in those passages. Uh, just a side note. The issue, though, is if the name, if the angel, if the word is Yahweh, then he's Yahweh, even though he exists in a second. 
I'll use this even though it's not theologically careful, but it might help. Even though the name and the word are different forms of Yahweh, they're still Yahweh. And if you worship this being, you are still worshiping Yahweh. And there's a unity. Okay, nothing, Yahweh's not taking his essence and making a lesser being. In other words, a distinct being, a being that is not him in essence. If he did do that, then you'd have to worship two separate entities and you would violate the Shema. This is, this is how the Jews approach this. Because if you look back in uh, Deuteronomy, what was the one? I, Deuteronomy 12, it says, this is the place where I have chosen to set my name and this is the place to which you'll bring your sacrifices and offerings. Okay, they're, they're actually offering sacrifices to the, to the name. But they didn't see that as a violation of the Shema. Why? Because, well, the name's Yahweh. He's just the physical manifestation of Yahweh. We know that. We're not worshiping another God. We're worshiping Yahweh. It's just now we can see him. All of these, all of these second entities, the, the fancy scholarly term for this is they are hypostases. They are, they are visible physical manifestations of a spiritual thing. But it's still the same thing in essence. It's just that one, one is you can, you can see and, it, and it, you can approach it with your senses. See, touch, feel, hear, that kind of thing. And the other one is a spirit. God is a spirit, John chapter 4. So the Jews could, could comprehend that much. And to them, to worship Jesus or to worship the name or whatever, it was worship of Yahweh. So they didn't see it as a violation, which drove the Romans nuts. You know, they just thought that that was insane. You know, like, you're willing to die and you already do this. It doesn't make any sense to us. Uh, any other questions? Guy? That bit about the flaming wheels mm -hmm. and Ezekiel 1 and the Ancient of Days, that stuff sounds fascinating. <laughs> Have you ever talked about Ezekiel 1? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. A, a guy could get some sessions from a conference called the Ancient of Days Conference from Guy Malone at the ARHQ in Roswell, New Mexico. And I'm sure there's a link on the davincicoda.com site. Oh, there's not. Ancientofdays.net, okay. Yep. Yeah, a guy, guy has some lectures on different topics related to that. That was a very nice plug, guy. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, let's break a couple minutes. Session number six, as I roll up my sleeves and get ready here, is what really happened at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, this is going to be pretty straightforward, uh, just essentially exactly as I have it up here. I do need to credit uh, someone, and I will when I get to the particular point, for a lot of this material, I'm not a historian by training, and this is going to be largely historical. I'm basically a text person, although I, you know, I have one degree in ancient history, but it's not my real focus, but I think I'll be able to communicate uh, you know, some good material from a friend of mine who was gracious enough to uh, allow me to use it. The focus here, again, are some statements uh, to begin in the Da Vinci Code about the Council of Nicaea. Again, drawing from the dialogue, Tebing says, Jesus' establishment as the Son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. Sophie says, hold on, you're saying Jesus' divinity was the result of a vote? A relatively close vote at that, Tebing added. Well, we'll see. Other assertions about Nicaea in the Da Vinci Code. One was, you'll get a very strong feeling that the council was controlled by Constantine. Uh, very hard to read the book and not come away with that impression. Second, that Constantine never truly converted to Christianity, but was a lifelong pagan. That is something that the, the book you know, makes a point of. Third, that the council, under orders from Constantine, dictated which books got into the New Testament. This is more heavily uh, put forth by Brown's sources, but it is suggested in the book, so I'll include it. <clears throat> Fourth, the idea of Jesus' deity was invented by Constantine in relation to the outcome of this council. 
five, Jesus' deity was decided upon by a close vote. So these are the points of contention. And again, I do want to credit Dr. Ronald Heine, uh, who was at the Puget Sound Christian College here in the local area, because a lot of this stuff is adapted from his presentation on this topic. He is an early church scholar. But let's just jump in here, since we've credited him. Constantine and the, the Christian faith. Constantine's conversion does get associated with an incident that happened at the Milvian Bridge uh, in a battle near Rome against Maxentius, the emperor of the Western Roman Empire. Again, if you remember your world civ, the Roman Empire was divided into two uh, portions. There was an east and a west. And at certain points, they were both ruled over by emperors. There wasn't just one. Constantine had prayed for divine help against Maxentius and had seen some kind of vision in the sky. Again, we've probably heard this story which he or his advisors interpreted as coming from the Christian God. We don't really know what it was, for sure. Constantine's victory at the Milvian Bridge appears to have influenced him toward a policy of favoring Christianity. Now, this much is pretty well agreed on by all parties. The real issue is what happens with Constantine afterwards. Does this have any lasting effect? Well, the Da Vinci Code would say no. He didn't convert. He just went back to being a pagan and you know, decided to use Christianity for political gain. And that's what we're here to, to question. Prior to Constantine's victory, Christianity had been an illegal religion. Christians were deprived of property rights, legal rights of assembly. They didn't have appeal in legal proceedings. And Constantine had been a worshiper of the sun god. This much is clear. The short-term results of Constantine's victory are that he did in fact, maintain allegiance to the sun god. There's no evidence immediately that he had this really long-lasting conversion or even a, a dramatic conversion at all. However, despite the fact that he does you know, continue this allegiance and there's evidence from the coins to credit the sun god, he quickly began to grant privileges to Christians. He began to change Roman policy. Specifically, in February of 313, he met Licinius, the emperor of the eastern section of the Roman Empire in Milan, and they together issued what has become known, if you remember your history of Civ again, as the Edict of Milan. He also began giving large gifts to the church and favoring Christian clergy. So there is some sort of change, some sort of impact, not what you'd really call a, a long-lasting or profound conversion because he's also maintaining loyalty to the sun god. Now, the Edict of Milan in 313 was not just aimed exclusively at Christians. It was an edict of toleration for all religions. Our purpose, the two of them, Constantine and Licinius, say at the beginning of the edict, and of course we have the edict, our purpose is to grant both the Christians and to all others full authority to follow whatever worship each person has desired. So it's, it's an edict of toleration, you know, just generally. Christians specifically are given legal rights in the edict, and it orders that all property that had been confiscated from Christians should be immediately returned without demand of payment. What about Constantine and Sunday? This is another claim in the Da Vinci Code. And again, it's something that we will talk, we're, we're talking about it here because we're trying to follow a, a loosely chronological flow as Constantine's life touches on things that the Da Vinci Code claims. In 321, Constantine ordered that Sunday, the day on which Christians worshiped, would be kept free of legal proceedings. It used to be before he did this that Christians you know, could be dragged into these legal proceedings on their day of worship, and if they objected, it's like, who cares? You're just a Christian. Uh, Constantine you know, passed legislation that pre prevented that from happening. The Da Vinci Code, though, is incorrect when it says that Constantine named the Christian day of worship Sunday in honor of the sun god. And also when it suggests that he changed the day on which Christians worship from Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, to Sunday. These are both claims made in the book. How do we know that's wrong? Well, the early church fathers who were living and writing before Constantine was ever born said this. On the day called Sunday, there's the Sunday, all who live in cities and in the country gather together to one place. This is Justin Martyr 
speaking again about Christians in his Apologia. Justin also says very clear that Christians did not observe the Sabbath. They worshipped on Sunday. In the letter of Barnabas, again mid-2nd century, the first day of the week on which Christians worshipped is referred to as the eighth day to contrast it with the Sabbath. Again, these are all primary texts that basically show us that the Da Vinci Code's revelation is incorrect. Now, what about his real conversion? Or This is what I'm sort of terming his real conversion. Until 323, Constantine apparently maintained some sort of allegiance to the sun god. But there is evidence that at that time he began turning more completely to the Christian god, to Jesus, and so on and so forth. In 323, Constantine faced Licinius, emperor of the eastern section of the empire. Again, he was a worshiper of the traditional Roman gods, so now they're fighting before they've been issuing an ice edict. And now they're enemies. The decisive battle between them took place on September 18, 324, just eight months before Nicaea. Constantine won the battle, became sole emperor, and there is evidence that this victory really prompted him to follow the Christian God. Now this is from Eusebius' Life of Constantine. Eusebius was an ancient writer who recorded some of these events for, in early church history. The chapter there in Roman numerals, I believe, I, I hate Roman numerals, 55, I think. Quotation is long, but it's significant. And now I beseech thee, this is Constantine speaking. This is what's being recorded. I beseech thee, most mighty God, to be merciful and gracious to thine eastern nations, to thy people in these provinces, worn as they are by protracted miseries, and grant them healing through thy servant. Not without cause, O holy God, I, do I prefer this prayer to thee, the Lord of all. Under thy guidance I have devised and accomplished measures fraught with blessings. Preceded by thy sacred sign, he's, he's alluding back to this thing he saw at the Milvian Bridge. I have led thy armies to victory and still on each occasion of public danger I follow the same symbol of thy perfections while advancing to meet the foe. Therefore, I have dedicated to thy service a sole duty tempered by love and fear. For thy name I truly love. While I regard with reverence the power of which thou hast given abundant proofs to the confirmation and increase of my faith, I hasten then to devote all my powers to the restoration of thy most holy dwelling place which those profane and impious men have defiled by the contamination of violence. He continues in the next chapter, my own desires, my own desire is for the common good of the world and the advantage of all mankind that thy people should enjoy a life of peace and undisturbed concord. He goes on and on with this and about little under midway down, he says, only let men of sound judgment be assured of this, that those only can live a life of holiness and purity whom you call, whom thou callest to a reliance upon thy holy laws. With regard to those who will hold themselves aloof from us. Now catch that. He is grouping himself in one category and he's going to distinguish himself from someone else. Those who withhold themselves aloof from us, let them have, if they please, their temples of lies. He is distinguishing himself here from pagans. He calls the, their temples temples of lies. He is switching allegiances. Next chapter. Truly our worship is no new or recent thing, but one which thou hast ordained for thine own due honor. From the time when, as we believe, this system of the universe was first established. And although mankind have deeply fallen and have been seduced by manifold errors. Yet, catch the quote, yet hast thou revealed a pure light in the person of thy son. He is clearly not aligning himself with pagans at this point. They worship in the temple of lies. They don't do what we do, us, them. This is much stronger than it had been up to this point. What about Constantine's deathbed baptism? The Da Vinci Code asserts that Constantine was not baptized until he was near death and too frail to prevent it from being done. Tebing says that. According to Eusebius' Life of Constantine, there you have the reference, Constantine postponed baptism until he was near death. That is true. 
But there's no evidence that it was done against his will. In other words, he's not like fighting against it. That has to be inserted into the account. Delaying baptism was actually not an uncommon thing in the early church. The, the fathers didn't like it, but it was, it was actually pretty common. As late, late as the 5th century, baptism was often postponed to avoid the responsibilities it incurred, basically spiritual laziness. Uh, you know, public proclamation, if I do this, then certain things are going to be expected of me, and I don't know if I really want to go through with that. And Constantine was apparently one of those. In the late 4th century, Gregory of Nyssa preached a sermon called Against Those Who Put Off Baptism. <laughs> so this was a big enough problem that Gregory you know, devotes a whole written sermon to it that, of course, you know, gets circulated. Council of Nicaea. The Da Vinci Code asserts that the idea that Jesus was God cannot be found prior to Nicaea. We've dealt with that in Session 5. Primary source material from the early fathers also illustrates the error of the Da Vinci Code and Brown's sources and sets the stage for what Nicaea was really about. It was well known by the second century AD that Christians considered Jesus to be divine far more than a man. We get this from pagans. There is pagan testimony to the fact that Christians worship Jesus as God well before the time of Constantine. This is from Pliny the Younger to the Emperor Trajan, first decade of the second century AD. Pliny writes, <clears throat> again in his letter, Meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second time and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy, surely deserved to be punished. There were others possessed of the same folly, so on and so forth. You know, because there were Romans, I couldn't kill them. Remember Paul, this actually saves Paul's life in the book of Acts. The fact that he's a Roman citizen, uh, it's alluded to right here. They asserted, however, that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God. Okay? This, is, this is a pagan source, plenty. We get it from early Christians as well. I'm only going to give you two examples here. In a sermon, three examples actually. A sermon or a homily called Second Clement, chapter 1, verse 1, which dates from the middle of the 2nd century, begins this way. Brethren, we must think of Jesus Christ as of God. Ignatius refers in one of his letters to Jesus Christ, our God, specifically his letter to the Ephesians. And he says in another place, I glorify Jesus Christ, the God who has given you wisdom. It's his letter to, to Smyrna. This is 150, 125, 150 years before Constantine. We've already seen textually when it comes to the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, this is what the scriptures taught. This is the position that manifested itself very early as orthodoxy. But it wasn't the only way that people looked at it because it's a tough issue. Now, I'm going to refer you to the writings of Larry Hurtado. Uh, I know Larry. Larry uh, and I have corresponded a bit. He teaches at the U University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He's an American. Uh, very nice guy. Uh, his tradition is the Assemblies of God, but he's, he's not that anymore. Uh, he would still call himself a, a Christian, though. Uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't like uh, conservative labels that the Americans use. Hurtado has done a truckload of work in this area. Specifically, he has devoted his scholarly expertise to two areas. One is papyrus study. The other is to the early worship of Jesus. If you want a book that is cluttered, chock full of primary source references for the early worship of Jesus as God, this is where you go. Larry is also one of, one of the scholars I know who's read my dissertation. We go back and forth on that. I'm... I've gotten him to change his mind over a couple things, but I'm still working on one or two more. <laughs> I don't know if you'll ever see this, but give him a little ribbing there. Uh, but he's, he's a wonderful guy, just does great work. And if you want primary source material, he's the guy. That's where you should go. The struggle that led to Nicaea, how to articulate Jesus as a divine being. This is the problem. 
you know, we, we see the text, we see these, these passages, I took you through a number of them before, and it's like, well, how do we put this into words? How do we express, you know, a father and a son who are both Yahweh, and how do we be monotheists while we're doing that, and what about when one prays to the other, and the whole thing about becoming a man, I mean, this is mind stuff. The texts themselves, if you really look at them closely, now that you've been exposed to them, there are a number of, of texts that are fairly clear that there's, there's some two-ness going on here. But the problem was how to articulate that. What does that mean? Yeah, that was tough. So what did the scriptures teach in this regard? The first view, and this is the view that was the dominant view. It's the view that has become recognized as orthodoxy. It's the view that was recognized as the majority orthodox opinion before Nicaea and the one that will win the day at the end of the council. This view was that Jesus and God the Father were the same in essence. Both had therefore always existed. That's a key element. However, they were distinct persons. View number one. I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but there was discussion both in Jewish writings, Philo, his discussion of Logos, and New Testament passages, that the Logos was, again, the second deity entity. And the question was, chronologically, where does the Logos come from? Did the Logos have a beginning? Or was the Logos always with God and God, and God just brought the Logos forth? This view said he was always there, and God brought him forth. Other views said... He came into existence at some point. View number two said Jesus was God the Father. Now catch the distinction. First view says Jesus and God the Father are the same in essence, but they're distinct persons. The second approach was just to say, well, Jesus is just the Father. He is the Father. The Son is the Father. Now the problem with that became known as modalistic monarchianism, was that it raised some difficult points. Middle paragraph. The view solved the problem of worshiping God and Jesus. Hey, they're the same guy. No problem there. You were worshiping only one God because Jesus was God the Father. However, it created other problems. If Jesus were God the Father, then God the Father suffered and died on the cross. I mean, how can you have that happen if it's the same, the same being? Totally. How can he lay dead in a grave for three days? How could that be? To whom did Jesus pray? I mean, is Jesus praying to himself then? So it just created problems, and it was not accepted, but it was around prior to Nicaea. View number three said Jesus was not God. He was also not man. He was something in between. Jesus was a human being like all other human beings, except that he had been born of a virgin because Jesus was a very religious man. He was chosen by God and a special power called Christ descended on him. Two variations. One would lean to saying, well, he was just a man, but then he was like indwelled by this Christ thing. The other one would say, and this gets closer to Gnosticism, that the heavenly Jesus manifested himself as an earthly Jesus. So kind of a man, but not, you know, just this trying to wrap their minds around this position. But he definitely wasn't God in the same essence. He definitely wasn't the Father. He definitely wasn't the same essence. He was something different. Again, this is close to Gnosticism. The view was actually called Docetism, though. Docetism taught that Jesus did not have a real human body. It only looked like he was human. He only appeared as a human. He wasn't really incarnated. Again, this view was more of a denial of the humanity of Christ, and it gets close to the Gnostic view. Now, along came an important figure, Arius of Alexander, who became a focal point in the struggle to articulate all this. How to assert that Jesus was God and worshiping, worship him and still claim monotheism. Arius was a presbyter in Alexandria, Egypt, under the jurisdiction of Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria. Sometime before 318, Alexander began to dispute what Arius was teaching about Christ, and he called a synod to discuss the matter, and the synod condemned Arius. Now that, that synod was not Nicaea, something that happened earlier, because Alexander was a little concerned about his understudy here. 
Arius' writings have not been preserved, but a few things have been preserved in the writings of the church fathers who wrote against him. Athanasius quotes a creed that Arius and his followers sent to the bishop Alexander. And an excerpt here, this is, this is Arius' position. We recognize one God who alone is unbegotten, eternal, without beginning, true, immortal, wise, good, sovereign, judge of all, governor, administrator, unchangeable and unalterable, just and good. Lots of adjectives there. He is God of the law, the prophets, and the New Testament. He has begotten an only begotten son before eternal times. That's an odd phrase. How can eternity have time? <laughs> before eternal times, through whom also he has made the ages in the universe. The son was begotten, not in appearance. So that Arius is denying a Gnostic element here. Catch that. The son was begotten, not in appearance, but in truth and exists unchangeable and unalterable by his own will, a perfect creature of God. He is a created thing. But not as one of the other creatures begotten, but not as one of the other begotten beings. He's trying to say that, that this one was somehow unique, somehow different. He was created by the will of God before all times and ages and has received both his life and being from the Father. The Father is the source of all things, but the Son who was begotten by the Father apart from time and was created and founded before the ages, did not exist before he was begotten. This becomes the key point. Okay, Arius is saying that the Son had a definite beginning before which he did not exist. The orthodox position, view number one, said he is the essence of, of Yahweh and Yahweh has always existed, therefore he has always existed as well. That becomes the, a, a crucial matter. He was begotten apart from time before all and alone was made to exist by the Father. For he is not eternal, nor co-eternal, nor co-unbegotten with the Father. Arius, very clear, but uh, you got to look at this and you say, the Son is not an ordinary guy. He's something very special. He's not quite what view number one says. And this becomes the debate. So Brown and his sources blunder here when they insinuate that the Arian view was that Christ was a mortal man like any other man. Arius did not believe nor teach that Christ was just like any other man, neither did the Gnostics. For Arius, while the Son was a created being, he is the first and highest of all God's creations, the being who created the rest of creation. Arius's bishop, Alexander, believed like Arius that the primary distinction between the Father and the Son was that the Father was unbegotten, but the Son begotten. Unlike Arius, though, Alexander believed the Son had always existed and was merely brought forth by the Father. And so this created some friction. And it led to this synod that Alexander called. The synod condemned Arius, but it didn't really stop anything because they had to have the Council of Nicaea. Now, what happened here? There are no surviving minutes or records or acts of the Council that were taken while it was happening. There are some primary sources, though, so that we know, you know, not completely, but in, to a large degree what happened. There was the creed with the list of those who signed it. That has survived. The Nicene Creed, you've probably all read it or recited it before, and the list of those who signed it. Twenty canons or rules which the bishops passed, by the way, none of them have Constantine or the Council deciding on which books get in the New Testament. That is a complete fabrication in the Da Vinci Code. Nicaea had nothing to do with that. Nowhere shows up in, the, in any of the canons. The synodal letter sent out to the churches telling them that the Council was going to be held, that has survived. Later letters written by Eusebius and Athanasius who were present at the time. Eusebius was a bishop of Caesarea and a voting member. Athanasius was basically just a secretary but he turns out to be a pivotal figure in the whole proceeding. It is unknown exactly how many bishops attended the council. Sources differ in the numbers given. Eustathius of Antioch says about 270 attended. Eusebius says 250. Athanasius first says 300, and in a later piece of writing, 318. The number 318 is probably mythological because it's based on Genesis 14.14. 14. So scholars kind of look at 318 and say, nah, he's being poetic or allegorical here. Basically, somewhere between 250 and 300. That's how many were there. 
The council opened with a speech by Constantine in which he pleaded with the bishops to establish peace among themselves. The extent of Constantine's participation in the debates themselves is unknown. Eusebius tends to put more emphasis on Constantine's involvement than Constantine does in his own letters related to the council. And there's a source if you want to go look up those letters, see what they say, you can check them out. It was very obvious that the overwhelming weight of opinion was against Arius and his views. The majority view was view number one, noted before, that Jesus and God were the same essence, both eternal and uncreated, and were distinct persons. Now, Eusebius was sympathetic to Arius's view but couldn't support it. He didn't really want him kicked out of his position. So Eusebius and others proposed a creed, which was used in Eusebius' church later on. This was a scriptural creed, basically drawing its language from Bible verses, which agreed with the traditions and confessions of faith in all the churches. Everyone could have signed this creed. Everyone at the council, including Arius, could have signed this creed. We have this creed from Eusebius. Everyone could have done it, but it wouldn't have solved the problem. They would have just had to have another council. And so this creed did not work. Uh, it was adopted by the bishops at Nicaea, or the, the creed that was finally adopted by the bishops of Nicaea was a different one. So they say, nice idea, Eusebius. We appreciate the spirit in which you've recommended this creed, but it's just not going to solve the problem. We don't want to have to meet again, and so they voted it down. Now, the creed they produced, they put language in it to ensure that Arius would either have to change his position or would not be able to sign it, because that was the issue. The non-scriptural word was inserted as the centerpiece of the creed. It was the word homoousios, which means of the same substance. This word replaced homoousios in the other creed, which meant of similar substance. Arius could have signed that one. He could not have signed homo usios, of the father and the son were of the same essence. Okay, so they changed that word. It's kind of interesting. If you look at the word, there's only one letter difference. <laughs> you know, one letter made all the difference in the world as far as the council was concerned. <clears throat> the creed, therefore, asserted that the son was of the same essence as the father. Athanasius wrote that the bishops wanted to express their faith in scriptural language, but the Arians kept twisting the words of scripture so they would support their own views. So they, they abandoned trying to have every line of the creed come out of a verse. And they said, look, we're going to have to put extra biblical language in this thing to, to make sure it articulates what we're saying and so that Arius will either have to change his view or just not sign it. And so that's what they did. The creed also defines the son as begotten and not made. Now, remember when Tebing said, Yes, the deity of Christ was decided upon by a vote, and a very close vote indeed. Yeah, two or three of the bishops that we know were there didn't sign it. Remember there were 200, between 250 and 300 there? That is not a close vote. What, 248 to 2? It's just not a close vote. It's just, it's, you know, I don't know how else to say it. It's just disinformation uh, at that level, in that part of it, that part of the book. Constantine in the New Testament. The Council of Nicaea in and of itself had nothing to do with determining which books got in the New Testament. Again, none of the canons even mention this. The assertion that Constantine had a hand in the determination of what Gospels or New Testament books the church was to use is actually based, you know, when I say it's based on this letter, Trust me, if you read Bajent and Lee and these other people, they're going to they're gonna link it to Constantine, for which there's no evidence. There is a letter in another context where Constantine uh, writes to Eusebius. And in the letter, Constantine says that the large numbers of people in Constantinople, the capital, were becoming Christians. And he wanted the number of churches there to be multiplied. I want to start some other churches, he says. To meet the need of this expansion of churches in the city, Constantine asked Eusebius to prepare 50 copies of Scripture to be used, quote, for the instruction of the church. The only specific instructions Constantine gives Eusebius, and again, we have the letter, for these copies is that they, quote, be written on prepared parchment in a legible manner and in a convenient portable form 
by professional transcribers thoroughly practiced in their art, unquote. The rest of the letter deals with issues of payment for the materials and the delivery of the copies. The emperor asked that the copies be delivered to himself for his personal inspection upon completion. He never says, these are the books that you need to put in or these are the books that you need to take out. He never says it. And as we did in session, I believe it was number two, we talked about early witnesses, early lists of the canonical books, the claim that Constantine fiddles with and fixes the canon is just false. There is no primary source evidence for that view. It just doesn't exist. Now, again, to summarize, that's all I want to cover about Constantine. This one was a little bit shorter. Constantine was involved at Nicaea. We don't know the extent. It had nothing to do with fixing the books of the canon. The issue was about how to declare what the majority view had already formulated, had already uh, adopted as the correct view of how to view Jesus' relation to the Father. They could see the passages that I gave you in the last session where you have a Godhead they linked that to Jesus as the Son. The difficulty was, how do we express that? How do we talk about two persons, same Yahweh, but two Yahwehs, same essence, Father, Son, language, and be monotheists? How do we get that down and express it in a formulaic way so that we don't have to keep fighting over this issue? And so they met with Nicaea to specifically discuss with Arius. Arius never produced anything that convinced more than two or three people that he was right. He was outvoted at least 248 to 2. It was not a close vote. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, let's take a few minutes and we will come back for number seven. Okay, number seven uh, session for today. This is one I just wanted to have a little bit of fun with, and it's designed to be a little shorter. The conspiratorial logic of the Da Vinci Code and Jesus' bloodline theorists. You know, up until this point, it's been a lot of nuts and bolts, a lot of this text says this, this text says that. And again, I, my style is, I know it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but I try to give you the primary sources give you good secondary sources so that you can check up on me. You know I'm not making it up. Just go and look. Uh, you know, that, that's what we're all supposed to do. For this one, though, I, I wanted something, when I, when I sat down and I thought about this, I, I wanted something that would be a little lighter, but I think equally important, and that is to talk a little bit about what you, the reader, the recipient of Dan Brown's work, and especially his sources again, Michael Bage and uh, Richard Lee and Henry Lincoln, and of course, Picknett and Prince and other writers. What are they asking you to believe? When it really comes down to it, how are they asking your mind to work? And I want to go through and make a few logic statements that illustrate to you what you really have to believe, how do you really have to think to accept what they're giving you? And I've titled it Conspiratorial Logic of the Da Vinci Code, or <laughs> How Finding People in the Publishing Industry Who Can't Think Critically Will Pave Your Way to a Bestseller, or How Speaking in a British Accent Masks Non Sequitur Arguments. And that is particularly aimed at Michael Bajant, again, not Dan Brown. Bajant is, I think, the leading person here who really tries, <laughs> really tries to put one over on us. Of course, this is not Michael Bajant, Henry Lincoln, and Richard Lee. Frankly, we would do better with the lone gunman. But I want to take a look at what they do and consider it all as one big non sequitur. What is a non sequitur? 
Latin, of course, that means it does not follow a statement that does not logically follow from what preceded it. Or put another way, a conclusion that does not follow from the preceding premises. And let's go through a few examples. Here's what they want you to accept. Ask yourself, for all of these, does this make sense? If a document is old, it must be true. Is that true? Oh, but we were told right here on the front cover, the discovery of the gospel of Judas is astonishing. This will change the way we all look at Christianity. Now, to say that, and of course, in respect to the gospel of Judas, what they really are saying is that since we found this new gospel that's really old, and of course it's not as old as the New Testament, but we found it so that gives it validity. It's just not logical. If a newly discovered document disagrees with previously known documents, it must be true. Does that make any sense? This is what they're saying, though. The Nag Hammadi material disagreed with the New Testament material. We, you know, the Nag Hammadi stuff must be right. It contains the truth. It contains the unaltered story. What they're really saying when they say that is this. If a newly discovered document disagrees with the ones we know before, must be true. Documents which exist in only a few copies must have been suppressed. Well, there aren't many of these Nag Hammadi Gospels, or there's only one of the Gospel of Judas, or it took us this long to find it. That's proof that the, the evil Orthodox Church must have been suppressing and destroying all these other ones. Does that make any sense? Must that necessarily and logically follow? No, it is a non sequitur. By the way, exploring that logic, Herodotus, the history, Thucydides, look how many copies. Eight, eight, seven. Here we get down to one partial, 19 for Livy, 20 for Tacitus, Pliny, seven. This is an old figure now. The New Testament's pushing 6,000 now. But the point, of course, is that there's no evidence that if something like Plato only exists in seven copies, that anyone was out there destroying the other ones. It's a non sequitur. It does not follow. It is not coherent thinking. If, a doc if document A and document B are about the same person, the document farthest removed from that person's time must be true. Well, the New Testament Gospels and the Nag Hammadi Gospels are about Jesus, and the Nag Hammadi Gospels are older, but those are the ones that are true. Again, does it make any sense? Does it necessarily follow? No. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to reduce their claims to just simple propositions. That you can see the illogic and the muddled thinking that must be embraced to think this way, the way they want you to think. If the, con if the content of a document about a religious issue is controversial, it must be true. The Gospel of Judas will change everything. They're implying, of course, that that's the real one. Why? Because, well, it's, it doesn't say what all the other ones say, and it's really controversial. That must be the truth. It must have just been suppressed. Come on. The opinion of the majority in a religious issue must be wrong and must have been arrived at in a power struggle. I mean, it's just inconceivable that a lot of people, the majority, could have actually agreed peaceably. And that's how the majority formed. Why is that inconceivable? Again, if you accept the conspiratorial thinking, this is what you're asked to affirm. If one person who believes something behaves badly, 
then most or even all of the people who share that belief would approve of that behavior or behave the same way. Well, we know that there were early church fathers, early Christians, who didn't have nice things to say about the role of women. That must mean that most Christians think that way and that this characterizes the church. That must mean that Gnosticism you know, is, is just the way to go because they had so much of a more enlightened view. Just because one person thinks one thing and that one person is a member of a group does not mean that everyone else in the group thinks the same thing. How simple and elementary can it be? But this is what you're asked to believe. You're asked to swallow this. A person or group of persons who behave badly can't be correct, especially when it comes to religious truth. So what we're saying here is that we can judge the veracity of an idea by virtue of the way a person behaves. Is that necessarily true? No. He or she could just be a dork. But the dork might actually be right on whatever given issue it is. Okay, we all know dorky people who get things right. You, know, you and I might be among them. <laughs> I can speak with authority on this one. Anyone who opposes an idea has an ax to grind. There can't be any substance to what he or she is saying. So if I object to the idea, let's say, that the Nag Hammadi Gospels are unaltered truth, if I object to that, I must have an ax to grind. I really can't be saying that because of historical records and circumstances. Surely, the majority view, the Orthodox you know, Christians, surely they had an ax to grind, and that's why things turned out the way they did. Again, this is so clearly incoherent, but this is exactly what you're asked to believe. People in power cannot be trusted when they say something is true. Therefore, people not in power can be trusted when they say something is true. Right? Well, I'm sure we all know this by life experience, don't we? It's just silly. How about this one? God approves of everything in the Bible. Does he? Aren't there bad things recorded in the Bible? Well, of course. Does that mean God approves of everything? Or is it just describing the way things are? or the way things were? Does it have to have some blessing pronounced upon it just because it's in the Bible? No. Everything in the Bible is prescriptive, they want us to believe. That means it's prescribed, it's, it's doctrine, it's, what you ought, it's the way you ought to think. Nothing in the Bible can be just describing things. No, we can't have that. You know, frankly, this, all this charge of patriarchal culture needs to be adjusted just a little bit because in many cases, descriptions of patriarchal culture in the Bible are just that. They are descriptions. This is the way people lived. This is the way people thought. It is not laid down as thus says the Lord, you should look at a woman this way. And again, I'm not saying that the older New Testament is the 20th century, or the 21st century. I'm not saying that at all. Okay, I will say it's better than that it, than it has been characterized by the Da Vinci Code crowd, and that this kind of logic is what is driving a lot of their criticism. If something hasn't happened in recorded history, it never happened. Put the resurrection in this one. Well, you know, the only place that's written about is the New Testament. We don't, we're not going to count that. So since we're not going to count that, there's no record of anything else like that, so it must never have happened. Well, thanks. You've just claimed omniscience. You know, I wish I was omniscient. Data and evidence are the same thing. 
See, data is something like the Gospel of Philip, this reference to Jesus kissing, you know, whatever you know, he kissed. That's a data point. That's a thing which exists that we need to study and think about. It's not evidence of any particular thing yet. That's why we have to think about it. It's just data, right? Evidence and proof are the same thing, are they? Ask a lawyer. Evidence just is. It can be a physical object. It can be a statement. It can be an event. It doesn't constitute proof of anything. Evidence has to be put in context and hopefully lots of data points and lots of evidence are put into the same context so that a picture emerges so that we can draw a conclusion that is quote unquote beyond a reasonable doubt, which means to draw any other conclusion you'd look kind of stupid. Right? That's all that means. But evidence and data and proof are not the same things. But if you read Bajent and Lee's and Lincoln's book, they think just because they found a question or they found a statement somewhere in some book, they will often take it, rip it out, and show it to you in isolation and claim that the data point is now proof of what they want to argue. Meanwhile, they've excluded a whole lot of other data points that would give this one context. And we've seen that today, especially with the discussion on women, especially with the discussion on Jesus as a divine being, especially in relation to the discussion of the New Testament canon. They are notorious for this. Taking one data point, ripping it out, orphaning it, showing it to you, and pretending that it's proof to the exclusion of lots of other stuff. But this is the way that you're asked to think. If a field or discipline accepts something as fact, then it probably isn't true. And they probably have sinister reasons for taking that position. Again, just real life demonstrates the silliness of the approach. Discovery of new information means that all old information is invalidated. This is what they want you to believe with respect to the Gospels and the manuscripts and all this. Again, what I'm trying to do is reduce their claims to the propositions that they want you to embrace. Discovery of new data means the new data is more reliable and factually trustworthy than the older data. On what grounds? Well, we just didn't know it before, so now we know something different and that must be true. No one in ancient times wrote with an agenda. Only modern people do that. I could say no one in ancient times except the New Testament writers wrote with an agenda. Like the people who wrote the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of Philip or the Gospel of Tom, they didn't have an agenda. No, 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 no. That would never have happened. All the Nag Hammadi material is agenda free material, just the facts. What bubble were those guys living in? No one with a minority viewpoint in ancient times ever wrote to take a shot at the majority opinion. Only modern people do that. Just a few quotes here uh, that, you know, again, to me, summarize the whole situation. Like I said, I wanted to have a little fun with this one. An education isn't how much you have committed to memory or even how much you know. It's being able to differentiate between what you do know and what you don't. That is an honest handling of evidence, an, an honest handling of material. That is the point of scholarship. Uh, whether Brown sources like to hear it or not, this is what scholars are supposed to do, to try to determine what we can say and what we can't and to put things really in probability scales. Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. <laughs> Churchill's just wonderful. <laughs> uh, this one kind of speaks for itself. Uh, some, of these, some of these writers, I, I will go as far to say that 
they probably know where the truth is and they want to avoid it because they don't want to stumble over it. Postmodernists believe that truth is myth and myth truth. This equation has its roots in pop psychology. The same people also believe that emotions are a form of reality. There used to be another name for this state of mind. It used to be called psychosis. <laughs> Brad Holland is an artist. Um, don't know too much about him, but I thought this is pretty profound. And this one we have in our office. The work of scholars is not for sissies. Now, some of you are familiar with Donker. Donker is a famous lexicographer and Greek and early church historian. And frankly, I have this here because I really like the quote because I get to look at it all the time. And also to say that if the people, the sources behind what Brown is writing and perpetuating, again, he to me is not the bad guy. If these guys are not willing to do the grunt work and to look at the texts and give you all the data, they're not only sissies, they're ax grinding sissies. Okay. This is not easy stuff. It is mind-numbing on occasion, but it's important. Just trying to give the data and be honest with it and think about it. Again, non sequitur, a conclusion that does not follow from the preceding premises. And Shakespeare's quote, I think, is a good way to wrap this up. An empty vessel makes the greatest sound. And I think that's what we have in this case. You know, just lacks substance that could be given to the public and still tell a really cool story. But there is apparently an agenda that is being propelled, at least at this point. And maybe it's as simple as, hey, I like being rich. <laughs> maybe it's something deeper than that. I don't know. Questions? I can move right into number eight. Go ahead. I was listening to... Uh Gnosis.com or whatever, and they had lectures on there by Dr. Holler. Heller? Yeah. And his, uh, his intro to Gnosticism, by the way, is really good. I was fascinated yeah. by what I listened to. And, uh, He's a Gnostic, by the way. Good yes. Good. Yeah, I, I gathered that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that he said from my notes is there, I think there is inherent, and I can't find it right off here, but there's an inherent an inherent necessity to rebel against law and structure and the laws like the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. Torah, because since it originated in a, from an inferior uh, being, eon, right. that it it's is necessary for us to rebel against it because it is a means of repressing mm -hmm. us. And that rebellion if I have the right word, seems really to permeate all of the logic, every, all the, it reminds me of the 70s when, um, you know, all the institution was bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it just seems to be in, in every part of uh, the literature and your, your quotes, of course, certainly have the, that to them. No, I, I, would, I would agree. I think it's a rebellion against, it's a rebellion against coherence. But that doesn't mean it's the desire to sound stupid. It's not that at all. It, it, it's that I, I know what I want to believe, and even if it's not coherent, I'm still going to believe it because I prefer it over this over here. And you know, who, who knows why people make such choices? I mean, I'm willing to think that a lot of it you know, maybe is the church's fault. You know, people are, are victimized in some way and they go another direction regardless of how, how silly the thinking process is that takes them there. But I, I tend to agree that a lot of it is just rebellion. Uh, I don't really know what motivates it. And, I, and I'm willing to say that, you know, I, I don't really find myself too much as part of, a, of a, an institutionalized church. I mean, I, I go to a church that's in a denomination, but I, I frankly never think in those terms because I don't think that's what's important. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not here to perpetuate the livelihood of a particular denomination. Um, but that being said, you know, there is this sense of, of not wanting any, any sort of check and balance on, on thinking and, 
I don't know else, what else you'd call that. Yeah, I, I think that there is, there is an element of that for sure. Another question? Yes, Ted. Yeah, I had one. Uh, back to Nicaea, um, those 300 people that were there, or 300 or so people, who were they? I mean, were they local you know, kings of the area? Or who, no, they, were, they were the cardinals and bishops? Yeah, they were, they were, the, they were the bishops that were, were solicited. I mean, basically the call went out you know, all through the empire. We're going to have this council at Nicaea, XYZ date. You know, you're invited to come. Some did, some didn't. But they're basically ecclesiastical people, people in position of you know, various positions of the church. Yes? We obviously had some scholarship of uh, a great deal of depth back in the early church in thinking of concepts that uh, pretty much outpace what's in the thought structure of today. What's happened to that type of scholarship and higher level of thought in our quote unquote relig religious? Uh, institutions and hierarchy. <laughs> yeah, I'm having one of these moments of what I should say and what I want to say. <laughs> um, in, in an attempt to be nice, I think part of the problem is a general, the only circles I can really speak for are, are what I have seen in Protestant evangelicalism. And I think that because of, for, for historical reasons, namely the late 19th century on, when you had the rise of Darwinism, and Darwinism as a school of thought permeated the institutions of higher learning and created what became known as the fundamentalist controversies and debates of the early 20th century, that there, that produced an inherent or a systemic suspicion of higher education because the universities were the places that were cranking out Darwinism. And you know, it's not just Darwinism, but it's you know, 19th century German philosophy and the things that, were, that, that worked well with a Darwinist scheme you know, Darwinist perspective of reality. And, and the, the church was sort of blindsided by this and began to look at institutions of higher learning as just, these are just intellectually speaking dens of iniquity and, and people who go off and, and, and get higher education come out corrupt and, and they don't believe, you know, the faith. And they're just, be, it really created an, an, an atmosphere of anti-intellectualism that, is still evident to some degree uh, within what, what today would be called fundamentalism, even though that's, I don't want to mischaracterize it because fundamentalists tend to, they, they start their own institutions and they have PhDs like everybody else. But it, in the mid to early 20th century, you just started to get a very anti-intellectual tide within the church. That's one issue. Uh, the other issue, I think, being a little less nice, is just frankly laziness. Uh, we just seem, especially in our culture, to prefer being entertained over thinking. And a lot of what's in the culture in reinforces that. Um, you know, it's the old nerd complex, you know, where if, if you're not going to go off and essentially, you know, party and just really be alive to have fun, if you, if you want to be serious, you know, what, what's the problem with you? kind of thing. In, in the modern church, we just have instances where, I mean, I've actually had Christians come up to me and ask me why I've wasted my life uh, studying the Bible. You know, you're, you're smart, Mike. You could have been a doctor or a lawyer. What are you doing doing this? You could have made a lot of money. I've actually had people tell me that and ask me that. Um, th there is an anti-intellectualism there. I think it's a worldliness that, that we, we tend to look at, at ourselves vocationally for how much money we can accumulate, how much wealth we can accumulate. We are too lazy to want to be intellectually stimulated because it's not going to lead to a profit, at least as we can perceive it. 
I, I think you have all sorts of forces that are, that are intertwined and combined uh, within the church to, to perpetuate an anti-intellectual stance. Um, I'm, not, and I'm trying not to make a too sweeping of a generalization because I know lots of Christians with PhDs in all sorts of fields that really care you know, about learning and, and you know, sciences or humanities or whatever. But, but the lay community, people like you are the unusual ones. I hope you realize that. Um, to, to me, you know, having you know, a, a lay person uh, or someone who, who has no, you know, who maybe didn't go to grad school, just the, the average person, you know, you, you get into adulthood and it's like, man, I want to learn lots of stuff. I just find it interesting. I'd rather go read this book than go watch American Idol. I mean, that's wonderful, you know, to meet people like that. I've had grandmas in their 60s order my dissertation from my website. And they'll tell me, I don't know Hebrew or Greek, but I've read everything else on your website and this is what's left. I mean, I, I wish we had more of that, but the, the reality is we don't. And I don't think, I think it's because it's just not valued, because it, it's, not, it's not a money thing. I think the church is, is just very worldly. I mean, I don't, I don't know any, any other way to say it. I think it's misplaced priorities. I think churches should make their pastors be theologians and hire theologians on staff. That's the way it used to be. You know, theologians aren't exciting, but the church rises or falls on, on their backs. You know, speaking outside of Providence now. But it's because of guys like Athanasius who attended the Council of Nicaea as a lowly secretary that we have the Nicene Creed. You know, because he saw through the issues very clearly and articulated, you know, said what needed to be said because he had, he had the, the, the intellectual bandwidth to do it. You know, he wasn't alone by any means. You know, you probably read some, quite a bit of the early church fathers' writings, just in reading. They're I mean, amazing guys. Oh, the thought process is like, whoa. I mean, you really got certain. Out, outside of serious, serious Catholicism and maybe Anglicanism, the, the fathers have just been neglected everywhere. Now, I, I will say one thing uh, and, and give credit to where credit's due. Uh, InterVarsity Press, which is predominantly uh, selling books to the evangelical midstream commentary, which is a book-by-book -book commentary from the church fathers on every book of the Bible. Uh, that plus the church, father writing, church father's writings themselves, I think, are a step in the right direction. We're, we're sensitive to that, too, at Logos. We, we license InterVarsity stuff for electronic use. It's, it's wonderful to be able to search it because th these guys were just, you know, you could, you could, you know, you'd probably have to replace any one of them with three or four other people now that have PhDs. You know, it, they, they were just really amazing people. Any kind of evolution in the thought process doesn't stand up when you, yeah. when you put the majority next to them. You, just, uh, you, you know, know. I, I know, I know guys who you know who do doctoral work in philosophical theology, and that's that you're doing a lot of stuff with the fathers there. But that's that's even rarer than a guy who goes into Semitic languages like me, because it's the old well. If you go and study philosophy, all you're going to do is flip burgers or drive a cab never thinking that maybe we should send this guy to grad school to be a, a philosophical theologian and hire him on staff and have him actually write things for the lay audience so that they learn how to think again. I'm not, un, I'm not naive enough to think that's going to happen. But that, that used to be the norm. Another question? Okay, well, let's break just a minute or two and do the last thing. Today is, I thought I would add something about the Gospel of Judas since this is current in the news. And I got the title from a friend of mine, uh, Work Jumping the Shark <laughs> from the Newsroom to the Ivory Tower, Assessing the Gospel of Judas Frenzy. And what I mean by that is, hey, practically everybody, even in the scholarly community, you have people who are just sort of 
getting swept up in the media frenzy, at least scholars who are media noticed, people like Elaine Pagels and Bart Ehrman, uh, are just sort of exaggerating, not sort of, they are exaggerating, the whole Gospel of Judas thing. And in my estimation, they have jumped the shark. If you're not familiar with the term, I'll say a little bit, a little bit about it later. But let's just jump into what the Gospel of Judas is. If you've been on another planet over the last month or so, uh, this is for you. Of course, the Gospel of Judas is a Gnostic, Coptic document. The National Geographic Society uh, put together a team once this document was recovered, and frankly, it has a very shady lineage when it comes to how people got it, how the National Geographic Society got a hold of it, who had it before then, and how did they get it and pass it around. But it is another one of these Gnostic Gospels uh, that we're familiar with in other contexts, specifically Nag Hammadi. This is what the Gospel of Judas looked like as it was retrieved from the cardboard box in which it was kept. Uh, it, was, it actually was, was kept in cold storage for a while, uh, according to the story, which really damaged it. It caused deterioration of the ink. And somebody, one of, one of its owners thought that if you like froze it, it would help it. But uh, just didn't prove to be the case. So <laughs> you, know, you can see in this picture the ink leaching through from the other side and tattered there. About the project, in order to be certain of the age and its authenticity, the National Geographic Society, again, put it through a whole round of tests. If you go to the National Geographic Society website from which this is taken, you can view profiles of the contributors to the project, those guys who were on the, the team, which was kept secret uh, for quite some time, to put it together physically, uh, to translate it, and, of course, to try to deduce some meaning out of it. Profiles here on this page, I'm uh, not reproducing all of these, of course. Some of these are familiar if you've read. Uh, Bart Ehrman publishes a lot on the popular seminary or semi-popular level. Uh, Bart teaches at uh, NC State, I believe. This guy down here, uh, the reason I have this page is I do want to draw your attention to Craig Evans. Uh, Craig teaches in Canada, the Acadia Divinity School in Nova Scotia. Uh, again, I, I got to meet him last year. Uh, just a wonderful guy. This is a picture of him. He was on, you know, as I providentially found out, he was on this team and asked him to be uh, a guest on Coast to Coast. And, and their producers thought it was a wonderful idea and he did a good job. Notice what Craig says. This is an article from a, a newspaper called The Chronicle. It's a Canadian paper. Right here, Judas is a second century Gnostic text. He said, referring to the Christian sect announced as heretical by the church as early as 180 AD. It has an axe to grind and it grinds it. Okay? He's very honest. Uh, Craig has author, authored over 50 books, authored or edited, I should say. Uh, one, of the, one of the bigger names in New Testament studies. And Craig is, uh, he, would, he would be comfortable calling himself an evangelical uh, scholar. Very, very well respected in the scholarly community. Let's face it, folks, you're not going to get on this team if you're a hack. Okay? This was a big deal to get selected here. Frequently asked questions. Now, I refer to you uh, to the top one and the last one. You will see this term thrown around, Codex Chaikos. The Codex is an ancient book consisting of folded pages and so on and so forth. It's called that because of this line right here is named after Demat Demaratus Chaikos, father of the Zoric-based antiquities dealer Frida Nussberger. Now, Nussberger Chaikos, you can, you can get some description on these people. I, I don't know if I want to necessarily, I can't endorse necessarily the website, but there, if you put these names into a website, into a browser with Gospel of Judas, you're going to come across you know, some websites that detail um, fairly explicitly uh, how this thing changed hands. And this would make a good Robert Ludlum novel because you have this thing spent a lot of time in the seedy underworld of the 
uh, arts and archaeology um, acquiring community. Uh, basically those people who like to steal antiquities <laughs> and pass them on. Now this is from a blog on the Gospel of Judas, the unsettling conclusion. The Robinson contribution. Robinson here is James Robinson, the guy who was put in charge of translating the Nag Hammadi Gospels into English, forming that team. And it seems that Robinson has had some role to play in the surfacing of this gospel. Robinson used to be a reformed evangelical Protestant pastor. He is now basically a Gnostic. Uh, I, I don't know him. Uh, I, I know a friend of his uh, who used to be a colleague of his, in fact. And basically what, you, what Evan said of the Gospel of Judas, you can say of James Robinson. He has an ax to grind and he grinds it. Uh, you can look up his role in this on the web, uh, going to this blog, Ecthesis. The lower page of this is about this fellow Farini in here, who is one of the central figures, it, it, it appears, with how the Gospel of Judas surfaced. Uh, it, it gets kind of bizarre because the, the current state of this is that this codex actually contained four books. The Gospel of Judas was one of them. There are three other books, portions of which are in this, in this codex. Um, that means that there's a question to be answered. Does Mr. Farini still retain the missing parts of the codex? If so, how much? There, ha there have been things in the, in the recent past that have appeared on eBay associated with Mr. Farini that some suspect might be part of this codex, <laughs> believe it or not. It's like everything winds up on eBay. Uh, but this, if you're going to follow the Gospel of Judas story, this is a, a figure that you should keep your eye on. And if you go to the New Testament blogs, there are several good ones. They're, they will keep you up to date on it. Uh, the Gospel of Judas, again, the mysterious case of Mr. Bruce Farini and others, is detailing, again, his relationship in this. I'm not going to spend too much time on this at all. Uh, was the Gospel of Judas known to scholars? Well, the answer is yeah. Uh, Irenaeus mentions this. He doesn't quote from the Gospel of Judas. Irenaeus, writing in about 180 A.D., mentions that there is this book that some have referred to as the Gospel of Judas. I put this here because this is a, a blog that one of my friends uh, writes about jumping the shark. And I, my illustration here is this quotation right here. This is from Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is a scholar, uh, New Testament studies. And this is the kind of thing that, I, that to me personally, is a concern when it comes to the Gospel of Judas. How many of you have read the Gospel of Judas by now? Anybody? Okay. I, I have it up here on the screen. We, we, you know, we can flip through parts of it. I'm not going to just read the whole thing. It's not that long. But they are really making much ado about, I won't say nothing, but next to nothing. And you have this quote by guys like Bart Ehrman. We aren't sure when this Gospel was written. The copy in our possession appears to date from the end of the third century around 280 or so, 250 years after Jesus' death. <clears throat> but that doesn't tell us when the book was originally composed. In the case of the Gospel of Mark, for example, we don't have any surviving copies until after the 3rd century. But Mark, most likely the first of the canonical Gospels to be written, was almost certainly composed by 65 or 70. Do you see what he's just done? He's saying, well, Mark, you know, we don't have copies of Mark until the 300s, and we know that that was written around 65 or 70. Okay, there's our logical construct. Now we'll plug in, well, the Gospel of Judas is around 300, and maybe it works the same way. Maybe that's as old as the Gospel of Mark. It's just patently illogical. This is the kind of logic I was illustrating in the last session. And my friend here catches Bart on it. He says, holy non sequitur, Batman. <laughs> One leaves the paragraph thinking that it's possible Judas was written at the same time Ehrman postulates for Mark. 
65 or 70. He leaves the comparison to Mark hanging in the last sentence of the paragraph, seemingly implying, though not really, that Judas is similar. A careless reader could easily connect the lingering dots and think, well, if that happened with Mark, why not Judas? Ehrman's quotation comes from this book. If you don't have this, this is the one that the National Geographic Society is selling on their website. It's sort of the hurry up version to get it out before the Da Vinci Code movie. They're actually working on a more substantial book, a more academic uh, book about the Gospel of Judas. But this is nice light reading. And Ehrman has a chapter in this about you know, the meaning of the Gospel of Judas for Christianity. And he has this quote in there. It just, it's just very poor thinking. And when guys like Bart Ehrman come out with this, this will show up, and it has already showed up, on lots of New Testament blogs, basically saying, come on, Bart. You know, you, you just like the limelight too much. And it's drawing some negative publicity for Dr. Ehrman. Another example of a blog is the Gospel of Judas Troubling. This blog is called Ralph the Sacred River. It's kind of an odd, you know, whimsical title. The originator is Edward Cook. Edward Cook is an Aramaic specialist who, I don't, I, he might still be there at the Hebrew University in Cincinnati. Um, Hebrew, Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, but he writes here about the Gospel of Judas. And you know, as far as, I don't know if Edward Cook has any theological commitments at all. He says, all right, here we go. Sigh, with another Gnostic Gospel alert. How the public, now the publication today of the Gospel of Judas is providing tons of grist for the junk scholarship mill. Again, lots of scholars are just not buying that this is just this earth-shattering revelation. Here's what the New York Times has to say about this and other Gnostic Gospels. And then he has the quote. And if you look at his comment down here, the utter inability of the New York Times to understand the import of this discovery is just amazing. I'm giving you quotations like this again just to make the point that the scholarly community, there are two communities. There's the scholarly community, the people who do this stuff. And they're frankly like, oh, wow, this is cool. This is kind of interesting. But it's not earth shattering. Then there's the group over here, the interested layperson who wants to find out about this, but the sources they use just aren't that great because they're using popular media sources, again, like the New York Times or People Magazine or something like that. I mean, at least they're learning something, but the people who write those articles are not specialists. They're not even close to being specialists. And so they're getting, most of the public are just, is just getting bad information, which is a shame because my view is, if people, the average person, wants to know about this, this will get people talking about the New Testament, it'll get people talking about the Bible. And this, this is, in and of itself, is a good thing. Uh, but, boy, I wish they would get better information. And so the scholarly community has just not been kind to the media frenzy, but the, you know, the, the popular audience is like, wow, this is just earth-shattering. Here is the Gospel of Judas. This is from the PDF uh, translation that the National Geographic Society has on their page. You can download this for free. You can't download the book for free, but you can at least get the translation. Uh, your title, your, your editorial team, your copyright notice. Uh, I don't know how much of this I really uh, want to read. There are a few spots that are kind of interesting. Let's just go down here to, by the way, when it says scene, this is not in the text. This is just the way the editors have divided up the material. So down here, this is manuscript material. It says, one day Jesus, he, Jesus, was with his disciples in Judea, and he found them gathered together and seated in pious observance. When he approached his disciples, and there's, you know, he approached his disciples gathered together and seated and offering a prayer of thanksgiving over the bread, he laughed. Jesus does a lot of laughing in the gospel of Judas for some reason. Uh, the disciples said to him, Master, why are you laughing at our prayer of thanksgiving? We have done what is right. And he answered and said to them, I'm not laughing at you. You are not doing this because of your own will, but because it is through this that your God will be praised. That's kind of an odd phrasing. Remember, think like a Gnostic. Think like a Gnostic. Who is their God? The disciples are Jewish. Who is their God? The Demiurge. It's not Jesus' God. Jesus is an aeon. He's above the Demiurge. 
So Jesus is actually very cutting in the Gospel of Judas to all the disciples. It's really very condescending uh, in, in the way it reads. But, you know, you can get it for yourself and read it. He said, Master, you are the son of our God. And Jesus said to them, how do you know me? Truly I say to you, no generation of the people that are among you will know me. Throughout the whole thing, he's sort of flirting with them intellectually and just, oh, you guys don't know squat. You know, you know. I mean, it's, it's just very, it's, it's almost mean in places. It's kind of unusual. Uh, Jesus speaks to Judas privately, knowing that Judas was reflecting upon something that was exalted. Uh, let, let me go back up to this, this thing about Barbello. Um, let's see. Judas said to him, I know who you are. And where you've come from, you are from the immortal realm of Barbalo, and I am not worthy to utter the name of the one who has sent you. Now, I'm going to park here just a second because this is another evidence that Jesus was more than a man from a Gnostic text. Barbello is, is Gnostic lingo for the ultimate god of the Pleroma. It, it mean, it, it's scholar, Gnostic scholars and Coptic scholars think that it comes from a Hebrew word which is be arba el, which means in or with the four el. El was the name of the God of Israel. The four is the tetragrammaton, the divine name, the four letters. And so this is their way of referring to um, you know, the ultimate God. They don't want to call him, in their mind, it's not Yahweh, even though they're using the four letters, because Yahweh is the fool. He's the chaotic, created monster thing from Sophia. They're using a lot of terminology you would, you would be familiar with from your Old Testament. And they, Gnostics like to use it of the ultimate God who is you know, the, the core of the Pleroma. So that's what the reference is there. But he says, you're from the immortal realm of Barbalo, okay? You're from the Pleroma. You're one of these eons. Judas says, I know who you are. And of course, Jesus, you know, Gives him some cryptic response, but he also gives him some encouraging response later. Let's flip ahead here a little bit. Uh, you have here an interesting dream that the disciples have. Let's go back up here. At the very bottom, the disciples see the temple and discuss it. They have a dream. They said, we have seen a great house with a large altar in it and 12 men. They are the priests, we would say, and a name... And a crowd of people is waiting at that altar until the priest, and then there's a gap, and receive the offerings. But we kept waiting. And Jesus said, what are the priests like? They said, some, and there's a gap, two weeks. Just, the text doesn't, doesn't survive. Some sacrifice their own children, others their wives, in praise and humility with each other. Some sleep with men. Some are involved in slaughter. Some commit a multitude of sins and deeds of lawlessness. And the men who stand before the altar invoke your name. And in all the deeds of their deficiency, the sacrifices are brought to completion. After they said this, they were quiet, for they were troubled. Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? Truly I say to you, all the priests who stand before that altar invoke my name. Again I say to you, my name has been written on this blank of the generations of the stars to the human generations. And they have planted trees without fruit in my name in a shameful matter. Jesus said to them, those you have seen receiving the offerings at the altar, that's who you are. Now, I remember Craig saying on the show, and I've since read, this section, and it goes down below here, has a very anti-Semitic feel to it because it's very critical of Jewish offerings and the priesthood. And Jesus goes as far as to say, that's who you guys are. You're Jews. Again, this isn't the kind, of, the kind of flavor you get from one of the New Testament Gospels, but it's very typical of Gnosticism. Because Why? Because the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jew, is the Demiurge. He's evil. He's the fool. He's Saklos, the blind one. He's the enemy because he doesn't want us to know that we have the spark of divinity in us. So they're very critical of Judaism. You know, Jesus isn't, isn't a normal mortal Jew. He's an aeon that just kind of takes the appearance of a man. So Jesus can slam the Jews all he wants. He's not one of them. 
again, this is Gnosticism. One of the things I hope you take away from, if you're just watching the DVD or you're here, don't be fed the line that Gnosticism is just this wonderful, enlightened thing, and boy, wouldn't we all be blessed if everybody was a Gnostic and all this kind of thing. And I'm not saying, you know, Gnosticism's like any other faith. You can have people in it that just take it to the nth degree and, and, and use it abusively. Um, you know, a lot of Gnostics aren't going to do that. But what I encourage you to do is read the literature. It will tell you very clearly that this is not just option B or plan B or a little pretty much like Orthodox Christianity. It's not. There are significant differences. This is not just the flip side of a single coin. There are fundamental differences between Gnosticism and what we think of as, as Christianity. Um, it, you know, it grew out of Christianity, became an, a, an oppositional thing when it took on the form of a movement. Uh, there were reasons why the church fathers were troubled. I mean, how can you, how can you claim you know, to, to be a follower of Christ and say these you know, things like, this is just the Gospel of Judas, this is all through the Gnostic stuff. How can you say these things about God's people? This is where the church came from. Judas recounts a vision. Jesus responds. Let's go down to um, Judas asks about his own fate. Judas said, Master, could it be that my seed is under the control of the rulers? The seed in Gnostic thinking is the soul, by the way, you know, his internal self. The rulers are the archons, the, the, divine, the watchers, I guess we would say in, in, in my lingo, Enoch lingo. Jesus answered and said to him, Come, that I, and then there's lines missing, but that you will grieve much when you will see the kingdom in all its generation. When he heard this, Judas said to him, What good is it that I have received it? For you have set me apart for that generation. Jesus answered and said, You will become the 13th. It's a reference to him being set aside from the apostolic 12. You will become the 13th and you will be cursed by the other generations and you will, you will come to rule over them. In the last days, they will curse your ascent to the holy generation. Generation here means the generation of the Pleroma. The Pleroma, the eons that were produced from the ultimate divine force. Jesus is saying, those other guys are not going to get to that level, but you will. It's very pro-Judas. It's the gospel of Judas. You will. You understand all these mysteries. Let's go to the last section here the one that everybody's talking about in the, uh, in the media. Jesus speaks of those who are baptized in Judas's betrayal. Judas said to Jesus, Look, what will those who have been baptized in your name do? And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, this baptism, gap, my name, another gap, about nine lines missing. Truly I say to you, Judas, those who offer sacrifice to Sakalas, gap, God, everything that is evil, and again, he's, it's just missing, it's not coherent. But then he says, but you will exceed all of them. You know, those who sacrifice to Sakhalas are, of course, the 12, the Jews there. You will sacrifice the man that clothes me. Again, in Gnostic theology, Jesus and the Christos, they're, they're different eons, but the eon that becomes known as Jesus, there's the cosmic real Jesus up here, who takes upon the appearance of a man. He's not incarnated. He's not really human. Okay? He either, Gnostic theology varies from text to text. It's not consistent. He either appears as a man or he inhabits just some guy. But he's saying, look, Judas, you're going to hand over the man you know, who clothes me. I'm not really going to die because I'm an eon, I'm eternal. It's not going to happen to me. This is why Jesus and other Gnostic texts is just watching the crucifixion, kind of chuckling. Well, oh boy, they, they think they got me, but they don't. Whereas Christianity you know, said this was a real man and he really died. The Gnostic texts also have Jesus rising from the dead too. It's completely contrary to what Lawrence Gardner and Michael Bage and some of these other guys have. But again, they're referring to they're not referring really necessarily to the man that was inhabited as they are to the, the survival, as it were, of the cosmic Jesus 
who then appears to them again in human form. This is, again, a fundamental distinction between Orthodox Christianity and Gnosticism. Uh, this is why I said earlier, if anything, Gnostics do not downplay the divinity of Jesus. They downplay the humanity. And the Da Vinci Code has it exactly reversed. You know, it's just a fundamental error with understanding Gnosticism. But this is why you have this. And, of course, you know, Jesus is saying, look, you know, you're going to do this. This is your destiny. You know, it, it's going to make you, you know, it's going to vault you to the next level, you know, the, the level of the generation of the eons. And then, of course, it ends where Judas just goes out and, and hands him over. Now, in the New Testament, it's, it's very clear. In the, in the book of Acts, we, we learn, specifically in Peter's sermon, that all of these things that happened to Jesus were the foreordained counsel of God. That's not new. The Gospel of Judas hints at that, that this was foreordained. You know, that's nothing new with the New Testament. What's new, what's different about the Gospel of Judas is that Judas is nowhere called a traitor. Judas is not viewed negatively. Judas was a hero to certain Gnostic groups. Why? Why would Judas be a hero? He's fulfilling the will of God in that the Savior is going to be crucified. And, and Gnostics still believe Jesus is the key to salvation. But the real enemy is who? It's the God who sent him to the cross. Okay, it's, it's this evil demiurge. Right? It's just something you have to... I realize Gnosticism at this level, in, in, these, in this area, how they view God as the ultimate and then the God of the Old Testament being two totally different things. If you're not used to reading Gnostic sources, it's kind of mind-bending. But when you approach the Gospel of Judas or one of these Gnostic texts, you have to keep, you have to keep the cosmology in mind which is why we started with that. Here is the quote from Athanasius, or excuse me, from Irenaeus. Some declare that Cain derived his being from the power above and acknowledge that Esau, Korah, the Sodomites, and all such persons are related to themselves. They declare that Judas the traitor was thoroughly acquainted with these things and that he alone, knowing the truth as no others did, accomplished the mystery of the betrayal. By him all things, both earthly and heavenly, were thus thrown into confusion. They produce a fictional history of this kind, which they style the Gospel of Judas. This is 180 AD. Irenaeus is referring to this Gospel that now has been, been discovered and, and translated. Lastly, here's our, our anti-hero, or Michael Bajant, which if there's anybody with an axe to grind, I think it's this fellow right here. I think he launched himself into his lawsuit of Dan Brown for purely publicity, I, I don't think he had a prayer, and I think he knew it, of, of winning the case because he wanted to promote his new book called The Jesus Papers, which has now been released, exposing the greatest cover-up in history for a very reasonable thirty-seven ninety-five. And I love this, blah, or this, this, this uh, story, The Dog Ate My Jesus Papers. Bajant claimed in advance publicity that he had uncovered a document written by Jesus in the year 45 AD that proves he was alive. Okay. Well, if you actually get the book, if you're foolish enough to pay the 37.95, and you start reading it, this is what you find. Pretty soon, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the reader realizes that there probably won't be any Jesus documents, that this book is really a private credo an intimate declaration of belief dressed up to be the religious bombshell of the millennium. But then the long-anticipated appearance of the documents comes, or does it, near the end. Bajant meets with an unidentified antiquities dealer. This is kind of a formula for a movie. Who shows him two pieces of parchment. Each was about 18 inches long and 9 inches high. These were the letters from Jesus to the Sanhedrin. They existed I was silent as I fully enjoyed the moment. Of course, he tells you later that he can't read Aramaic or Greek or Coptic. So it turns out that he has an antiquities dealer that he can't identify that tells him what's in these things that he never actually produces. That's the big bombshell of the millennium. I wished above all that I might have a familiarity with the ancient languages. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> that would help. Comes in handy. 
It's like holding a treasure chest but not having the key to open it. You know, and the, the final line is pretty much where it's at. The writer of the story says, this is just insulting. You know, to have all this build up, to throw yourself in court, to basically sell books, and you come up and you produce nothing. You could have at least photocopied or taken a picture of these manuscripts. He's never going to do that. They probably don't even exist. Okay? He wants to make money off the conspiratorial logic. What a real scholar and a real researcher would do is you go to somebody like the National Geographic Society with deep pockets, you pony up for the manuscripts, and then you turn them over for scholarly study. You don't meet in a smoke-filled room and then tell us that you saw two scraps that were 9 by 18 and you couldn't read them. I mean, give us a break. But this is where he's at. You know, and I, I think that it's just basically a fiasco. Now, you know, having said that, the Gospel of Judas is valuable. I mean, you can learn things about it. It's a typical Gnostic text. We can at least learn something about the Gnostics. It's not surprising they held a positive view of Judas. We already knew that from Irenaeus. So, you know, where does that leave us? It, it, it leaves us really not knowing too much more than what we knew before it was discovered. And for Elaine Pagels to put this quote on the, the cover of this book, the discovery of the Gospel of Judas is astonishing. My question would be to Elaine, why? You act as if we've never discovered a manuscript before. We have like several hundred, or actually thousands of manuscripts, if we count fragmentary things. What's so astonishing about discovering a manuscript? What's so astonishing about discovering a manuscript that somebody in church history already told us existed? What's so astonishing about the contents of the manuscript being consistent with stuff we already knew about the Gnostic sect, specifically the Sethians, and their high view of Judas? Where's the revelation? But again, that just doesn't make for good copy. And, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's pretty much where some of these people are at. Any questions? Yes, Guy. In a second, just for DVD, define pseudepigrapha. But my question is, is this Gospel of Judas, does it claim to be written in the first person? Or is Judas merely the, asking all the questions, gets the airtime, main character? Yeah, it's, it defines that as pseudepigrapha. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, not, it's not first person. You know, it, it is what it, what it is. Uh, third person, it's about Judas. It doesn't claim to have been written firsthand by him. Yeah, yeah, it ain't, you never, yeah, it, it doesn't, what we have of it ends. You know, so whether this guy has more pages to it, if it goes in to describe the crucifixion or not, I mean, we, we don't know. You know, there's, there's lots of Gnostic texts that describe the crucifixion and a resurrection. Um, so it, it's probably going to just be consistent with the rest of the Gnostic material if there is anything you know, left. I mean, who knows? That could be the end, though, you know, for, all, for all we know. Uh, pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha as a term refers to Jewish and, in some cases, depending on the date, uh, Christian books or Jewish books that Christians went in and, and edited later that were never considered part of the canon. Okay? They were never considered by Jews to be part of the Old Testament books. They were never considered by Christians to be part of the New Testament. They get their term, the term contrary to what you'll see in some circles does not mean false writings. The, the, it refers to the fact that the document claims to have been written by or about, usually about, a famous figure from the Old or New Testament. And so what is the, pseudo, the pseudepigraph is the attribution of authorship that is not true. It's, it's just, it's falsely attributed authorship, not, not that the contents are just bad and, and awful or anything like that. So that, that's where, that's where the, the description comes from. Another question? Yes. Do you know how much uh, National Geographic paid for, for those documents? You know, I, I, 
I can I can only you know tell you what I've what I've seen. They haven't been terribly forthright. Um, I know that the asking price earlier was two to three million, but that was before National Geographic stepped in. Um, that's the only actual figure I've seen, so I have to guess it would probably be that in that range. Uh, they've been they've been a little tight-lipped about what they actually paid for it, and the reason is pretty obvious. And you know, scholars, this is a tough area because on the one hand. If it's kind of like a hostage situation. If you pay the price, it encourages people in the underground art and antiquities world to bring more things out and essentially hold the scholarly community hostage all over again. So if you meet the demand, then you're kind of hooked. And it's going to encourage more of the same behavior. The problem is, if you don't meet the demand, Scholars want to see this stuff. And frankly, even more than wanting to see it, they're concerned that, that this kind of material is just mishandled and it'll be destroyed and, and it'll be lost forever. And so there is a propensity. I'm not going to state a position here because frankly, I, I haven't thought too deeply about it. I, I don't know what, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, you know, I would be inclined to want something preserved, but you know, I, I, am, I am concerned that it's just going to create a kind of hostage situation. This, hap this is still happening with the Dead Sea Scrolls, believe it or not. There are con consistent rumors that there are still Dead Sea Scrolls out there because when they were originally discovered, <laughs> people aren't dumb. When, when they knew they could get money for them, they would take a scroll and slice pieces out of it because they know they can sell it more than once. You know, just, you, know, you can call it greed. You could also call it, I guess, good business sense, you know, on, you know from a black market perspective. But um, it just, it, it encouraged that kind of behavior. And so that's the, that's the pickle you get yourself into. Didn't I, didn't I hear one of, I read somewhere a short, Thing about the, this particular manuscript and that some of the people involved in obtaining it have a history yeah. of uh, the kind of dealings you're talking about that are a lot that are very questioned. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, if you go if you go to the blogs, the, the names of those people will be uh, given. <laughs> there there's one blog, it's not a blog, it, it's actually a website of a guy. I know I have his name in the file there. It's not coming to, to mind right away. If you put Gospel of, of Judas into a browser, and uh, I, could, I could send you the specific address. There, there is a guy on the web that has a kind of a cheesy website. It looks like you know, a 10-year-old put it together. But the guy's actually in the underground art world community, and he loves to make fun of, of the people who are doing these kinds of things because he, he doesn't like the corruption in the underground art community. And he'll name names and, and call them, he'll call them names too, and just poke fun at them constantly. Uh, and he has a lot of, of uh, the Gospel of Judas stuff on his site, even before National Geographic uh, ponied up, uh, whatever they did pony up. This guy was a friend of a guy named Charles Hedrick, who was a Coptic scholar who years ago got to see part of the Gospel of Judas and wrote out a very quick hand-drawn transcription and translation. And the guy has it on his website. You know, so he's saying, I'm a friend of Hedrick, and here's the proof, and you know, here are the pictures that he took, and here's his translation. In other words, he, he's doing that to say that I'm not making it up. I know what I'm talking about here. I know these people. And he has lots of real kind of comical but also sort of digs at, at some of these people involved because they were extorting others. They were you know, trying to, you know, I, I won't call it thievery because you know, they, they would get their hands on it and, and it, it would become a tool for extortion. But see, then you're, then you're caught in the middle because how do I know what I, if I'm a buyer, how do I know what I'm buying isn't stolen property from somebody else? And even part of it 
they could just, they could be withholding parts, and I don't really get what I think I'm getting because the people are unscrupulous. But it, it's 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 kind of a funny site. If you, you email Guy or, or, or through through Guy, you get to me. I'll, I'll send you the site. It's it's in, it's interesting, and the and the blogs will have it too. The blogs know the site as well. If you go up to the New Testament blogs, you know, like uh, th this one I had here in the in the presentation or Paleo Judaica is a blog that's really devoted to antiquities and biblical studies and New Testament Gateway Mark Goodacre who is a professor at Duke now he has a, a pretty popular blog but you can keep up with the Gospel of Judas saga um, by just keeping track of the blogs a little bit What merit would you give, or what has the Christian academic community given to the idea that Judas really was an okay guy fulfilling the purposes of God? Because you could say the same about Hitler only in a Romans 8 28 way, but is there anything about Judas that actually would elevate him beyond? Well, scholars, being a food scholars are going to say what, what the, the data in the primary sources allow them to say, which is a nice. Well, they're going to say, well, scholars will, if they're going to try to maintain some sort of religious neutrality or an impression of neutrality, they're going to say, well, the New Testament characterizes Judas as a villain. The Gospel of Judas does not. Gnosticism you know, does not. And that's pretty much where it's at. They won't take a position. But they, they will recognize that in terms of antiquity, the New Testament stuff is older and more closely related chronologically to the events that they describe but you know a lot of scholars will just they'll just leave it at that you know the, the other side of that is there there is, there is no scholar though who would in, you know even people like pagels you know who are, who are just saying things basically to get media buzz uh, even she's not going to say anything as, as silly and ridiculous as this is you know pardon the pun this is the gospel truth and Judas really was a good guy. I mean, she's she's going to stick with you know with with the data. This is what the Gnostics believed, and and that's what it is. What it is. You know, nobody's going to come out and and, and favor a, a good guy Judas as being you know historically valid because in their minds, frankly, they, they they can't tell. They they will admit that the New Testament stuff has priority that it's chronologically preceding um, that that nobody else thought this way except for this. This is even a subsect of Gnosticism, the Sethians. Um, so, so nobody's going to say that this was a dominant view held by anybody. We done? Just on the topic of Judas himself, not so much the Gnostic Gospel of. Um, have you ever seen a commentary? Suggesting it says um, that one of the twelve was a devil. Chris Ward, if you ever seen on the side, one. But I think it's Matthew uh, Henry's commentary. Have you seen anything or have any belief that would indicate that Judas himself actually was a watcher, i.e., a non-human? No, no. I yeah, I, I've I've never seen that. I don't I don't believe that. Um, you know. Everything seems to indicate he's just he's just one of the guys, because other 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 texts will say that Satan entered into him, so that that would rule against the idea that that Judas himself is some sort of uh, non-human entity. Why why would Satan have to enter into a into a demon? It doesn't make any sense. Does uh, but since you mentioned that, since you already said the Gnosticism. The serpent is the good guy. The serpent is the hero in Gnosticism. Yeah. In the Gnostic view, the fact that Satan entered his, into Judas props him up as all the more the right. hero, right? Right. He's because empowered. He the he's empowered. The he's Christ. he's enlightened. Well, the hero of from from a, from an Orthodox Christian perspective, he would be un-antichrist. Um, you know, just someone who 
in that sense who would who would be oppositional. But I, I actually don't think that that's really a, a good way to look at Judas because, you know, Peter's sermon and, and other there are other suggestions that, that Judas. What, he, what it, it's the old how can I be morally culpable if God engineered circumstances to do X, Y, or Z? And the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the, the New Testament affirms both ideas. That God doesn't necessarily cause or control behavior, but circumstances can be uh, arranged to take advantage of human propensities or whatnot, and God has the ability to, to take certain circumstances and steer them toward an end that he has ordained, you know, is necessary and needs to happen. Um, yeah, yeah, the hardening of, the, of Pharaoh's heart is the same thing. Was it Pharaoh who hardened his heart or was it God? The scriptures say it was both. Um, you know, it's, it's the old sovereignty, free will thing. And, you know, you could probably, if you stacked all the books that have been written on that, you know, you're, you're looking at skyscraper territory. <laughs> You know, it's, it's it's not a it's not a new issue. I, I you know I I just tend to believe that if you, if you don't have God being in charge of the crucifixion, you know, in, in in some sense, then somebody else had to be in charge. And who might that be? You know, it it doesn't cohere in either Old Testament or New Testament biblical theology. Uh, you you can't have a a competing, equally powerful uh, being even with divine plurality in the Old Testament, because the claim is that Yahweh created all the other ones. So by definition, they are derivative and inferior. Uh, what we think of as dualism is not very defensible uh, in either the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. So you have to have a sovereign God who is you know, in, in charge, so to speak. Uh, the real question is, how is he in charge? Does he cause people to do things? Is he behind people saying, sit, sit, you know, let me help you a little bit? Or has he, has he foreseen what humans were, are going to do naturally because of the effect of the fall and has engineered circumstances to a predetermined end? Does he predestinate at the beginning or at the end? That's another question. There's all sorts of questions you know, when you get into this. and it, the, the, the answers don't fit into a good sound bite. No. <laughs> Nope, just thank everybody who came for coming and those who get the DVD, hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for listening. I enjoy doing it. Just, you know, go out and, and demand, demand the data. Demand uh, that, that people who are telling you something show you where they got it so that you can go check it yourselves and do it. You know, invest some time into it.